Hi, Tom. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Can you hear me? You seem a little low. How about now? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hey, let's let's test something real fast. How about now? How about now? You're good. Okay, both. All right. I just want to make sure I wasn't blocking my microphone.
says there's a speedway down here to the left. Yeah, okay. Okay, everybody, it's nine o'clock. Please be taking your seats and at least put your cell phones on mute, if not turn off altogether. I'd like to call this November meeting, business meeting of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission to order. I want also to remind everybody of the governor's mask mandate that we are encouraging everybody to comply with. You can pull your mask down when speaking, but otherwise we highly encourage it. It's not just for you, but it's for the person sitting next to you. So I hope that you all will uh, comply with that. First off, um, North Carolina General Statute 138A15E mandates at the beginning of any meeting of a board, the chair shall remind all members of their duty to avoid conflicts of interest under Chapter 138. The chair also shall inquire as to whether there is any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board at this time. Is there any foreseeable conflict of interest from our commissioners? If not, also I'd like for you all to reflect on North Carolina General Statute 143B 289.54.G2. Okay, Laura, would you do our roll call, please? Commissioner Hendrickson? Commissioner Cornegie? Here. Commissioner McNeil? Here. Commissioner Casey? Here. Commissioner Roller? Here. He mouthed here, so. Commissioner Romano? Here. And Chairman Bizzle? Here. We have a quorum. We may conduct business. For you is our agenda for the next day and a half. I'd like to entertain a motion to uh, approve the agenda as written. So moved by Commissioner Posey. Is there a second? Robert McNeil seconds it. Any further discussion on it? If not, all in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion passes without dissension. Also, you should have in your materials um, two sets of minutes, one for our August meeting and the other for our September special meeting. Are there any additions, corrections, or deletions that need to be made on these minutes? If not, Chair will entertain a motion to accept both minutes. Commissioner Carnegie, second. Second by Commissioner uh, Cross. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Opposed? Motion passes without dissension. Okay, moving on into our public comment period. I limited the number to give comment today to 10 because, as you saw last night, this is a very passionate issue that brings out a lot of people to comment, which I am glad we got. I always encourage public comment. But to get our work done today, I decided we needed to limit the number, so I limited it to 10. So first up, we'll have Stevenson Weeks, followed by Barbara Garrity Blake. And you all have three minutes, and you will be reminded when 30 seconds is left, and I'll call time at three minutes. The goal of fisheries management plans is to ensure the long-term viability of the state's commercially and recreationally significant species or fisheries. The plans must include information pertaining to the fish or fisheries, including management goals, objections, status of relevant stock, stock assessments, and the social and economic impact of the fisheries to the state and user conflict. The management measures recommended by the division, the division 
failed to meet the requirements mandated by the general statutes in numerous regards. Due to the time constraints, I'll only address a few of those. First, shrimps and annual species. They are not overfished and the fishery is sustainable. Second, the stock assessments for fisheries management plans for Atlantic croaker, spot, weak fish, and southern flounder do not provide specific recommendations for bycatch reductions for shrimp trawls. Due to bycatch species coastwise or regional stock units, it is unknown if bycatch reductions solely in North Carolina will improve the stock species status. Third, the majority of vessels that trawl for shrimp in North Carolina waters are under 50 feet in length. The management measures proposed by the division would severely limit their participation in the fishery, which can only be done by the General Assembly upon recommendation of this commission after the commission considers the factors set forth in General Statute 113-182.1G. Those factors contain the following. Current participation in and dependence on the fishery, past fishing practices in the fishery, economics of the fisheries. With regards to economics of the fisheries, if there's a substantial economic impact, which is $500,000 or more, this board must comply with General Statute 150B, Sections 19 through 21, which has not been done in this management plan. Also have to look at the capability of fishing vessels used in the fisheries to engage in other fisheries, cultural and social factors relevant to the fisheries and any affected fishing communities. The division attempts to justify closures of additional thousands of acres of estuarine waters under the guise 30 seconds. that it's necessary to reduce bycatch by creating connectivity between Pamlico Sound and the ocean. The division fails to acknowledge that substantial connectivity already exists. By regulation, weekend shrimping is prohibited. It's unlawful to take shrimp by any method from 9 p.m. on Friday through 5 p.m. on Sunday by shrimp trawl. There are, that's 44 hours. Time. That's all. I have to call a time on you, sir. I have to call a time on you, sir. Of the time. I have to call time on you. Three minutes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Barbara Garrity Blake, followed by Glenn Skinner. And, sir, if you could get your um, easel, I, I would really appreciate it. I, I, would, I would like for you to move it to the back at least. Barbara, are you here? Okay, we'll circle back on Barbara. So Glenn Skinner, followed by Brent Fulcher. Thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to comment. Glenn Skinner, commercial fisherman, the executive director of North Carolina Fisheries Association. I want to talk to y'all uh, about something Mr. Weeks just touched on, uh, which is the goal of the FMPs according to statute. The goal of a fishery management plan is to ensure the long-term viability of the fishery being managed. Shrimp are harvested in this state by several distinct and independent fisheries. It is not one fishery. We have a recreational fishery, a small boat commercial fishery, and a large boat commercial fishery. If you all take measures that would impact any one of those fisheries in a way that would jeopardize long-term viability of that fishery, you're going against the statute. You're going against the intent of the Fisheries Reform Act, which is to ensure the long-term viability of the fishery, that it, it continues to occur. Free storage protection is important, but it is not the only thing you're supposed to consider. This is true for many other fisheries. The flounder fishery is a perfect example. It's managed independently by gear. Large mesh gill nets is a fishery. It's been referred to for decades as the large mesh gill net fishery, the pound net fishery, the recreational hook and line fishery. They are all independent. 
They occur at different times with different gears in different areas, in different water bodies, different seasons. And if you take actions, like's proposed to phase out gill nets, as we hear at every meeting, you are phasing out an independent fishery. You are destroying the long-term viability of that fishery. No different than the recommended management measures from the division would destroy the recreational and small boat shrimp fisheries. The goal of this management plan is supposed to guide y'all. Your actions in recent years have been guided by personal goals. We hear it at every meeting. Get rid of shrimp trawl and phase out gill nets. Every meeting, it's stated. You discuss the chip. Somebody wants to bring up, why didn't you put in bottom disturbing gears? That's just a backdoor way to get trawling out of the way. These are personal goals. They are not what's supposed to guide you. If you can't put your personal feelings aside and use science, you shouldn't be here. It, it's hypocritical. At your last meeting, you voted seconds. to allow recreational fishermen in this state to sacrifice spots and croakers purely for the source of recreation. And some of you came here today to crucify commercial fishermen for killing those exact same fish in the name of food production. The hypocrisy that's been displayed by this commission in recent years is sickening. And if I had the time, I could go on for an hour on all the measures y'all have taken that put recreation Leon. over food production. Leon, I had to call time on you. Thank you. Thank you. Brent Fulcher followed by David Sneed. Brent, I don't see you. We'll circle back to him. So David Sneed followed by Jess Hawkins. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to provide comments uh, on behalf of the Coastal Conservation Association of North Carolina. I would like to start by asking about the decision to renew the ITP for the large mesh gillnet fishery. Why are we pursuing a costly and time-consuming renewal process for a gear that is no longer needed to harvest the allowable catch of southern flounder? Why are we spending time and resources to protect a destructive fishery which is not needed to harvest all the southern flounder the resource can give? A fishery by, that by any measure is inherently destructive and inherently unmanageable. But this decision to pursue a renewal of an ITP was obviously made without consultation with this body, the state commission that is charged with setting marine fisheries policy. If this body was not consulted, did the decision come with the blessings of the secretary or the governor? Uh, the public deserves transparency. It's hard to know where to go next. Uh, there were a lot of things said last night that, were, that need to be addressed, but there's no way to address them all in just three minutes. As for the threats and attacks on this commission and DMF staff, your job is to manage and protect our coastal marine resources. That will inherently involve making tough decisions. There will be social and economic results for those who choose to make a living harvesting a public trust resource. There were plenty of emotional stories last night, and I'm sure there were the same socio-economic socio stories told before the commissions that had the responsibility for protecting our buffalo and waterfowl from further exploitation. But aren't we happy today that we had a group like yours to make the decision to protect and manage those wildlife resources for our generation. People asked for economic studies, so I emailed all of you a copy this morning of a study that was done in 2016 that found if we managed our resources for conservation and not maximum exploitation, it would result in a $4 billion economic boost to the North Carolina total fishery economy. People ask where the science to support the DMF recommendations in the SHRIP plan were. That is a great question. What happened to the hotspot data that, that identified the nursery areas in the Pamlico Sound? Why don't you put those graphics up on the screen today and show people where we are trawling on these critical fish habitats? That's not addressed in the, in the current draft. 30 seconds. People want access to North Carolina shrimp. They like to eat shrimp. I like to eat shrimp. But the idea that these area closures that are proposed by DMF scientists to reduce bycatch and protect critical fish habitat will deny consumers their access to shrimp is pure deception. The North Carolina shrimp fleet comes nowhere near meeting the North Carolina consumer demand for shrimp. 
you will still be able to purchase locally caught shrimp on the coast, but the industry does not have the capacity or the supply chain, nor can the resource to deliver 40 million pounds of wild caught shrimp. Had to call time on Thanks so much Thanks for your comments. Uh, Jess Hawkins, followed by Lewis Daniel. Rob, before I begin, I served, I got a hearing aid issue here. Is it okay with you if I offered a uh, brief invocation? Yeah, but would it count against my time? Okay, all right. Please pray with me. To Heavenly Father, please be with these men today as they make uh, decisions about our public resources. We are truly blessed in our state. We are blessed that they serve and try to serve you in the protection of those resources, Lord, and are wise using wisdom. Please grant them wisdom today, Lord, to make the tough decisions that uh, they may have to make. Uh, and again, just thank you for the bounty of your creation. Amen. Thank you, Rob. For those of you that do not know, may not know me, I was a division biologist for 30 years, served as the MFC liaison for the DMF and commission for the last 15 years of my service, served on your body, the MFC, and I've taught fisheries conservation at Duke Marine Lab or NC State's Marine Lab for nine years. I speak to you today as a scientist, a seafood consumer, and an avid North Carolina fisherman with a passionate interest in our resources and fisheries. I ask this commission to reject the preferred management measures of the shrimp amendment two at this time for the following reasons. The way the preferred measures were developed is deeply disturbing. The public has only had 17 days to review measures that if pursued will significantly impact one of North Carolina's most important fisheries. None of the MFC advisory committees established by the General Assembly had a chance to comment on the division's preferred recommendations. The division serves as a source of most science used to manage our resources and stakeholders usually look to the division's opinions regarding management of those resources. The first 15 years of implementing fishery management plans as required by the Fishery Reform Act used a process that presented the division's recommendations to the other advisory committees before forwarding to the MSC for your decision. The MSC at a minimum should send these recommendations back to their advisory committees for focused review at the, at the division's recommendations. When serving on the MSC, I tried to determine if measures were necessary and fair. The proposed extensive closures are not necessary as the shrimp population is sustainable it is unknown if shrimp trawl bycatch is a significant factor in the population status of weak fish, spot, and croaker. It is unknown what effect the closures will have on bycatch reduction. North Carolina has implemented the most stringent fin fish exclusion technology in the USA to reduce bycatch in 1992, 2015, and 2019. Trawling has been prohibited in designated nursery areas since 1978. Most of the known grass beds were closed to trawling in the 1990s, and the efficacy of connect connectivity corridors and coastal systems is unknown. The proposed measures are not fair as they disproportionately affect the small shrimp trawlers that make up 70% of the fishery and traditionally use waters close to their communities. The economic impact will be substantial for these families and possibly violate statutes, as um, Mr. Weeks said. Shrimp are the number one consumed seafood in the U.S. The U.S. is the second highest consumer of seafood in the world. North Carolina is an important source of wild caught shrimp for our country and trawling captures over 93% of the shrimp landed in North Carolina. Why pursue extensive measures that will cripple the ability to provide a seafood commodity whose population is not stressed with unknown benefits? There are many other options necessary if this commission deems that action on bycatch is necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Louis Daniel followed by Chris Elkins. So with only three minutes, I got to start with the conclusions. Approval of the DMF recommendations for Southern Flounder will result in a continued absence of a viable fishery, well past the statutory deadline of 2028. And approval of the DMF recommendations in Shrimp Amendment 2 devastate the local shrimp fishery, maintain status quo for the largest, most impactful trawlers, and achieve what may best be called economic extinction of species such as spot croaker and weak fish as well as other critical ecosystem and fisheries components. The Fisheries Reform Act of 1997 has failed miserably. 
to rebuild any fisheries in North Carolina. From the sinking line blue crab plan to present, the process has failed our fisheries and the public trust. NCWF made several attempts to discuss these issues with the secretary, to clarify many of these issues and avoid some of these comments, but we were not allowed. Amendment three to the Southern Flounder Plan is inextricably flawed and the proposed management measures fail to account for a large portion of Southern Flounder mortality. From the original FMP in 2006, through multiple amendments and supplements, we argue that overfishing is still occurring and that the proposed reductions will fail to achieve rebuilding by the 28th deadline. The technical justification for this conclusion is laid out in our formal comments, and we hope that these will be considered in your deliberations. As the stock recovers, and it is showing positive signs, the magnitude of discards and bycatch will only increase, making the likelihood of achieving the 2028 deadline even greater, like unlikely. Shrimp Amendment 2 states, the results and benefits of shrimp trawl bycatch reduction are uncertain. Could there be any contradiction to the statement that the results and benefits of shrimp trawl bycatch reduction are increased abundance of species taken as bycatch that provides benefits to the fishery and the ecosystem? NCW, we object to the recommendations in the decision document and have stated over and over again that our goal is to protect the culture and heritage of commercial fishing and that the shrimp plan must protect the small local community shrimpers over the large ocean-able and out-of-state shrimp fleet that, op that operate in our estuarine nursery grounds. Our petition was summarily dismissed in the decision document based on supposition and economics rather than science, which is included in our comments. But the petition aimed to protect the small community shrimpers that are geographically limited to where they can seconds. fish. Amendment number two will disproportionately impact the small shrimp fleet by forcing them into competition with large ocean going vessels in the open sound. They cannot compete and may also face safety issues being forced into the larger water bodies. The decision document states the goal of bycatch reduction is to increase availability of fish, yet Amendment 2 proposes nothing that will quantitatively reduce bycatch, only delay bycatch until those juveniles move into the open estuarine waters that are named, remain status quo. Of even greater concern is the fundamental lack of any recognition time. of the critical Lewis. ecosystem function of those fish. Got to call it time. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, Chris Elkins, followed by Bert Owens. Good morning. I am Chris Elkins, speaking for CCA. Today, I would like to address shrimp, shrimp trawling in undesignated nursery areas. By any measure, the amount of bycatch in shrimping is obscene. While we can argue over the number of hundreds of millions of juvenile spot, croaker, weakfish, and southern flounder killed, we cannot argue that all four stocks have collapsed or are in decline. Moreover, extensive trawling in Pamlico Sound has been an ecological nightmare. North Carolina fisheries managers are either a lot smarter or a lot dumber than those managers in Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Texas. Those states long ago decided that industrial sized oceanic trawlers did not belong in their sensitive nurseries. Nevertheless, shrimp harvests in Louisiana and Texas from the ocean are many times our harvest. The smart thing for North Carolina fisheries manage managers to do is to make substantive and conservation changes. At a minimum, we should impose extensive time and area closures in the identified hotspots. Optimal, optimally, we should move the large trawlers outside leaving smaller trawlers some limited access. The dumb thing for fisheries managers to do is to do status quo or make meaningless changes. North Carolina consumes about 40 million pounds of shrimp a year. In good years, the industry provides 10 million pounds. It does if all the shrimp remains in North Carolina, the shrimp industry can provide only about 25% of the shrimp consumed in North Carolina. The bumper sticker that says, friends don't let friends eat imported shrimp is a, is a blatant misrepresentation of the facts. For all the fuss about commercial fishing, North Carolina commercial fishing industry is relatively small. 
NOAA says North Carolina does not have a fishing port in the list of the largest 49 ports. The value of North Carolina recreational fishing dwarfs that of commercial fishing with economic impacts many times that of commercial fishing. Yet, most of the talk here at the MFC is about keeping commercial fishermen fishing, not enhancing the golden goose recreational fishing. This needs to change. North Carolina is now facing the economic consequences of bad fisheries management as opposed to the economic advantages of competent fisheries management. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Chris. Bert Owens followed by Rocky Carter. Okay. Bert's not here, I'll circle back in the minute. So Rocky Carter followed by Barbara Garrity Blake. Sorry, I'm old. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Uh, my name is Rocky Carter. I'm presenting information that was uh, compiled by Stuart Creighton, a CCA Chairman of Fisheries, and I will do my best to take this 30 minute presentation and put it into three minutes. The Division of Marine Fisheries is dedicated to ensuring sustainable marine and estuarine fisheries and habitats for the benefits and the health of the people of North Carolina. With that mission statement in mind, the goal of all fisheries management plans should be to restore, rebuild, and create a sustainable fishery for all citizens of North Carolina, including our children and our grandchildren. Historic fisheries management in North Carolina has ignored conservation in favor of maximum exploitation. And we are paying the price for that now with numerous finfish and shellfish species listed as overfished with overfishing occurring. CCA NC supports the division recommendations for the phasing out of large mesh gill nets when the current ITP expires in 2023. Efforts to rebuild a severely depleted stock will result in dramatically reduced quotas, overage paybacks, and short harvest seasons for both user groups. Faced with at least a decade of these restrictions, any commercially harvested southern flounder can and should be taken by gears that are cleaner and more sustainable, those being pound nets and gigs. CCANC fully supports the removal of RCGL flounder fishery. Unfortunately, recreational anglers throughout the state are facing a quota with likely one fish per day krill limit in a fall season during a window from August the 16th to September 30th. To increase recreational access, the DMF is proposing a spring season from March 1st through April 15th, where one oscillated flounder may be harvested. This is a poor choice for a number of reasons, the most important of which is angler safety, as the weather during this time of year is very unsettled and not conductive to fishing in the ocean. Also, southern flounder are migrating from the ocean back into the rivers and sounds in the spring. So waiting until later in the year should minimize interactions with these fish. I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to share something. Last night, I was really moved by what I heard, and I, I hate so many lives will be impacted by this decision. I was reading a book the other day, and there's a paragraph in there that really stuck out to me. He said, this is by Thomas McGain, a world-renowned author and fisherman. We have reached the time in the life of the planet and mm -hmm. humanity's demands upon it. Time on your Rocky. Mike, for your comments. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Barbara Garrity Blake, former member of this esteemed body and uh, current president of NC Catch. Um, NC Catch is a nonprofit organization that works with local seafood branding groups. We reach about 31,000 people a month, raising consumer awareness about the benefits of eating local seafood. We oppose DMF's preferred options for Amendment 2 of the Shrimp FMP, 
Proposed area closures eliminate the safest and most productive fishing grounds for our small boat fishermen who work hard to feed us. You are managing not just a natural resource, but a valuable and precious food source central to food security, our food supply chain, and the $300 million local seafood economy. Seafood consumers, an untold subset of North Carolina's 10.5 million citizens, are an important stakeholder group. In a recent study, 1,600 residents were surveyed across the state. The majority named local shrimp as their favorite seafood. They supported coastal livelihoods and agreed that it was good for the environment to purchase seafood from local fishermen. I think that last part bears repeating. They agree that it's good for the environment to buy local. Consumers are increasingly savvy regarding sustainability. They want to know where, how, and by whom their seafood was sourced. They want the least amount of distance between boat and plate. Proposed area closures put us in the wrong direction by disadvantaging the very fishermen who feed consumers with minimal carbon footprint, traveling the shortest distance and burning the least amount of fuel to get shrimp to the dock. We urge you to broaden your view of conservation to include the whole system. Targeting small boat fishermen weakens our local food supply chain and increases our reliance on shrimp imported from distant countries that use little or no conservation measures. Amendment 2 cites the concept of ecological connectivity. A broader systems view accounts for social and economic connectivity as well. Our fishermen are connected to and embedded in the very social and economic fabric of coastal communities. So, um, Thanksgiving is one week away. I, for one, will be giving thanks that I can walk down the road and look across the Straits Channel from where I live in Gloucester. And during shrimp season, I can see three or four seconds. small trawlers working those waters. I know their names. I know the names of their boats. Um, I know the names of their kids. I know exactly where I can go to purchase that fresh local shrimp the next morning. I think these days it is a rare and precious thing to know exactly where your food comes from and to be able to buy it with the confidence that it was harvested sustainably. So let's protect our local food system. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Brent Folger. Thank you, Chairman Bizzle and members of the commission. Uh, named to Brett Fulcher, business owner of Craven Carter County, also uh, Chairman of North Carolina Fisheries Association. I passed you a uh, front page of the 1997 FRA uh, <coughs> Fisheries Reform Act. But last night I was here, and, and, and Chairman Bizzle, there's some bridge construction, so you might have a couple of members run behind. You might kill them. But, um, I heard safety concerns over uh, the amendment two. I heard job loss, effort reduction, as y'all did, area closure, water quality. Um, but I never really heard a lot about the thing that's probably most important on what we're trying to do. Your job is to protect, number one. Your next is to enhance. We can protect the resource. We can just close it all, protect it from everybody. But how can we enhance it? You know, I, I've been mad for a couple of weeks, really mad, because I feel like the work that I did to help spearhead to get North Carolina the best state in the nation with bycatch reduction, it's just looked over. You know, we keep looking for something else, something else, instead of trying to take something we know that we have tangible, that we can quantify and do something with and try and make it better. But all I ever hear with what happens at with this closure or this area or this secondary nerve, we can't quantify it. We can't quantify it. That's all the division can tell you. And how can you keep looking at something you can't quantify, but something you can quantify, you, you continue to pass by? How can we not, as a body, as an industry, as a resource, try and enhance it? Because that protection of reducing those juvenile fish out of that shrimp trawl is enhancing it. It's enhancing it not only commercially, but it's enhancing recreation. But there's so much of this that's, that's, that's science, but it's political science that wants to close an industry. If y'all want to do the right thing, 
you need to really put some more effort behind bycatch reduction work groups and let's see if we can get even better how many of y'all as members of this commission have talked to the media to another individual about where you're at you should feel great about where you're at you're the best state in the nation in shrimp harvest by 30 reduction. seconds and uh as far as area closures that's what the chip's for you let the chip do its job you don't have overfishing occurring in this fishery you don't have overfished occurring in this fishery the fmp that's what your job is i emailed all of you this morning vim's data from nemap you can do a little research on your own but fish stocks juvenile fish stocks on the east coast are where they've been for the past five to 15 years jimmy rule called me last week pulling off back um, the fish I'll time on the thank you sir thanks for your comments appreciate it uh did bert ever come so bert's not coming so that ends our public comment session for this morning thank you everybody for your comments they're they're very important moving on down to the chairman's report um first off i'd like to just uh, mention that uh, you all in the audience can't see it but tom roller is with it he's had some uh issues that has kept him from being here in person and but he is going to be here to participate because he knows um uh, that our um he knows our um uh, what we're trying to do is is important on so many levels so tom thank you for making the effort and staff thank y'all for making it work where tom can be uh, a participant in our, our discussions today um speaking of comments y'all have a lot of comments that were sent online um which i hope you all reflect on to and the rest of my report is in the well, briefing books about the ethics uh, training the meeting schedule and the committee assignments um so that's going to end my report moving on down to our committee reports um chris bat savage is going to give us the nominating committee report chris Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Hear me okay? All right. <clears throat> we'll get back to this meeting in person thing. It's been a while. <clears throat> All right. Uh, North Carolina general statutes require that the Marine Fisheries Commission nominate, uh, approve nominees for Federal Fishery Management Council seats for the governor's consideration. The governor must nominate no fewer than three individuals for a Federal Fishery Management Council seat. U.S. Secretary of Commerce will appoint one of those nominees to the council seat. The uh, Marine Fisheries Commission's nominating committee met on September 29th and forwarded the following individuals to the MFC for consideration for the South Atlantic Council's obligatory seat. And those, uh, those nominees are Tim Greiner, a commercial fisherman and dealer from Charlotte and the current North Carolina obligatory member on the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Scott Buff, a commercial fisherman and dealer from Oak Island. Charlie Locke, a commercial fisherman from Wanchese, And Thomas Newman, a commercial fisherman from Williamston. Biographical summaries for each are included in your brief material. The commission needs to approve nominees for the North Carolina obligatory seat on the South Atlantic Council today. And as always, we advise that the commission not select preferred candidates for these appointments, but rather leave those decisions to the governor. Uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions on these vetted candidates? If not, can we have a motion to uh, move this slate up to the governor's office? Uh, Tom Roller. Okay, Tom Roller uh, made the motion. I, 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 uh, yes, Tom. Well, can I make them? I just, I just moved that we uh, send all four names forward to the governor for consideration. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Tom. And seconded by Mike Blanton. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passes without dissension. Okay, thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Um, You also have in your books uh, reports about the regional advisory committees and the standard standing advisory committees too. So now we are going to move on to our director's report. Um, Kathy Rawls, our new director since our last uh, in-person meeting. This is a cat's first in-person meeting. I'll have to tell everybody I've um, 
worked a lot with Kat. She's had a lot of good initiatives. We have a scheduled weekly phone call just to talk about pertinent issues, which has been very helpful, very refreshing. And um, I cannot say enough about the good job Kat's doing and her staff too. And I'm proud to be working with you, Kat. So take it away. Two years. Can everybody in the back hear? Okay. Okay, we need to adjust the volume a little bit. That's not normally an issue for that. Not normally an issue with Kat. That's one thing about her. She comes in loud and clear all the time. Says I don't have <laughs> try to do better here. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Great. Okay. All right, awesome. wonderful. Um just Based on the chairman's comments, it has been, I think we talked about this yesterday, like we're a meeting shy of two years since we've been uh, back together in person. And I know that we have all faced uh, serious challenges throughout uh, personal lives and, and at work as well. And I'm glad to be back together in person with all of you and, and our stakeholders. Uh, we saw a lot of people here last night. Um, and I know that we've got some difficult topics on the agenda today, and I, I'm certainly glad we can do these face to face instead of having to do it. Uh, in the virtual world. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the division staff, uh, this commission and stakeholders uh, for hanging in with us as we've tried to manage the virtual world because it really was a, a shock to all of us. But I think we uh, we appreciate y'all hanging in there together. I think we did a, a good job to get to where we are today. So good to see all of y'all again. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Laura Koblansky at this point, who is our commission liaison, to give a quick overview of some of the updates uh, from the division's commission office, including information on emailed comments, uh, which was requested by Chairman Bizzle. So, Laura. Good morning. I usually sit here. <laughs> Um, I am the first presenter, so it is going to take me just a minute. Okay. Okay, I was waiting for the thumbs up. <laughs> Move okay, your so mic a little closer to you if you would. Is that better? Okay. Good morning, Chairman Bizzle and Commissioners. Um, for those of, the, uh, of you who don't know me, I'm Laura Klebanski. I'm the Marine Fishery Commission Liaison, and me and the other Commission staff are housed in the Director's Office of the Division of Marine Fisheries. So uh, it's been a while, as Kat said, um, since we had the opportunity to meet in person. So I wanted to take the opportunity and give some highlights um, of the changes that we've uh, had over the past two-ish years. So there's three items specifically that I'll be um, updating you on today, and I've listed them here in order, um, in the order that I'll be covering them. So I'll cover these topics pretty quickly, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards, of course. So um, I'll start with the Marine Fishery Commission public comments. So Chairman Bizzle requested that I provide some information clarifying our current policy um, and provide information on how and when the commission accepts public comment. The uh, Marine Fisheries Commission has two primary types of public comment opportunities. The first are more general opportunities, which typically occur um, prior to public meetings, such as the quarterly business meetings um, and also the regional and standing advisory committee meetings. And these are opportunities, pardon me, these are opportunities for any member of the public uh, to provide comment on any topic, whether it's on a published agenda um, or not. So in the commission office, we're typically managing anywhere from four to 10 or more public comment periods a year. 
um, each of those lasting two weeks, um, and that depends really on what, how, what meetings are scheduled. A second type of opportunity um, are solicited opportunities, and these are associated with specific uh, processes, such as rulemaking um, and fishery management plans. So these opportunities are for specific topics and are associated with upcoming commission action items. So for example, um, on today's agenda, you have uh, Amendment 3 to the Southern Flounder FMP, um, and you have uh, the opportunity to vote on that to go out for public and advisory committee comment. So if that's approved, that will initiate a comment period during which comment can be provided directly to the commission on Amendment 3. It also initiates the public comment periods for the reviewing advisory committees. So the number of solicited opportunities can vary um, pretty widely from one um, a, or two a year up to five or more, depending on various factors um, and including any actions uh, that are taken by the commission. And these typically last 30 to 60 days. So combined, these different opportunities mean that the Marine Fishery Commission office is usually accepting some form of public comment through the year. So when we open a public comment period, um, we ask that the public use one of three methods to provide comment through the commission office. The first is by mailing in written comment by US mail. And we receive these in the commission office, we scan them, and then we um, include them in the electronic briefing materials. The second is by um, submitting comments through our online form. This form allows freeform comments to be uploaded to our system, and then those are incorporated again into our electronic briefing materials. The third and final option is by signing up to speak um, during any of our public meetings. So why are emails not included in this list? And my answer to that is that online forms are better. So let me um, tell you why I say that. Uh, first, the Commission Office, uh, or in the Commission Office, we are required by law to treat identifying information submitted in public comment as confidential. So this is specific to the Marine Fishery Commission and is included as part of the Marine Fishery Commission Powers and Duty Statute. Um, I've included here on the right the statute and the list of items that are specified as identifying information. So what this means practically for us in the Commission Office is that we're required to review and redact all public comment for this identifying information before we can release it as part of the briefing materials. So as I said before, the Commission Office, um, more often than not, uh, is accepting some form of public comment. So in order to process all of that comment in a timely manner, we develop the use of the online form instead of allowing individual emails. So the online form provides a way to submit comments electronically, um, and it also allows us uh, to significantly reduce our processing time for public comments. So the benefits are uh, that we are able to turn around comments much more quickly to the commission for review, and that we can extend the public comment period. And finally, while we don't accept emails um, as part of our public comment process, each Marine Fishery Commissioner um, has an email which is listed on the Commission webpage, and any member of the public uh, may email uh, any or all of the commissioners at any time. So uh, my second item is going to be in uh, beginning in 2022, the division is going to begin hosting listening sessions for the public. So these are opportunities for the public to hear presentations. Um, from division staff on issues that have been approved by the Marine Fisheries Commission uh, for public and advisory committee review. So to give you a better um, idea of what this is going to look like, um, here you can see I've laid out the current uh, process or timeline for the public and advisory committee review, which begins with MFC approval. The documents are available online, and then we hold the um, appropriate reviewing committee advisory meetings. So as you can see here, um, circled in red, the listening sessions will be held during that open public comment period, but prior to the advisory committee meetings. And these listening sessions will be virtual. Um, they will also be recorded and they will be posted online at the division's website. 
Um, attendees will also be given time to ask staff questions um, about the topics being presented. So most of the time, this is the first opportunity that the public really has to review the full document. Um, and these listening sessions are meant to provide an opportunity for the public to hear that and ask questions without the pressure of a looming action item or a formal meeting. Um, and finally, the third item that I wanted to touch on is um, today you have uh, in your briefing materials four decision documents. And decision documents, um, these have been uh, developed as companion documents to the fishery management plans and are intended really as orienting documents to provide a high level overview of the information that's contained within the plan and to help the commission and also the public as you navigate that decision making process. And so with that, uh, I am finished. I've put my email up. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Does anybody have any questions right now of Laura? This is add a lot of clarity to how we do take public comment. Um, one of the biggest things that I've received over the last few meetings is, we all have stopped taking public comment. Well, that's not the case. We've had to abide by uh, privacy laws and staff doesn't have time to do all the redacting. Now, we can still receive emails personally from anybody who wants to comment to us, but they will not be part of the public record. So, if you saw last night, we are all for public comment, but it just has, as if with everything else, things changed along the way. So, any comments for Laura? Yeah, yes. Um, where is that, like, how is that pushed out to the public? Where can they, how does, how can we, like, better kind of get it in front of them? Or, or do you have any ideas about, about that? Um, well, currently we release it through our news release. Um, we also um, have it on the website for all of our meetings. Um, and it's also listed, I believe, on the DEQ um, news release page, uh, meetings page. So it, it's in those three different locations. Um, we try to spread it by word of mouth. <laughs> so if we get questions from anyone, we try to just let people know that it's available. Um, and we also, uh, instead of having it be available in different locations, we have it in a central location so that any link to it will work. Um, so in terms of um, how to get it out, uh, I'm working on it. <laughs> but we absolutely do want people to use it and have access to it. Um, this is another, this is actually more of a discussion topic about um, our phone numbers no longer being listed on there. I know we talked about that before, and I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of flipping back to maybe wanting my number on there personally, because a lot of people, you know, they're not going to use that email directly. And uh, I've actually, before they were taken off, I kind of got some, some inter interesting um, perspective that I probably wouldn't have gotten elsewise, and I was able to talk. So I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but, um, you know, I really wouldn't mind mine being back on there. Um asked staff to take those off a while back. Um, it, it got abused. And if you, if you want yours on there, we might put yours on there, but I don't want mine on there. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Anything else? No. Nope. Okay. Good. Doug. So just as a suggestion on the, maybe on the primary, page to the website i mean bold on one side or something like that because i mean i know how to get there i've done it enough now to get to the comments but i mean the average person from eastern north carolina is having difficulty yeah i think that's a really good idea and um we have currently so we updated our web page from um, an old platform to a new platform and then we recently updated it to an upgrade of the new platform so we are still um, in the process of finalizing the website. Uh, I do think that's a great idea to put it on the um, sort of landing page, that front landing page. Anything else? Laura, thank you very much. Appreciate Absolutely. all your efforts. Biggest efforts putting up with me, I believe. <laughs> so Kat, back to you. All right, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we have had, uh, DMF has had two employees <clears throat> that were recent recipients of the Department of Environmental Quality, Quality's Distinguished Employee Awards. 
And these, these awards basically uh, allow DEQ employees to recognize the outs outstanding contributions of their colleagues, uh, which are above and beyond uh, their performance expectations. So to me, these are the best kind of awards where you actually uh, get nominated by your peers. Uh, first of all, we have Kathy Storholt, who is our human resources manager for both the Division of Marine Fisheries and the Division of Coastal Management. Uh, since the pandemic, Kathy and her human resources team have been working extra hard to fulfill their regular human resources duties while also helping the divisions uh, respond to COVID-19 related adjustments, which there were many every day. Uh, even in the challenging times, staff in both divisions uh, know they can count on Kathy and her team. Her devotion to the job and the employees of DEQ shows and her hard work and dedication are the reasons she is an integral part of the department's success on the coast. So I want to congratulate uh, Kathy Storholt again, and we really thank her very much for her service, service, and we would dread our human resources responsibilities if it were not for her and her team, for sure. Also, we, uh, we had Alan Bianchi. Uh, he is here with us today. Uh, he is our commercial statistics program coordinator for the division. Uh, Alan's knowledge and data analysis uh, in the commercial fishing industry has helped him as a commercial statistics program coordinator for the Division of Marine Fisheries. Uh, he helped DEQ create and maintain relationships with other agencies and businesses, such as the Atlantic Coast Cooperative Statistics Program and the SAS Institute. Uh, using the knowledge and experience he gained by working with the SAS Institute, Alan found valuable data to implement relief programs such as CARES, Act Fisheries Relief Program and the State Hurricane Florence Relief Program. So congratulations again to Alan Bianchi for all his work and his dedicated service to the division. We really appreciate it and very deserving both he and Kathy for those awards. Uh, just a few more things regarding staff promotions. Uh, Lee Paramore, who is also with us today, has been promoted to the Northern District Manager within the Fisheries Management Section following the retirement of longtime division employee Katie West. Uh, Lee has a bachelor's and a master's in biology from East Carolina University and possesses over 25 years of experience with the division as a biologist and biologist supervisor. Uh, in his new role, Lee is responsible for all staff and day-to-day -day operations in the Northern District, which includes the Manio and Elizabeth City Field offices, as well as division staff in the Washington Regional Office. So he has a pretty big district uh, under his leadership at this point. So we're looking forward to working with Lee in that capacity. Uh, Casey Knight has also been promoted to our headquarters district manager for the fisheries management section. Casey has a bachelor's of science and a master's of science in zoology and fisheries from Auburn University. She has worked with the division of marine fisheries as a biologist in both the fisheries management section as well as a habitat enhancement section for eight years. Uh, in her new role, she will be overseeing the aging lab, uh, the multi-species tagging program, fisheries management permitting, as well as the observer program. Uh, these are section-wide programs, and they are active in every office that we have, and having a district manager that can provide direct supervision and support to these programs will definitely contribute to their continued success. So congratulations to uh, both Lee and Casey on their recent um, appointments. <coughs> Another uh, thing that we just wanted to mention was an accomplishment, a recent accomplishment of staff published a paper, Lee Paramore and co-authors Daniel Goldberg and Fred Scharf uh, recently published a peer-reviewed paper titled Analysis of Environment Recruitment Associations for a Coastal Red Drum Population Reveals Consistent Link Between Year Class Strength and Early Shifts and Nearshore Winds. The paper details the effects of environmental factors on the recruitment and year class strengths for red drum in North Carolina using division's juvenile trial survey data and additional environmental sampling. Uh, the results of the study will contribute to a better understanding of factors that influence uh, recruitment estimates and coastwide stock assessment for, for red drum. Again, Lee is here today, and if anybody's interested in getting more details uh, about, the, about the report, and you can certainly get that right from the horse's mouth. So. I'm um, going to move on to Marine Patrol uh, and hook and line issue. So at Chairman Bizzle's request, uh, I have asked Colonel Whitten to give you an overview of laws, rules, and proclamations that currently govern the commercial use of hook and line gear. 
Uh, and Mr. Chairman, if it's okay with you, uh, I've asked Carter to go ahead and give his start with his Marine Patrol report since he's going to be up there. He can kill two birds with one stone. And uh, once he's reviewed the information on the hook and line, we'd be glad to answer those questions. Just for the commission, the commercial use of hook and line issue arose again recently uh, after a Facebook post of a charter operation selling their charter's catch of red drum was widely circulated. Uh, Marine Patrol was notified of this, both the charter operation and the dealer uh, were checked and found to be in full compliance with all Marine Fisheries Commission regulations. But this did prompt some questions regarding uh, regulations for commercial hook and line use in the state. So Colonel Witten is going to cover that after his uh, Marine Patrol report. So Colonel Witten. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. I'm Colonel Witten and I'm providing you a quarterly Marine Patrol update. In your briefing books, I have provided you the Marine Patrol quarterly report. In February quarter business meeting, we gave you an update. The Marine Patrol had finally finished the revisions to the civil penalty process. The Marine Patrol has processed six civil penalties at this time. During the flounder season, we, we saw high catches of nice sized flounder in both the recreational and the commercial season. Right now, the Marine Patrol presently has six open positions. The division has had several inquiries about being able to fish commercially with hook and line. Commissioner Kanigi and Chairman Bizzle have asked about seven specific species. I will provide an over overview of the current regulations for those specifics and will be happy to answer any questions afterwards. In your briefing book, we also provided you a handout of the specific rules and proclamations that govern those seven specific species. Red drum have a size limit of 18 to 27 inches total length. It's unlawful to possess more than one red drum per person per day taken by hook and line or for recreational purpose. So you would be able to have one red drum per person per day, not to exceed seven fish by hook and line, you do have to have the appropriate bycatch to possess. A commercial fishing operation needs to exceed the weight of red drum with either bluefish, black drum, flounder, or striped mullet. These regulations are in rule and proclamation. For flounder, the rule does not differentiate between southern, summer, and gulf flounder. Flounder for internal coastal waters, hook and line is allowed when the season is open. Flounder in internal waters have a minimum size limit of 15 inches total length, internal coastal waters. The limit for internal coastal waters for a commercial fishing operation cannot exceed the total allowable catch. It's unlawful to take flounder in a commercial fishing operation from the Atlantic Ocean by hook and line. This regulation is in proclamation. Spotted sea trout have a minimum size limit of 14 inches total length unlawful to possess more than four spotted sea trout per person per day taken by hook and line in joint and coastal waters. This regulation is in proclamation. Sheep's head have a minimum size limit of 10 inches fork length. A commercial fishing operation is allowed to use hook and line and cannot exceed 300 pounds. That regulation is in proclamation also. Black drum have a minimum size limit of 14 inches to 25 inches total length and only one fish over 25 inches total length. You are allowed 10 fish per person per day by hook and line. This regulation is in proclamation also. Weak fish, 12 inches total length, a commercial fishing operation is allowed to use hook and line and cannot exceed 100 pounds per commercial fishing operation. This regulation is in proclamation. Striped bass presently is closed for commercial in internal coastal waters of the central southern management area. The regulation is in proclamation. The commercial season is also closed in the Albemarle Sound management area. The Albemarle Sound management area is also closed at this time. When the season was open in the Albemarle Sound management area, the proclamation stated it is unlawful to sell, offer for sale, or purchase striped bass taken by hook and line. That regulation is in proclamation also. That concludes my update. Does anyone have any questions? Questions? Anybody with any questions? 
So somebody like myself who does have a commercial fishing license that's never really activated it, I could fish inside coal rigs or flounder when there's a commercial season going on by hook and line and then not elect to sell my catch but keep them for myself. Correct. At this time, we don't. There's general statutes and rules do not mandate you to go sell your catch. Yeah. I, I think using hook and line for commercial aspects, commercial um, operations is a good thing. But this, I'm, I'm nervous about this causing somebody like me to circumvent the rules, the intention of the rules. But right now, they are the rules. And that's something that maybe shortly we need to, to, to look at uh, and, and probably address, possibly, possibly address it. So, Cap. Mr. Chairman, if I might just remind the commission that, and I think this was around 2010, um, this commission received a petition for rulemaking from a Mr. Massengill who really wanted the commission to look at the issue of commercial hook and line uh, opportunities. Uh, he did that. He wanted that because he was an older gentleman and he was, um, you know, not as spry as he used to be. These are his words, not mine. And he, he wanted some, uh, you know, something other than a gill net or some other type of gear to use. So the commission uh, guidance to the division at that time was for the division to, in their FMPs, consider commercial hook and line fisheries uh, in our FMPs, which we are currently doing. I just wanted to remind the commission of that, that we are looking at this issue in, in all of our fishery management plans. Okay. Doug. Mr. Chairman, I've got a commercial license like you, and when I go speckled trout fishing, I mean, I guess I would be allotted whatever, but I mean, I only I abide by the four fish rule I think it's a matter of more of a personal type decision. I mean, you're going to circumvent the law, then you're going to circumvent it regardless. And, you know, it's just a matter of a personal decision not to break the statutes and abide by what, you know, it's laid down to what you can do on hook and line and look at that. I mean, I know it could be abused, but it's very, it's a very small percentage. The percentage of that being abused is probably not getting abused anywhere near or or any more than just somebody breaking the, the limit otherwise. I say, you know, it's probably the same thing. And, and I see your point, but uh, commercially, you can catch 75 speckled trout. And recreationally, you can catch four. Hook and line, you can catch four. Four. But, uh, but commercially, hook and line, speckled trout. Four fish. Four, four fish. fish. Okay. All right. Okay, any other comments? Uh, Director, hi, Chairman Bizzle. Ah, if I may. Okay, takes me some time so, so I can see you. Okay. So, so. Um, you know, I agree with uh, Commissioner Cross on his comment when it comes to speckled trout, but I think we have to look at these loopholes species by species. Um, and the co concerns I've raised before is that how it pertains to southern flounder in particular. Um, since we have separate seasons, commercial and recreational, um, that fall in, 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 in different time periods, there seems to be a very quickly growing group. Of, I shouldn't say group of people, but there seems to be a lot of interest in folks since we have these different seasons using their scuffles to retain more Southern flounder during the commercial season, whether they're for hire operator or just someone who has an inactive commercial license. It just extends their season. And there's nothing required under law for them to report those fish. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the division has recommended language to close some of those loopholes that would have to be legislative, legislative and in, in, um, uh, would have to be legislated. Um, but until that, um, I, 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 I'm really concerned about how this pertains to certain seasons and ask what we as a commission can do about it. Thank you, Tom. Anybody else? All right, Colonel, thank you for your report. Appreciate it. Thank you. Add a lot of clarity to things. Cap. Thank you, Colonel. All right, moving on to catch you later update. 
Uh, today you'll hear uh, a presentation from our flounder lead staff on Amendment 3 to the Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan. And while we work closely with this commission throughout the FMP development process, including implementation, we are always working on other projects in the background to improve the data and subsequent analysis that our recommendations are based on. Uh, to that end, end, I've asked Dr. Drew Cathy to present you with a quick update on the Catch You Later app, which was deployed earlier this year. This is one of many efforts the division is currently working on to improve real-time monitoring of uh, recreational fisheries, which we, we desperately need. Dr. Cathy recently attended the American Fisheries Society meeting uh, where he was able to present this ongoing uh, citizen science project to other fisheries scientists as well. So, Dr. Cathy? Thank you, Madam Director, Chairman Bizzle, Commissioners. Okay, um, if you remember back in May, it was my great pleasure to kind of get everyone oriented to our recent citizen science initiative catch you later, which is a smartphone and tablet application that we're using to augment some data limitations for MRIP that are specific to flounder management here in North Carolina. Um, as Director Rawls mentioned, we launched this application uh, recently back in August 23rd of this year. And it's my pleasure today to give you an update on kind of where we are in the process and present you with some preliminary data that we've collected. Bear with me, it's operator error. There we go. All right, thank you. ECU, bear with me. <laughs> um, okay, so um, some of these slides you may remember from May, and we're just gonna have a little bit of a background to try to orient ourselves to these data limitations and the, the purpose of this project. So MRIP is the division's primary uh, recreational data collection program. We partner with NOAA Fisheries. And the purpose of the MRIP is to create estimates of total catch. Um, MRIP is a one size fits all creel survey. It's designed to produce estimates of all fin fish. But as we're all aware, it's not a one size fits all world. So there are some limitations. Um, we'll begin by looking at our harvest estimates for Southern Flounder. This table is just 2018 through 2020. We have our harvest and numbers of fish as well as pounds. Uh, this PSE column is our proportional standard error. That's gonna be the measure of precision with the associated point estimate. And the general rule of thumb is that a PSE of 20 or less is really the gold standard to incorporate this data into a stock assessment model. So we look at our harvest estimates, we can see they're precise. You know, we, we can live with this. It's, it's, MRIP is doing its job. It's when we start looking at our discard estimates that we begin to experience a little bit of heartburn. So our field staff do not physically get to see discarded catch. Uh, they are reported to them. And for that reason, we record all discarded flounder to the left eye flounder genus. As we're all well aware, we have three constituent species of flounder in North Carolina, Southern, Summer, and Gulf. Uh, they're notoriously ambiguous and hard to identify. And so for this reason, we record everything to this left eye flounder genus. Uh, the estimates themselves are pretty precise, but the rub is that we do not know these constituent species. And we also don't get to have any biological weight because, again, we don't see them, excuse me, biological data, things such as length and weight. Oh, Here we go. Okay, so we're briefly going to walk through our primary research objectives of Catch You Later, and they're going to play right into those data limitations I just mentioned. So the first research objective is what are these constituent species uh, in these left eye flounder genus discards? And our current methodology involves partitioning these discards using the ratio of observed harvest, um, which isn't um, the best way to go about this. We'd like to actually observe um, these constituent species, but at the moment it's really all we have to work with. And this pie chart shows you our current breakdown using that methodology. It's about 66% Southern, 32% Summer, and 2% Gulf. So our second research objective is what are the species specific uh, link distributions of discarded flounder? So this figure is going to be a weighted link frequency of southern flounder from 2020. It's just the numbers of fish and the total length in inches. And so we're managing southern flounder in pounds um, and there's an associated discard mortality 
And it's going to be really critical for us to identify the length of these fish. We can have the associated weight to better characterize the fishery to really get our arms around uh, this discard mortality. And having this data will also inform potentially lowering a size limit or having a slot limit that's lower than our current minimum of 15 inches. Uh, we need to be able to evaluate what sort of impact this will have on the recreational fishery. And finally, our last research objective is can anglers tell the difference between North Carolina's flounder species? And the benefit of this will be to evaluate the feasibility of single species management. As mentioned uh, previously, all three species of flounder are managed as an aggregate in North Carolina. And what we've seen is that as we've increased the size limit through time, we've effectively excluded summer flounder. Um, so the division has a really strong argument as to having paid summer flounder forward and to be allowed access to these oscillated stocks. However, before we can do this, it's going to be really critical that we evaluate if people can actually tell the difference. Um, so we can allow access to these oscillated flounder while still maintaining appropriate management for southern flounder. So we launched our app on August 23rd, 2021. I'm just going to walk you through a few screenshots of the application. Uh, this is our home page with our individual records. Uh, once you get in, we ask you what species of flounder you think it is. We ask about mode of fishing, private boat, charter boat, shore mode. Uh, the date the trip was taken, where you fish, where there's inshore state territorial seas or in the exclusive economic zone. We also ask that they provide an associated link. Um, Commissioner Cornegie called me out last time for having fork links for southern flounder. So we have updated that from our beta testing to total links. Um, and then we also have GPS functionality baked into the application. So if people want to tell us exactly where they were fishing, uh, they're able to do so. And then we have some optional information about hook location, hook type and whether it's released alive or dead. Okay, so this is just um, our respondents uh, by area. And so we have our coastal and non-coastal strata. Uh, coastal will be exactly that. Uh, coastal and the non-coastal is gonna be Wake County, Raleigh metro area. If we remember, we randomly selected people from our license database to participate in this project. And so we have our coastal, non-coastal, we have our high and low, that's gonna to refer to avidity. Um, if you remember from my presentation in May, most people don't fish very often, about 50% of the people we intercept go 10 or less times a year. So we really wanted to, to capture them in this study. Uh, so it would be truly representative. And then finally we have uh, T and UT, that's gonna be trained and untrained. So a portion of our participants received our flounder ID brochure. And we did this to, to see if we could gauge if someone could be easily trained in flounder identification. Will a trifold brochure provided to them at the time of license sales be sufficient for them to identify flounder? And so this is representative of about 288 records. I ran this analysis about three weeks ago. We currently have almost 400. So we're getting about 50, 60 records a week. And the map to your left just shows um, where these samples uh, were collected. And so we have really nice representation throughout the coast, um, which is critical, you know. Um, a lot of times you do these citizen science projects, they attract people that are more engaged and informed. Again, we try to randomly select people from our license database. And so this is exactly what we wanna see, coast-wide representation. Okay, um, so not every record we receive um, is usable. We had 26 or 11% of our 288 records uh, due to a picture not being uploaded, just kind of the cost of business of living in the real world. Or sometimes it was unusable, like my, my poor gentleman here, he gets a, a E for effort. Okay, so here's a little bit of preliminary data as it relates to our specific research objectives. Uh, number one, what are these uh, species compositions of our left eye flounder genus? So from our observed data from Catch you Later, we're clocking about 84% as Southern Flounder, 12 and a half as Summer, and 3.3 as Gulf. And then the pie chart to the bottom is our estimated compositions uh, from our MRIP harvest ratios. And so we can see there's a bit of a difference um, between these species compositions. Again, this is really preliminary data. We only have a couple of months, and it's gonna be really critical that we get some meat on the bones of this data set before we can, we can really apply it. Um, but as it stands, um, we're collecting a lot of valuable data about the species composition. Okay, our second research objective is what are the length frequency of these discarded flounder? So this is just a raw count in numbers of fish of our flounder species at particular size lengths. So, you know, again, there's been interest in slot, length, slot limits or potentially lowering the size limit. 
now that we have this data, we can begin to start evaluating what sort of impact um, changing these management strategies will have. Um, again, all this data has been collected over the last couple of months. It's a really critical period in the life history of these fish. They're getting ready to go out to the shelf and spawn. So we're going to need um, at least a year's worth of data before we can draw any broad conclusions. But as it stands, um, we're starting to collect some really, really valuable data. And then finally, can anglers identify flounder to species? And so this is correct identification as a percentage for our individual flounder species. And what we're seeing is that people are pretty good at our southern and summer flounder. It's almost a 75% classification success. So it looks like people are able to tell the difference. I was surprised when I, I saw this data. I didn't think it was going to be this high. Uh, we got our gulf flounder. People were having a little bit more problems with it, uh, almost an 80% uh, misclassification. But again, Gulf flounder was a very small proportion of our sample size. Having this uh, axis and percentage is a little misleading. This is only about 10 observations. Uh, but as it stands right now, it looks like you know, they're, they're doing a pretty good job at telling the difference uh, between our flounder. And so that's it uh, for today. I look forward to uh, briefing you again, maybe six months or so down the road as we get more data. And I'll be happy to take any questions, comments, or concerns. Thank you. Questions? Flounder most often misidentified as summer flounder. So, okay. so it's uh, absolutely, and um, it seems the oscillated versus non oscillated is a, a very good classification. Mm -hmm. Would have thought they've been misthought to be summer, but yes, Tom. Okay, text me, man. I can't see. I'm not paying any mind. <laughs> can I? Can I comment? Uh -huh. Chairman? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Kathy, so there's a lot of interest, you know, big picture in supplementing MREC with new sorts of data collection programs, particularly in circumstances like our Southern Flounder situation, where we're, we're asking a lot of MREC into be an in-season uh, in monitoring tool, which we know it is really not as, was, wasn't really designed to do. Do you foresee this program potentially being a way to have some sort of validated reporting in the future or 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 require you, you, anyway I, you um, so go yeah, ahead absolutely I think this technology would be be applicable to uh, mandatory recreation reporting you know it's going to be a big lift to actually change the laws to have people do that uh, but the technology seems to be there uh, there will have to be a substantial education outreach and uh, enforcement component. But I absolutely think that's the direction this technology is heading. And um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and another question: um, Has there any been? Is there any sort of um, technology to help people ID fish with this sort of application? You know, for example, I use a plant app on my phone called Picture This, and I can use any leaf or bark on a tree and get an almost instantaneous um, uh, ID of that plant. Is there anything like that for fish that's out there? I know that there's a lot of interest in some of that technology to uh, supplement observer coverage on head boats and charter boats and things, things like that. Um, absolutely, um, that technology could be baked into this. We had a series of scoping workshops to try to uh, identify ways to enhance retention and um, the sort of things that would keep people engaged. And that was absolutely something that, that came up across all sectors and user groups was the ability to have some sort of identification functionality in the application. Um, we were thinking more in terms of actually like an ID brochure embedded or maybe a hyperlink. Um, the sort of, it sounds like you're talking about sort of like a, a neural network where it identifies the, the, the computer identifies what it is for you instead of having to look it up. Um, but as that technology becomes more available, absolutely, I'd be interested in it. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was referring to. So. Okay, anything else? Great, thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Drew. Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right, CARES Act. So this time we'll uh, ask Deputy Director Dee Lupton to give you an update on the CARES Act funding and uh, Hurricane Florence funding. Uh, as I have, excuse me, as I have done in the past and I will continue to do, I'd like to give a shout out to Dee and division staff, uh, her, her team for working on these uh, funding initiatives. There's a lot of work that this division is not staffed 
or really train for, uh, but under Dee's leadership, no one would ever know that that is the case. So thank you again to Dee and her staff for working on this. So good morning. Uh, I'll give you the update on our, as Kat said, the uh, progress of our latest CARES program and some other information that's come about. Um, we are in the process of administering the 4.5 million of the North Carolina's portion of the fisheries assistance from the Consolidated Appropriations Act. We call it the CARES II. This is our second CARES program. Um, as a reminder, last December, legislation was passed, federal legislation, to provide an additional $255 million nationwide for fisheries assistance due to COVID. We developed a spending plan, uh, released it out uh, the draft for public comment, finalized it, and submitted it to um, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, who submitted it to NOAA on June 30th. So the, these funds um, on the East Coast funnel through the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, the plan was approved on July 29th. Uh, we started accepting applications August 16th. Um, applications and all supporting documents had to be received within the Moorhead City uh, office by 5 p.m. on October 1st. Uh, we we tried to, um, to try to help speed up the process a little bit. We tried to pre-qualify people based on trip ticket data, so we um, we mailed 6,934 application packages to the pre-qualified license, lease, and permit holders. Um, other people who were not pre-qualified in our database could also apply because we uh, CARES covered people who were outside of the trip ticket program, um, like for hire industry, um, aquaculture, some some and and processors. Uh, they could also apply. So we put the um, application package on the website, sent out news releases, and and they could apply. And a key component here sometimes is that. Uh, people can fish in other states and land in other states, but they have to qualify in their state of residency. So, um, you know, you don't even have to have a North Carolina license and qualify through the North Carolina plan. Um, applicants have to um, complete a required application, sign an affidavit, provide the supporting documents. Um, they have to show for this program a 35% total revenue loss for from fishing or whatever their activity was from March 1st through December 31st of 2020, as compared to the average revenue from the same period for the previous five years of March 1st through December 31st of 2015 through 2019. Um, also, um, eligible stakeholders who received funds or assistance from the CARES One program could still apply. Um, so, the, and if they received assistance, that money will be deducted from CARES too, because that program only cover between Mar March and May. Um, so, the objective of the CARES two program is to make participants whole. That is to put them in the same position financially as they would have been if COVID had not occurred. Um, NOAA Fisheries, the law um, also requires that any relief money received from the program does not result in the participants annual earnings, meaning January through December 2020 exceed their five year average from the previous five years from from the activities uh, that they're applying from. Um, so we are still in the middle of processing CARES 2 program. So as of last Friday, the, the statistics of where we are. We received 390 applications by the deadline. Um, 27 of the pre-qualified people actually replied to us and said they weren't even interested in applying. You know, if you didn't want to apply, you didn't have to even tell us you weren't interested. But um, 27 did. Um, we 39 applications were repending review. Um, 241 applications have been reviewed and approved so far. This is a, as of last Friday. 80 applications have been reviewed and denied. Uh, there is an appeal process. Um, the three denied applications are pending appeal review. Um, all the applications and the appeals have to be have to have a final determination of eligibility before any funds can be issued because the funds will be allocated based on the proportion or the percentage of eligible claim fishing loss revenue in relation to all stakeholders within that stakeholder category. Um, we anticipate being able to complete the review 
of the applications and hopefully of all the appeals by the first of the year and hopefully checks will be mailed out within the first quarter of 2022. Um, we, once we finalize everything, we still have to submit everything to the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. They have to accept it and then actually they cut the check to the state and the state has to deposit and then the state writes the check. So there's some um, that uh, logistical issue we have to get through at the end. So that's an update on um, the CARES 2 program. Um, to pro provide a quick update on the federal fishery disaster funds related to Hurricane Florence from 2018. Um, as a reminder, the governor asked for um, a federal fishery disaster declaration um, from NOAA Fisheries and that was granted. Um, that required NOAA to do a fisheries assessment and determine the losses in North Carolina, which they did um, in 2019. Um, and based on their report, we were notified in March of 2020 that North Carolina is eligible for over 7.7 .7 million in federal fishery disaster assistance. So that's the same time as when CARES happened, COVID happened, everything else. So. Um, it has taken a while for um, NOAA Fisheries to re approve that money. So what that required was for us to develop a spending plan, um, which we submitted on June 16th of 2020. Then um, they did provide some comments. We resubmit, we, we addressed those comments, resubmitted in September 2020. And really up until this past summer, we didn't have any communication with NOAA Fisheries about the status of the plan, and we inquired monthly. Um, this past summer, as I reported in August, um, NOAA Fisheries did advise that they were reviewing and sent some comments back to us. We had to revise it, and uh, uh, we resubmitted a revised spending plan on August 5th. They reviewed again, uh, had more comments. We submitted it back on August 9th. Um, so just last week, we have been notified that NOAA Fisheries anticipates an approval with the start date of January 1st of 2022. Haven't got that official, it's only a verbal. So since we're, such, we're near the end of completing CARES 2, our plan is if that plan is approved on January 1st, we are going to finish the CARES 2 program first before starting the Federal Fishery Disaster Program. It's the same staff is doing both um, based on whatever fisheries, um, no fisheries approves, there will be several logistical items we'll have to need to complete before applications can be developed, distributed and applications accepted. So it may be the second quarter of 2022 before we'll be able to start developing that program, but we anticipate starting it hopefully early next year. Um, so that spending plan also proposes distribution of funding through direct payments to affected seafood dealers and processors, bait and tackle shops, and for hire businesses and ocean fishing piers that can document lost revenue or damages due to Hurricane Florence. I will say one of the things that NOAA Fisheries gets hung up in our spending plan, they want to make sure that there that anybody applying for any damages can prove that they, did, they didn't also claim those same damages and receive compensation through insurance. To me, all that we can be that can be done, but that seems to be one of their holdups when they're reviewing the plan, and we've tried to address that numerous times. Um, so these were the stakeholders that weren't compensated in the state funded hurricane assistance program that primarily went to commercial fishermen. So that's where we are in the hurricane Florence program. So hopefully in at least February, I can say they've been it's been approved, but I'll knock on wood. I don't know if it will. So I'll move on to our third <laughs> program. So I have one other economic assistance program. This past September, we were informed that the U.S. Department of Agriculture received funding under the 2021 Consolidated Appropriations Act to address COVID impacts. Um, it, this including include funds to assist seafood processors with certain costs this program is called the Seafood Processors Pandemic Response and Safety Block Grant Program. The program will provide assistance for defraying expenses incurred for preparing for, preventing exposure to, and responding to the COVID-19 pandemic for seafood processing facilities and processing vessels, if you had any. We don't have any. 
uh, Department of Ag will award grants to a eligible state agency first, and then the state agency will run the program. Um, it will provide relief to seafood processors, including processing facilities, dealers, and processing vessels who incurred costs due to COVID-19. The state agency must submit an application outlining how the funds will be distributed by November 22nd, next week. Um, North Carolina is eligible for a little over $279,000, not a lot of money, but it's that's what our allocation was based on. We, for this program, we've been in a communication a lot with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer um, Services concerning this program. They follow seafood safety. We don't follow seafood safety. So they, after several conversations, they will be taking the lead for applying for the money and distributing the money. Um, and we've offered any assistance if they need anything. Um, so that program, I don't know what the anticipated approval date of those plans, but um, North Carolina Department of Ag will submit the application. Um, and they'll be the contact, but if anybody has any questions, I could try to find out through Ag about what's the status of the program. Like I said, I'm sure it takes a couple of months for that uh, application to be approved and reviewed before Ag can initiate anything. So with that, um, I, one thing Kat mentioned, I do want to thank all the staff who worked through the pandemic to continue to administer the CARES programs and develop and follow up on the Hurricane Florence disaster funds. There's, this, this is a team effort. The license and statistics section and the administrative section really take the burden of these programs and they do this on top of all their other work. Um, I don't think we've missed a beat on our other work, but there are very long weeks and hours. Um, so I want to, there, it's been a team effort and I, every time I think we see a light at the end of the tunnel, something else comes along. Um, but hopefully by this time next year, maybe we won't have any more assistance programs to at least on the horizon. So with that, um, that concludes my update. Questions to D? I do have one. Do you know if these, um, uh, funds are subject to any sort of state or federal income taxes? Just I, curious. We do, we tell people they are because you'll get a W nine or ten ninety nine. Yeah, because they're they're supplementing your income. Right. Um, so they are subject. Yeah. To it. Okay. All right. So just, I know it's tedious work, and we appreciate you and the staff of what you're doing with it. So thank you very much, Dee. Madam Director. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. So now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Bat Savage, his, who is going to update you on the happenings at ASMFC as well as the Mid Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Uh, you, as usual, you can follow along in your um, in the meeting summaries provided in your briefing materials. Thank you, Kat. Hi again. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to start with the Mid Atlantic Council meeting uh, summary, then do the ASMFC kind of all together. There's uh, you know, some common uh, items uh, covered uh, in, in both meetings. So, um, you know, as usual, I'll just hit on the kind of the, the highlights for, for both, and I'll start with Mid Atlantic Council uh, with uh, spiny dogfish specifications. Uh, the council reviewed the spiny dogfish specifications for 2022, which were set last year for both the 2021 and 2020. 22 fishing years. The uh, council maintained the commercial quota of 29.6 million pounds in 2022 and recommended a 25% increase in the federal waters trip limit uh, from 6,000 pounds to 7,500 pounds. This increase uh, is intended to stabilize the spiny dogfish uh, fishery participation in landings, both uh, that which have decreased over the uh, last several years. Um, spiny dogfish in federal waters are jointly managed by the Mid Atlantic Council and New England uh, Fishery Management Councils. Uh, the New England Council will review the 2022 spiny dogfish specifications and consider a change to the federal waters trip limits uh, when they meet in early December. Uh, NIMS will then consider the recommendations from both councils before implementing federal waters regulations for the 2022 fishing year, which begins on May 1st. State waters trip limits are managed by ASMFC. Uh, the states from New York to North Carolina can set their own state water trip limits, while the New England states uh, implement state water trip limits that are the same as in federal waters. Last month, ASMFC Spiny Dogfish Management Board postponed uh, considering changes to the state waters trip limits for the New England states until next January, 
to see what the New England Council recommends next month. Okay, next uh, item covered in the uh, Mid-Atlantic Council meeting is uh, North Atlantic right whales. Uh, the Atlantic large whale take reduction team was in uh, the scoping process earlier this fall to rec recommend risk reduction measures for the trap pot and gillnet fisheries along the entire east coast. Management measures uh, could potentially, these management measures could potentially impact mid-Atlantic council managed species such as bluefish, spiny dogfish, scup, and black sea bass. The council was briefed on the scope materials and asked to provide feedback on the types of measures proposed to be analyzed for risk reduction. The Council's Protected Resources Committee also reviewed the information in late September and provided recommendations uh, for the Council to consider. The Council provided feedback and agreed on, with the Protected Resources uh, Committee's recommendations to have the committee meet as needed throughout the uh, take reduction plan process, communicate the stakeholders to maximize participation from impacted fishermen, and uh, issues such as limited access fisheries, changes to permitting, or trap caps in the fishery should be addressed through the council process instead of the large whale take reduction plan. The uh, take reduction team is scheduled to meet in early 22, 2022 to discuss uh, possible uh, measures and scoping results. And the team will meet again uh, in the spring to develop recommended measures for the proposed rule. And an additional um, round of public comment will be solicited uh, following the release of the proposed rule. So. Let's move right into the uh, ASMFC meeting summary. They met a couple weeks after uh, the Mid Atlantic Council in October. Uh, first item I'll cover is uh, striped bass. Uh, the Atlantic Striped Bass Management Board met to consider approval of draft amendment seven for public comment. Just as a reminder, uh, striped bass management for ASMFC uh, ranges from Maine to North Carolina. The four issues for development in draft amendment seven are management triggers, measures to protect the 2015 year class, Recreational release mortality and conservation equivalency. The board discussed uh, the proposed management measures for each of the four issues and uh, removed uh, some options from the document, pr primarily due to concern that certain options uh, would not be viable for implementation. Either they were too difficult to implement or did not, did not provide enough provide enough protection uh, to the striped bass stock. The board uh, also tasked the uh, plan development team uh, with development of new options to add to the draft amendment for the board's review. Uh, for the fishing mortality threshold management triggers that address overfishing, uh, the board added a draft option that considers a two-year average of fishing mortality exceeding the, uh, the threshold, in addition to the three-year average that's already in the uh, document. The board also tasked the PDT with uh, developing uh, formal rebuilding plan options, uh, including one that incorporates a low juvenile recruitment regime uh, that we're uh, currently seeing in the Coast Watch stock right now. Uh, the board also tasked the PDT with adding a maximum size limit uh, and slot limit options to the Chesapeake Bay Recreational Fishery Management Measures section for protecting the 2015, 2017, and 2018 year classes. And, and those year classes in particular were the, the last uh, few that were uh, above the, uh, the average uh, for, the, for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the board will uh, review Draft Amendment 7 again at their winter meeting next January, where they'll consider approving it for public comment. The uh, other item covered by the management board was um, was uh, consideration of approval of draft addendum seven to amendment six for public comment, which uh, could allow voluntary transfer of commercial striped bass quota between states and jurisdictions to have a commercial quota. This currently isn't allowed in this FMP, unlike other uh, ASMFC, ASMFC FMPs where commercial quota transfers uh, can occur. The board reviewed the options and a report from the plan development team uh, describing concerns about commercial quota transfers. And these concerns were raised over the possibility of latent commercial quota used by other states undermining the efforts to end overfishing and rebuild the striped bass stock. Due to the PDT's concerns and the board's current focus on Amendment 7, uh, the board deferred consideration of this draft addendum until uh, next May to allow for further development and review of the uh, transfer options. And next item I'll cover is uh, Atlantic Menhaden. Um, the Atlantic Menhaden Technical Committee and Ecological Reference Point Work Group wrote a memo to the uh, Menhaden Management Board. Our body, such as Chesapeake Bay. and biomass estimates for the entire population, not just any one particular area in the range. 
The uh, memo highlighted that uh, any of the approaches would likely extend the timeline for completing the next benchmark assessment, which is currently slated uh, for 2025. Uh, the board uh, indicated that uh, completing this benchmark stock assessment on time uh, was the highest priority. So while some special considerations may be incorporated in the process of refining the ecological reference point models in the benchmark stock assessment, spatial modeling will not be uh, pursued until the uh, 2025 benchmark uh, assessment is uh, completed. Um, the uh, management board was also presented a progress update on the development of draft addendum one to amendment three. Uh, which considers uh, changes to the commercial allocations, the episodic set aside program, and the incidental catch and small scale uh, fisheries provision. Uh, the PDT uh, provided the board with a statement of the problem, objective, initial set of management alternatives, and uh, PDT recommendations for each topic, as well as questions to the board to help develop this addendum. The board provided feedback to the uh, and the PDT will uh, continue work on the draft addendum with the aim of uh, providing the document to the board. To approve for public comment um, when ASMFC meets uh, next January. Okay, the uh, next item I'll cover is uh, the policy board's uh, discussion of the recreational harvest control rule uh, framework slash addendum. Uh, the ASMFC's policy board met jointly with the Mid Atlantic Fishery Management Council to receive an update on the development of the recreational harvest control rule slash addendum to address management of the recreational summer flounder, scup, black sea bass, and bluefish fisheries. Uh, this would change the, the process of how recreational management measures uh, for these species are set. A harvest control rule uh, relies less on uh, expected fishery performance, and by that I mean harvest compared to the uh, existing regulations, and instead uses a more comprehensive approach with greater emphasis on stock status indicators and trends. The uh, different harvest control rule options um, in, in, the, in the draft uh, document are designed to prevent overfishing, are reflective of stock status, appropriately account for the uncertainty in the recreational data, take into consideration angler preferences, and provide an opportunity, appropriate level of uh, stability and predictability in changes from year to year. Uh, but given the scope of work uh, required on the document's full range of options, the policy board and the council deferred approving the, uh, the draft addendum and framework for public comment and instead will uh, revi revisit the draft uh, sometime or in early 2022 to, and to provide the uh, PDT more time to uh, complete the document. Uh, public comment should occur sometime a little later in 2022 and the harvest control rural management measures are expected to be ready for use in 2023. All right, so before I conclude my reports, uh, I do want to um, brief the commission on the North Carolina American Shad Sustainable Fishery Plan. Uh, also included in your briefing material is the annual update memo on North Carolina's American Shad Sustainable Fishery Management Plan. That provides an update on the status of the uh, sustainable plan and 2022 management measures. Uh, just as a reminder, back in October of 2017, uh, ASMFC approved uh, North Carolina Sustainable Fishery Management Plan for American Shad uh, for 2018 through 2022. Uh, this plan is evaluated by the ASMFC Shad and River Herring Technical Committee and uh, Management Board every five years. Uh, no sustainability parameters exceeded the threshold uh, for this plan in 2021. Uh, the American Shad, the 2021 American Shad management measures will be maintained for the 2022 season in all areas except the Cape Fear River. Um, a one day season shift is necessary in the Cape Fear River to prevent opening the fishery on a weekend, but the number of days in the season remains the same. Uh, more details on the sustainable fishery management plan can, can be found in the memo and the briefing materials. So that concludes uh, updates on ASMC and Mid Atlantic Council. Mr. Chair, I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Chris. Any questions? Right, only one today without questions. Appreciate your efforts on this. Um, Madam Director. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So now we'll be turning it over to Steve Poland. Uh, to give you the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council update, and this will be for the last time. I think we said that last time. I think this really is the last time. This is it. Uh, just, as a, just as a reminder, Steve is now the Fisheries Management Section Chief, and will be uh, handing over the reins uh, for the South Atlantic Council duties to Trish Murphy. So, Steve. All right. Thank you, Kat. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back in the room. 
So the South Atlantic Council met the second week of September 2021. It was a packed agenda. Uh, we met uh, virtually, and um, I believe this will be our last virtual meeting. The next meeting scheduled for December in Beaufort. So I would encourage any commissioners that are in the area to attend since it's uh, right in our backyard. If you look in your briefing materials, I believe it's in the director's report, but there's a news release summary of the last Southland Fishery Council meeting, as well as a list of motions passed um, by the council. I'll walk through this news relief and provide some additional comments and context. Um, the main topic of discussion uh, in September was uh, the approval of deep water coral amendment 10. Uh, this amendment looked at allowing um, or, or creating shrimp fishery access areas along the eastern edge of a coral HAPC off of the coast of Florida. Um, this was an action that the council originally took to expand this coral um, habitat area, particular concern seven years ago. And in doing that, um, fishermen uh, raised a concern that it would be excluding them from some of the historical um, access to that area. So the council uh, committed to revisit and review. Um, there was considerable uh, public input from shrimpers and um, the general public with concerns over potential impacts to the coral in this area and a fair amount of consternation um, during our discussion at the council um, over the last uh, couple meetings. The council did um, approve the Amendment 10 to create these fishery access areas on that eastern edge of the coral. So like every South Atlantic Council meeting, uh, we talked about Red Snapper and we talked about Red Snapper for a while. If you recall, um, my last update, um, I updated the commission on the results of the most recent Red Snapper stock assessment. The stock is still overfished and overfishing is occurring, but abundance is at an all time high uh, for that stock. Um, the issue is, um, Spawning stock biomass is just not there yet, so the population is made up of a lot of um, young, young red snapper. So um, until those snapper grow a little bit more and start spawning, um, statutory requirements of the council uh, require the council to continue to manage and to rebuild that stock. Um, the large source of mortality for that stock is uh, discards, discards from um, recreational and commercial um, effort out in federal waters and um, the high amount of um, dead discards of uh, red snapper. So the council spent a lot of time talking about um, potential ways to reduce um, discards and dead discards to provide more access to the red snapper stock. Uh, the council um, is committed or committed themselves to um, considering uh, gear modifications, which uh, could include single hook rigs, larger hooks, uh, potential leader modifications, and natural bait prohibitions um, in the snapper group or fishery, a consideration of a slot limit for red snapper, um, increasing outreach on best fishing practices to encourage anglers to release fish um, in a way that maximizes the likelihood that those fish will survive and um, data collection through the council's um, citizen science project. Um, since the stock is still overfished and um, overfishing is occurring, the council is required by law to begin in another amendment um, to revise management measures for red snapper. The council initiated that amendment at this meeting. Um, the items that I just mentioned as far as uh, reducing a uh, number of red snapper discards and dead discards are included as potential items um, for consideration in that amendment, um, as well as the broader um, South Atlantic Council effort right now looking at improving recreational data collection and potential um, recreational reporting um, for not only the red snapper fishery, but um, all fisheries managed by the South Atlantic Council. So any recommendations that come out of that work group will most likely be incorporated in um, this red snapper amendment. Moving on to other business, um, the council accepted um, public comments on um, 
measures to end over fishing and rebuild red porgy. Red porgy has been over fish now for close to two decades. Um, it's currently managed under a rebuilding plan and that species is not meeting their rebuilding targets. Um, so the council initiated uh, Amendment 50, the Snapper River Fishery Management Plan, a couple meetings ago um, to further reduce harvest of red porgy in an effort to uh, rebuild that stock. Um, some of the actions considered in this amendment include um, modifying the commercial trip limits during the split season, um, so potentially reducing season one uh, trip limits from 60 to 15 fish and season two from 120 to 15 fish per trip, um, as well as modifying recreational bag limit. Um, it's currently at three fish per person and um, dropping that down to one fish per person and considering a two month season uh, for red porgy. There was also discussion on um, gag grouper. The council received an update on the most recent gag grouper stock assessment. That stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. Um, but uh, projections from the stock assessment indicated that that stock can be rebuilt in less than 10 years if F is set to zero. Uh, which effectively means a, um, a no harvest uh, for gag grouper. This uh, created a lot of consternation among council members um, because gag grouper, um, at least to the commercial sector, is uh, the primary grouper species um, harvested in the South Atlantic. Uh, this uh, generated a considerable amount of discussion that kind of went outside gag grouper management and um, focused on management of the snapper grouper fishery in general. Um, snapper grouper fishery is a multi-species fishery. It's one complex um, and the council has committed themselves to taking a broad look at the snapper grouper fishery um, and consider measures that not only um, could rebuild species like gag grouper, red snapper, and red porgy, but um, also manage the fishery as uh, one complex. So this might include um, set seasons, um, short seasons, uh, gear restrictions, and uh, potential uh, recreational mandatory reporting. Um, the council is gonna continue to work on these and develop those actions. Um, during other business with Snapper Grouper Committee, um, the issue of blue line tilefish came up. Um, the recreational ACL for blue line tilefish has been exceeded um, just about every year since the ACL has been established, um, and in some years by five or six hundred percent. This issue was brought before the council, and the question was posed to National Marine Fisheries Service as to why um, this um, continual um, over harvest of recreational red snapper has not triggered accountability measures. Um, National Marine Fisheries Service um, responded that um, catch estimates for that sector are um, so imprecise and based off of the current accountability measures for blue line tilefish in um, the council's amendment, um, they did not feel like uh, action was warranted. Um, so all that kind of folded into, again, that broader discussion of looking at the snapper grouper fishery holistically. Um, and uh, the blue line tilefish discussion was certainly added to the list of items to be um, worked on for that uh, comprehensive snapper grouper um, action. So to end it on a good note, since that was a lot of, uh, a lot of depressing information, uh, king mackerel's doing good. There's a lot of king mackerel out there in the water. Uh, council received, uh, updated stock assessment at our last meeting, or two meetings ago, excuse me, um, spawning stock biomass of king mackerel is at an all-time high, and this is mostly driven by recent high recruitments in the last decade. Um, so the ACL has been increased uh, for king mackerel uh, considerably. Um, the council started an action to increase uh, this ACL and also uh, modify some of the management of the species, including um, increasing the bag limit from two to three fish off the coast of Florida um, because they were still at two fish while the rest of the coast was at three fish. 
looking at modifying uh, the size limits um, for king mackerel, potentially dropping it from 24 um, down to either 22 or 20 inches, um, as well as allowing uh, mutilated uh, king mackerel and Spanish mackerel to be retained um, by recreational fishermen. And this is in an effort to um, account for um, increased shark interactions, um, not only um, in the king mackerel fishery, but in the Spanish mackerel fishery and to allow regulatory allow um, retention of those fish that have been mutilated by um, sharks. And with that um, last item of business, the council um, took up was uh, election of chair and vice chair. So Mel Bell um, was reelected as chair of the council. Um, and Dr. Carolyn Belcher was elected as the new vice chair taking my spot. So with that, that concludes my report. Um, Tom Roller is also here. So this was his first council meeting, so he can certainly provide input and context as well for any questions you have. Okay, great. Good report. Any questions, comments? Wonderful. Thank right. you very much for your support. Thank you. Madam Director. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And um, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to wrap up to remind the commission that um, direct their attention to the highly migratory species memo and the other <clears throat> informational materials, including the landings reports uh, and various other memos that are in your uh, in your books. And that that wraps up my director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Director. Um, why don't we take a quick 10 minute break, 10 minutes only. On back here, let's uh, keep on going. So I want to, um, Chairman Bethel asked if you could go for lunch. That's so fine. What we'll do. And then, um, so, um, way that we're doing this is we're sharing this, uh, on WebEx. So you guys are presenting. Well, I'm, I'm not you, doing, I'm not presenting anything yeah, right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just, it's <laughs> but just so you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Tom Roller is up here. So if he has questions, you can see him up here. Um, but when you come up. Um, all you have to do is open your presentation. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with Google. Just open it. Share it. So this is screen one. These are screen two. They're the, they're the same. So um, I will come up and help with this. But if they, uh, while you're presenting, if they want to do, if, they, if you're up here, and they want to start a motion of any whatever. Mm -hmm. um, if you would, 
just you can switch over to emotions by just clicking it. Yeah. Yes. So it just pops up. Yeah, um, and it's already it's already on the screen. You just have to click on it. So if you want to get back to your presentation, you just um, hover and then click back on the black one and then we'll pop it back up. So I don't think it'll be that big of a deal for you guys. I think it'll be more
Yes, Saints, we'll go back into session. Next on our agenda is our landings overview by Brandy Salmon. Brandy? Oh, there it goes. All right, perfect. Good morning. All right, so um, I'm Brady Salmon. I'm the section chief for the license and statistics section. Um, so I also have Alan Bianchi, our trip ticket program coordinator, and Drew Cathy, our coastal angling program manager, um, waiting here in the wings to help me in case I need it. Um, so this presentation will give an overview of the 2020 commercial landings in the recreational catch in North Carolina. Um, so the data comes from two programs within the license and statistics section. Um, so these data are fishery dependent and they rely on data um, provided by the recreational fishermen and commercial seafood dealers. So here we go. So commercial landings and trip data are provided by the division's trip ticket program, um, which started in 1994. Um, so this program is a census of the commercial seafood caught by fishermen and landed at a licensed seafood dealer. So commercial data collected in North Carolina are used for statewide stock assessments and fishery management plans, um, as well as sent to regional databases that are used for our councils and commissions to develop federal assessments and management plans. So for last year in 2020, there were over 37,000 trip tickets submitted on paper and over 54,000 trip tickets submitted electronically. Um, that's a total of 92,359 total trip tickets processed by the trip ticket program. So estimates of recreational fishing catch and effort are provided by the division's coastal angling program or CAP. Um, so they collect and maintain data for a variety of different surveys. Uh, CAP interviewed just over 24,000 anglers in 2020 and sent out an additional 19,000 mail surveys. So the largest survey under CAP is the Marine Recreational Information Program, which you guys know of as MRIP. Um, so MRIP is a national program run by NOAA Fisheries Partnership. And here in North Carolina, a portion of MRIP is completed by samplers in the state that work for the division. So that portion includes the Access Point Angler Intercept Survey, or APIS, which includes in-person interviews at docks, boat ramps, piers, and aboard head boats. So MRIP also includes the For Hire Telephone Effort Survey, the Highly Migratory Species, or HMS, Catch Card Program, and the Large Pelagic Biological Sampling. So HMS catch cards and the large pelagic biological sampling really focus on bluefin tuna and billfishes, such as swordfish, marlin, sailfish, et cetera. Um, recreational data in North Carolina has been collected by MRIP or its predecessor MRFs since 1981, and DMF took over the state sampling in 1987. So since then, DMF samplers have conducted interviews and collected fishing data from more than half a million anglers. So the MRIP survey only covers coastal fishing waters, which includes our sounds, coastal rivers, and the ocean. So MRIP sampling in the upper reaches of our rivers was not adequate to develop estimates of catch for anadromous species, such as striped bass and shad. So DMF developed the Central Southern Management Area, or CSMA, creel survey to get data for these species important to North Carolina. So other surveys conducted by CAP include mail surveys, such as surveys sent out to the Coastal Recreational Fishing License holders to determine participation in gigging, cast net and seining, and shellfish and crab fisheries. 
So there are other specialty surveys that are completed as needed. So for instance, the Catch You Later app, which um, you got an update on from Drew this morning, um, is considered a specialty survey that CAP developed to assist with the Southern Flounder data gaps. So like commercial data, recreational data collected in North Carolina is used for state wide stock assessments, fishery management plans, and is sent to regional databases that are used by our councils and commissions to develop federal assessments and management plans. So let's talk about commercial and recreational data collection. Um, for the commercial side, a landing occurs when the fish are transferred from a fisherman to a licensed seafood dealer. So those landings are then reported to the trip ticket program. So the landings can be summed up for a final total of commercial landings. These landings serve as a census for the commercial harvest of species by fishermen in North Carolina. So for the recreational side, it's a little more complicated. <laughs> um, catch and effort is collected through surveys. So in person, mail and telephone. Um, in North Carolina, there are about 1 million licensed recreational anglers. Um, so because of this high level of participation, it's not possible to get all the trips reported. So the harvest and catch numbers are presented as estimates. So for each estimate, a percent standard error or PSE is also calculated to give us an idea of how good the estimate is at representing the true recreational harvest. So these methods of data collection and data analysis are analogous to how our states, um, other state agencies and federal entities conduct their fisheries research and statistical processes. So we'll be looking at commercial landings and recreational harvest over the last 10 years and showing data for the top five species in each sector. Um, so since effort is the biggest factor that drives landings and harvest, um, we'll be showing the number of trips for each species um, along with the landings to see how the trend and effort compares. So before we do that, um, I want to point out that there are lots of things that impact effort. So weather um, could mean storms or hurricanes, cold weather events or prolonged hot weather that increase water temperature and could potentially affect species distribution and the availability of the species to the fishermen. So price is another factor that has a big influence on effort as well as market demand. And so the market demand in 2020 was heavily impacted by COVID-19 as well as the ability for DMF to collect data. So stock abundance can have an effect on species availability and other factors that influence whether fishermen, both commercial and recreational, can go fishing include um, regulations and other economic factors such as the price of gas. So regardless of all these factors, effort really ultimately just depends on the number of fishermen. So statewide, here are the number of commercial fin fish trips per year versus the number of recreational fin fit and fish trips per year, and they are plotted on the same axis to show the scale of the commercial and recreational effort in fin fish trips over the last 10 years. So as you can see, commercial fin fish trips in blue are in the hundreds of thousands, while recreational fin fish trips in green are in the millions. So I just want to reiterate that this is only fin fish. Um, it does not include shellfish, crabs, or shrimp. So uh, much of the commercial effort in North Carolina came from trips catching blue crab and shrimp, whereas recreational trip counts are coming from the MRIP program, and they don't sample for shellfish, crab, or shrimp. So to make the lines comparable, um, shellfish landings were taken out of the commercial trip count, and only the trips that had reported recreational harvest are shown, since the commercial trips with landings are the only ones submitted to the trip ticket program. So in the previous slide, commercial fin fish and recreational fin fish trips were plotted on the same axis to show the scale of the commercial and the recreational effort in fin fish trips over the last 10 years. So in this figure, the commercial fin fish and recreational fin fish trips were plotted on different axes to show the overall trend in effort for each sector. So the commercial fin fish trips are in the solid blue line and represented on that left axis, while the recreational fin fish trips are in the green dotted line and represented on that right axis. So both industries fluctuated in trips over the years, but they seem to follow each other pretty closely in this time series. So the overall trend shows a decrease in both commercial and recreational trips with harvested fin fish. So here are the number of all commercial trips by month. So this represents all fishing trips, not just the ones harvesting fin fish. 
So the blue line in 2020 um, is 2020 data and the green dotted line is the average trips per month over the last five years. So 2015 to 2019. So 2020 followed a very similar pattern as the five year average. So here are the number of all recreational trips by month. So uh, whether the fish were harvested or not. So again, the blue line in 20 is 2020 and the green dotted line is the average trips per month over the last five years. So 2015 to 2019, um, there seems to be a pretty consistent dip in trips in September over the years. And that's likely due to common occurrences of inclement weather, like seasonal variability in species um, and a shift from vacationers to avid year round fish uh, anglers to uh, school starting back for children. So speaking of inclement weather, um, effort declines in the winter months for both the commercial and the recreational fisheries. Um, so that suggests that both uh, fisheries are affected in a similar way when poor weather, such as strong winds, rough seas, and colder temperatures come into play. So we'll start off with landings uh, data from the commercial fishery. So presented here are commercial landings and X vessel value for North Carolina over the last 10 years. So landings in whole pounds is the solid blue line and X vessel value, which is the estimated average paid uh, to the fisherman by the dealer uh, is in the green dotted line. So landings have been declining slightly while X vessel value has been fairly stable in recent years, um, except for the sudden decline in 2018, which was likely due to Hurricane Florence. So 2020 went down from 2019 with landings around 43 million pounds, which is a 19% decrease from 2019. So 2020 excess of values were over $77 million, which is an 11% decrease from 2019 as well. These declines are likely due to COVID-19 impacts. So this graph shows the breakdown of the commercial landings by gear with pots in the lightest blue, making up the majority of the landings, uh, which makes sense because our largest fishery is blue crab, um, followed by trawls in green and the gill nets in the dark blue. So trawl landings have fluctuated over time, likely due to shrimp availability and a steady ocean flounder fishery that occurs off the mid-Atlantic coast. So Halsane landings in orange have mostly decreased over time, uh, but have increased just slightly in 2019 and 20. Landings by hook and line in gray and pound nets in medium blue have been fairly stable over the last 10 years. So here are the top five species landed commercially based on pounds. So those were hard blue crabs, shrimp, tunas, summer flounder, and dogfishes. So the tunas include all tunas, so yellowfin, bluefin, skipjack, et cetera. Um, and the dogfishes include spiny and smooth dogfish. So as a side note, the summer flounder fishery is unique in that the fishery actually occurs mostly in the northern region of the East Coast off the states such as New York and New Jersey. So North Carolina fishermen uh, truck up north to catch the summer flounder, and then they bring them back down to North Carolina to land at a dealer. So even though the landings are a large portion of North Carolina harvest, the actual fishery itself does not occur here. So this graphic is showing uh, 2020 landings, which is the number below each species name. So for instance, there were 13.1 million pounds of hard blue crabs landed commercially last year. So this number was then compared to the five-year average from 2015 to 2019. So this is shown as a percentage as either an increase or a decrease. So as you can see for blue crabs, they had a 42% decrease. So species in green had increased landings in 2020 compared to the last five years, and then species in blue had decreased landings. So we're comparing to the five-year average to remove some of the noise in the trends just uh, so, because they can be caused by annual variability. Uh, so 2020 tuna landings were above the five-year average, but landings for all the other species in the top five were below their five-year average. So the top five commercial species by value in 2020 were shrimp, hard blue crab, eastern oysters, tunas, and summer flounder. 
So this graphic is showing 2020 X vessel value. Um, as a reminder, X vessel value is the estimated value that a fisherman receives when selling their catch to a seafood dealer. So the X vessel value is shown under the species name compared to the previous five year average. So Eastern oysters and tunas are in green and had an increase in X vessel value in 2020 when compared to the five year average while shrimp, hard blue crabs and summer flounder are in blue and they showed a decrease. So it's a, it's worth noting that the summer flounder X vessel value was 50% lower than the average and was 49% lower than the previous year's X vessel values. So uh, reports from the dealers suggested the lower X vessel values were likely due to complications with moving the product uh, during COVID-19. So as I mentioned previously, um, effort is, is the biggest driver of landings. So on each graph, you'll get to see the landings and pounds over the last 10 years and how that trend compares to the trip counts over time. So the solid blue line shows the commercial landings and pounds represented on the left axis and the green dotted line is the number of trips and is on that right axis. So this color pattern and axis orientation will stay the same as we move through the commercial landings trends by the species. So the trends in landings and effort are very similar over the last 10 years for hard blue crabs. The overall trend in hard blue crab landings and trips has shown a decline over the years shown here. So most recently in 2020, landings dropped by 41% from the previous year. So hard blue crabs continue to remain the number one species harvested in North Carolina, even though the number of trips decreased in 2020 by 7% from 2019. So landings in shrimp have been on a steady increase since 2014, but dropped greatly in 2018. Uh, there was a large increase or decrease in the number of trips in 2018 as well. So 2020 landings were only about a 1% increase from those in 2019 and the number of trips follow that same trend. So landings and effort for tunas um, show an overall increasing trend until 2018 when Hurricane Florence came through. So since then, the landings and the number of trips have increased again. So 2020 trips increased by 7% from 2019 and the landings have increased by 23%. So summer flounder landings for the last 10 years have been variable. Uh, this fishery is managed by quota. So the landings in the solid blue line follow fairly closely with the amount of quota that's allocated to North Carolina shown in the dashed purple line, um, especially from 2014 to 2018. So the low landings in 2012 and 13, uh, which were due to issues with sedimentation in Oregon Inlet that prevented the large trawl boats in this fishery to get through. So they had to land their catch in, in other states. So in these cases, North Carolina quota was just transferred to the other states to cover those landings. So Eastern oysters didn't make the top five by weight, um, but they did make the top five by value. Um, so I felt they were worth adding into the list here. Um, so Eastern oysters were typically sold in bushels rather than in pounds. So the figure uh, replaces the unit of pounds with the unit of bushels um, represented in that solid blue line. Um, so commercial Eastern oyster landings and trips follow very similar patterns over time and show variable changes from year to year. Uh, so landings and trips both dropped in 2018 due to poor water quality left over from, you guessed it, Hurricane Florence. Um, but both landings and trips remain fairly steady from 2019 to 2020 with only a half of an inc uh, half of a decrease in landings and a 10% decrease in trips. So dogfish trips and landings in pounds declined dramatically um, from 2014 through 2017, um, but they've remained fairly stable the past few years. Um, with only a few select places that process the species and a low price per pound at the market, um, effort in this fishery has declined. Uh, despite this decrease, 2020 showed an increase in landings by 26% and a slight increase in trips by 15% when compared to the previous year. So now um, we'll switch gears and look at the recreational catch and effort statistics. 
Um, so before we start looking into the data, into the slides to come, I just want to make note that the um, that all the data presented, past to present, continues to be calculated using the new fishing effort survey estimates from MRIP. Um, so this has been done so that we can compare apples to apples rather than oranges to Christmas trees. So recreational harvest is an estimate of the amount of fish kept by the fishermen. Uh, so harvest in pounds is shown by the solid blue line and harvest in numbers is shown by the dotted green line. Uh, similar to the commercial fishery, recreational harvest showed a sharp decline in 2018, um, likely due to Hurricane Florence. Um, before 2018, harvest in pounds has been steady for the past several years, while harvest in the numbers has shown an overall declining trend. So in 2020, uh, recreational fishermen harvested 19 million fish, weighing 24.9 million pounds. So 2020 harvest in numbers was 25% lower than the five-year average from 2015 to 19, and 18% lower than the previous year in 2019. So pounds harvested in 2020 was 4% lower on average than the last five years, but higher than the uh, previous year of 2019 by 5%. So in addition to the number and pounds of fish that are harvested, data are also collected from anglers using um, to determine how many fish are actually released. Uh, so the amount of harvest plus the amount of released fish uh, represents the total recreational catch. Um, so this graph really shows what proportion of the total catch is made up of releases, which are in green, and the harvest, which is in blue. So much more fish are being released rather than kept. So last year, anglers released almost three times the amount of fish that were harvested. So in 2020, anglers released more than 53.5 million fish. So this is the recreational harvest and number broken down by mode. So the modes are simply just categories that explain um, how anglers access their fishing spots. So man-made structures include piers, docks, bridges, et cetera. Um, even though artificial reefs are technically man-made structures, um, they are included in private rental and charter modes because these are the modes that you use to actually access the reefs. So based on the numbers of fish, um, the majority of the recreational harvest is actually coming from man-made structures, which is in green. So the man-made structures are then followed by private rental boats, uh, beach fishing, and then charter fishing. So recreational harvest from the charter fishery is fairly low compared to the other modes. So however, um, this pattern changes when looking at the recreational harvest by weight. So based on harvest in pounds, the trend shows that the private boat mode in light blue typically makes up the majority of the harvest per year, followed by charter, man-made, and then beach modes. So this suggests that private and charter boats are typically catching heavier fish, um, such as pelagics and other blue water fish, so HMS, uh, tuna, snapper grouper, dolphin, et cetera, um, than those at the beach or off man-made structures, such as piers. So now we'll get into the top five recreational species. Um, so this slide is set up the same way the commercial ones were, where the 2020 uh, recreational harvest in pounds is displayed below the species name. And the five-year average from 2015 to 19 is shown as the percentage of whether it's an increase in green or a decrease in blue. So the top five recreational species by weight in 2020 were spotted sea trout, yellowfin tuna, dolphin, bluefish, and Spanish mackerel. So yellowfin tuna and Spanish mackerel had increases in pounds harvested for 2020, while dolphin and bluefish showed declines. Spotted sea trout had a 119% increase in 2020 from its previous five-year average, uh, but keep in mind that 2020 harvested pounds only showed a 9% increase from the previous year. So the top five recreational species based on numbers of fish uh, were bluefish, spotted sea trout, Spanish mackerel, puffers, and spot. So the 2020 harvested numbers are shown under the species name again. Um, not only did spotted sea trout increase significantly in harvest by weight, but it also increased by 112% in the harvest by numbers. So Spanish mackerel numbers in 2020 were also higher than the five-year average, uh, while bluefish, puffers, and spot numbers were lower in 2020 compared to the average over the last five years. So 
So the top five recreational species released in numbers of fish were pinfish, obviously, uh, bluefish, spotted sea trout, Atlanta croaker, and red drum. So the number of released fish in 2020 per species is shown under that species name again. Um, red drum releases increased in 2020, while pinfish, bluefish, spotted sea trout, and Atlanta croaker releases decreased when compared to that five-year average. I think we're all happy about that for pinfish. <laughs> So now we'll look at the 10 year harvest history for all the species that made it into the top five that were recreationally harvested. Um, so just like in the commercial graphs, um, harvest in the solid blue line um, and the uh, on the left axis while effort and number of targeted trips is on the right axis and is represented by that green dotted line. Um, so in these species graphs, the number of trips is calculated by using trips that reported targeting that particular species. So this color pattern axis orientation will stay the same as we move through each uh, recreational harvest uh, trends by species. So harvest of spotted sea trout dropped drastically in 2015 due to a major cold stun, uh, but effort stayed fairly high. So here um, is a potential explanation for that drastic rise in recreational harvest of spotted sea trout for 2019. Um, so there was a major cold stun event in the early months of 2018. Um, so the fishery is closed by proclamation for over six months. Um, this proclamation was issued based on the adaptive management strategies included in the spotted sea trout FMP that the Marine Fisheries Commission adopted. Um, so the cold stun coupled with a large year class of undersized fish in the later months of 2018 resulted in a major decline of harvest and effort for this species. So because of the swift actions taken collectively by the division and the commission, spotted sea trout landings and efforts skyrocketed in 2019. So spotted sea trout continues to show a high number of recreationally targeted trips and harvested pounds in 2020. So yellowfin tuna recreational harvest and targeted trips spiked in 2016, um, followed by a sharp decline in, in both through 2019. Uh, 2020 turned things around dramatically with a 104% increase in harvested pounds and an increase of 135% for targeted trips. So dolphin harvest and trips seem to fluctuate over the years. Um, in 2020, harvest and targeted trips both declined. Uh, harvested dolphins slightly declined by 32% and trips declined by 16% from that previous year. Bluefish um, recreational harvest and effort differ slightly from each other in the beginning of this time series, um, but both have followed each other uh, very closely since 2016. Um, so both harvest and effort have shown an overall trend in decreasing harvest and targeted trips since 2017. Uh, harvest went down by 29% and the number of targeted trips also went down by 22% from that previous year. So Spanish mackerel harvest by recreational fishermen showed a nice jump in 2019 and continued to increase in 2020 from the average over the past 10 years. Um, so harvest increased by 9% from the previous year, but trips actually decreased by 14%. So over the past several years, a lot of Spanish mackerel are being caught around the inlets and close to shore. Um, this proximity to the shore has made it easier for recreational fishermen to catch the species. So puffers um, did not make the top five for a recreational harvest in pounds, um, but they did make the top five for the recreational harvest in numbers, um, which makes sense because they're basically just balloons with a bunch of air, so they don't really weigh that much. Um, even though puffers made the top five by harvested numbers, um, 2020 actually showed a decline in harvest by 51% from the previous year, and targeted trips also declined by 71%. So harvest by number and targeted trips for spot has shown an overall downward trend since 2014. Uh, in 2020, harvest by number decreased by 67% and targeted trips decreased by 42% from the previous year. Um, despite this decline in numbers and trips, um, spot still made it into the top five for being harvested in numbers recreationally. So 
So the landings and harvest that we've shown you today is only one piece of that bigger picture that determines the status of these stocks. Uh, so for biological or management related questions um, about the species presented or the questions about the stock overview, uh, you can contact the lead biologist um, for the species that you're interested in. So if you're interested in seeing other species, um, whether commercial or recreational or a different breakdown of trips, um, you can check out our annual report that we produce every year. Um, it's called the big book for a reason. <laughs> um, you can find the PDF version on our newly revamped website, um, or you can also reach out to any of our staff listed as well. And that's it. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom, I think you have Tom Roller. I think you have a question. I do. Um, thank you for your presentation, Brandy. I was wondering if you could go back to slide 22 in your presentation, uh, commercial summer flounder. Uh, you specifically mentioned that some years, uh, that our state quota was not landed in NC. Due to inlet shoaling, um, I know that's been an ongoing issue. What years specifically were you referring to there? Uh, 2012 and 13. Okay, so, but in current years, that's not an issue. We're just not catching our, what the last three years, we just haven't caught our full quota of over 3 million pounds that it is now. Uh, yeah, I think it might still be a little bit of an issue, but I don't think it has quite the impact as it has in previous years. Okay, okay. Uh, I just want clarification on that. Thank you. Sure. Right. Any other questions? Martin. How does the um, aquaculture uh, production and landings for oysters compare to the wild caught landing while harvested? Yeah, so um, it, we actually just looked at some of this data just recently. And so it looks like um, in what year? I think it's 2015. I'll let Alan speak to this. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I think it was around 2016, 17 when um, landings of oysters from leases, therefore aquaculture, started to overtake wild caught harvest. So it's been, and that's been consistent since that time. Um, I'm pretty sure it's around 2016, 17. Thanks. Other questions? Sam. Um, this is just kind of a general question. Is there anything that you maybe didn't mention in this that stood out as surprising or alarming um, as far as 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 you're, you guys look at a lot of different things? Anything that comes to mind? In terms of commercial, um, one thing that did stand out to me was that last year was the first year we had under 100,000 trips. Um, so that was something that stood out. So the programs have been going on, like Brandy mentioned, since 1994. That was the first time we had under 100,000 trip tickets and under 100,000 trips. Um, another another question. I know that um, now the Commercial Fishing Resource Fund we pay for um, the trip ticket program. Am I right in saying that? It helps fund for one of our funding. port agents. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> um, what about Emirates? I, I'm bad that I don't know this, but where does a lot of the funding for Emirates come from? Like you could take my mask off. Um, so Emrip has three primary funding sources in North Carolina. We get our base allocation from NOAA Fisheries, and so we, the minimum amount of sampling we're required to do is about six thousand intercepts a year. So we get some funding from NOAA, and then we supplement that with Kruppel funds, and then we also have a wallet bro grant. So we interview about eighteen thousand, twenty thousand people a year, so about threefold over base, and it's derived from those three funding sources. And just to supplement what you were mentioning earlier, the trip ticket program is also funded by a lot of NOAA grants as well, as well as some state appropriations and license receipts too. So it's, it's not just, you know, the commercial fishing resource fund. Good, Sam. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Great. Wonderful. Thank you for your presentation. Good work. A lot of work, a lot of, um, a lot of information. Um, we're moving a little bit ahead of schedule and trying to free up some time in the afternoon. I'd like to ask uh, Corin to come on up and do her status on 
ongoing plans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for those listening, my name is Corinne Flora. I am the fisheries management plan coordinator for the division. And today I'm giving an overview on our fisheries management plans currently under review. There is a corresponding memo in your briefing materials under fisheries management plans. So as a reminder, we currently have six plans under review. Of the ongoing plans, the commission will have action items today regarding Southern flounder, shrimp, and the North Carolina FMP for interjurisdictional fisheries. We will also be receiving an update on the progress of our striped bass FMP. Southern flounder continues to be managed under Amendment 2, which implemented short-term management measures. Amendment 3 addresses comprehensive long-term management strategies to address the overfished and overfishing status. <clears throat> At the March special meeting, the MFC made a motion with a complex reallocation as well as additional management suggestions, which required a shift in the FMP timeline. The FMP has been revised based on that March meeting as well as stakeholder input from an additional FMP advisory committee workshop that we held in August. Today, staff leads will present an overview of draft amendment three. There will be an action item at that time for the MFC to vote to send the plan for public and MFC advisory committee review. This would occur in the timeframe between December and January. Division staff have completed the full draft of the Shrimp Fisheries Management Plan Amendment 2. The goal of this plan is to manage the shrimp fishery to provide adequate resource protection, optimize long-term harvest, and minimize ecosystem impacts. In March, the FMP Advisory Committee and the division staff met for a shrimp FMP workshop. Lead staff then provided the MFC with an overview of the full draft plan and the MFC voted to send the draft plan for public and advisory committee review. In June, a 30 day public comment period was held and all standing and regional advisory committees met to review the plan. Today, staff leads will give you an overview of the recommendations from the public, the advisory committees, as well as the division. The MFC will then vote on preferred management for Amendment 2. That preferred management will go as, the, as well as the full plan to the DEQ secretary and legislative committees for review. So next, we have our North Carolina FMP for interjurisdictional fisheries. This plan is different from our other state fisheries management plans as it focuses on adopting management approved by federal councils and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. This plan avoids duplicating effort for existing finfish management appropriate for North Carolina. The plan was last updated in 2015 uh, as part of the current Amendment 2 update an issue paper is being developed to incorporate a process into the plan which addresses removing a state plan that is fully covered through management of an fmp <clears throat> uh, through councils or through the asmfc uh, on december 8th division staff will hold a fmp advisory committee workshop uh, the chairman has appointed the FinFish Standing Advisory Committee to sit in as the 
advisory committee to the division for this plan since it is policy driven. Today, lead staff will present you with the goal and objectives of the plan for your approval. Next, we have our estuarine and striped bass plan, which continues to be managed under Amendment 1. It supplements and revision until Amendment 2 is approved. This jointly developed FMP with Wildlife Resources Commission covers more than one stock. In February, the goal and objectives of Amendment 2 was approved by the Commission. The goal of this plan being to achieve self-sustaining populations that provide sustainable harvest. If biological and environmental factors prevent self-sustaining populations, the plan will consider alternative management to protect the resource while providing access to fishermen. Staff continues drafting Amendment 2, and today lead staff will give you an overview on the plan's progress, but no action is required at that time. The Stock assessment for striped mullet continues with the schedule of the striped mullet review. The 2018 assessment update with the terminal year of 2017 indicated the stock is not experiencing overfishing. However, the overfish status was unable to be determined at that time. The current stock assessment has data through 2019. A peer review workshop was held November 8th through the 10th. Gonna let that jet go by. <laughs> so um, the peer review workshop was held November 8th through the 10th. Staff are working on addressing some questions that the peer review panel had, and a second peer review workshop will be held in early 2022 to continue progression on that stock assessment. And last, we have our stock assessment for spotted sea trout, which is continuing with the schedule of the spotted sea trout FMP review. In 2014, the stock assessment indicated the stock is not overfished and not experiencing overfishing. The current assessment includes data through 20, February of 2020 to ensure that the stock assessment is reflective of recent fishing activity. The stock assessment will be completed in 2022. So I'd like to finish my presentation with where the plans stand in the overall process. The spotted sea trout and striped mullet plan are not listed yet on the process graphic um, since they are still undergoing stock assessments. As soon as those assessments are complete, they will begin the <clears throat> FMP process shown here. The FMP for interjurisdictional fisheries is ready for the goal and objectives to be considered by the MFC and approved. The striped bass leads are currently updating Amendment 2 prior to the, um, them bringing that for commission review. The southern flounder Amendment 3 is ready for the commission to vote to send for public and advisory committee review. And the shrimp amendment two is ready for commission preferred management to be selected. So I know that was a lot and I would be glad to take questions if there are any. Great report, questions. Sam. Um, uh, could you maybe pull up the shrimp FMP slide? Um, so I was just curious about the schedule of this, and I was wondering, it says, um, what, how come that the public and MFC AC review didn't receive the DMF preferred management management options instead kind of had more of, you know, as I remember the meetings, it was kind of more of a nebulous of possibilities rather than an actual distinct preferred option. So, since there were no um, statutory requirements for this plan, the division wanted to also have the ability to hear from our stakeholders, the public and the advisory committees prior to finalizing um, the division's recommendations as well. 
Um, so that is why at that time we did not have recommendations um, because we also used the input that we received to um, try to balance the decisions we were making. Um, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about based, <clears throat> based on the fact that, you know, people like to know exactly what they're kind of, how to give advice on a, on a particular issue. And when we're given kind of a lot of different options, it seems like we kind of get lost in the mud. And I had a difficulty during those, those meetings, just kind of understanding exactly what we were doing. I don't know if anyone else had any comments on that, but I, I, I would prefer, and I think it's better for the process for the public and the, the advisory committees, which are critical um, to kind of be able to weigh in, you know, distinctly on this. And that's just a comment I had on it. I know we're, we're where we are right now, but I think it's come as a surprise to a lot of people um, that we, we got such of, um, you know, this, you see in the comments last night, I think people were, were kind of, it was taken off guard. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my comments on that. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I could just comment on that a bit, um, I appreciate, uh, your comments, commissioner Romano, and we have been probably consistently inconsistent with, uh, division recommendations and when in the process, if, uh, sometimes that is not completely within division control. Uh, but as director, and we, I've talked about this with staff, we prefer to have uh, division recommendations and we would like to get in the future, get them out uh, further in front of the process and make sure people know they are draft and that they can change over time. Uh, but one thing that I, that I would say is that um, I, although our recommendations were not specifically out to the public prior to, the suite of options that are in that plan absolutely covered what any recommendations we may have come up with or what this commission may come up with because there is a broad range of things uh, for people to look at. And I don't, to, to, in, in my opinion, people shouldn't have been shocked by some of the things that were recommended just based on the, the broadness of what we did have in the plan. So, but I, I don't disagree that, you know, the public does like to see what our recommendations are early and, and often. Um, I, yeah, I understand. And I saw the options too. everything was in there. And I think that was kind of part of the problem because when you have so many things and you're talking about a specific area, you know, and you look in, in you look at a map, you know, that can easily get lost in the weeds and, and, and you know, with something as, as large as this, you know, it, it's just a, a, a little bit more of a concise, um, understanding, I think helps the public realize what they're actually going to gain or lose although all those options were in there it's just you know um it was it was difficult so but that, but i i appreciate your concern as well and um commissioner romano just to, to um to touch on that a bit um the decision documents that we have um brought forward to you this meeting um that is our effort moving forward to start those early and develop them throughout the plans so hopefully in the future, that document can help us in this situation be more transparent in that step of the process if there isn't a defined recommendation at that point. So um, that is something that Laura and I have been working on together um, to try to um, have the public be as aware as possible um, with those changing ideas. Um, so as, as we move forward, you all will start seeing those documents more frequently starting at the very beginning of the processes. Other questions or comments? All right. Corinne, thank you very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, let's see if we can get one more in here um, before lunch. Uh, Charlton, can you do the amendment two to the Estrine strike bass? All right, well, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman and Commission members. Um, my name is Charlton Godman, one of the co-leads for the Strike Bass Fishery Management Plan. I want to thank the Commission for this opportunity to provide a brief update and answer any questions about where we are in the process of developing Amendment 2 
to the North Carolina Estuarine Striped Bass uh, Fishery Management Plan. <clears throat> as Corinne mentioned, there are no action items needed, as this update is just informational. Uh, commission members, you may want to locate the striped bass decision document in your briefing materials to follow along um, during this update. So that is the, the striped bass decision document. So since your last meeting in August, the division held a public advisory committee workshop over four days from September 28th through October the 4th to review the draft plan with the striped bass FMP advisory committee. And before I go any further, I do want to thank all the members of the Striped Bass FMP Advisory Committee for taking their valuable time to provide their input on the FMP and the issue papers. Um, the AC had a lot of great discussion with each other and input for division staff during these workshops. Um, also, it was several uh, evident that several AC uh, members took time to go out to their fellow stakeholders and ask for input on the issues, uh, relayed those comments during the committee discussions on the various issues. Uh, this is exactly what we're looking for um, for our uh, out of our FMP advisory committee members to reach out to as many additional stakeholders as possible and get their opinions on the issues to provide their particular expertise in whatever area it may be. And then for that AC member to bring all that back to the larger group for discussion. So, again, uh, great job to the advisory committee members. And I think everyone involved feels the workshop went really well. Uh, based on the input we received during the workshop, division staff are working to edit the plan. So as we reviewed in May, the striped bass FMP provides an issue paper on sustainable harvest for each of the systems being managed. This includes one issue paper for the Albemarle Roanoke stock, one for the Tar Pamlico and Noose River stocks, uh, and one for the Cape Fear River stock. Uh, in addition, there's one issue paper that addresses the use of uh, hook and line as a commercial gear. And for each issue paper, you can find a short summary and a list of the current management options uh, in your decision document, and those are going to be on pages five, six, and seven. So the timeline for how the FMP is progressing is found on page two of the decision document. As mentioned earlier, division staff are currently refining the plan based on input received during the workshop. The next step in the process will occur at the commission's February 2022 meeting, where you will have the opportunity to send the draft plan out for public and MFC regional and standing advisory committees review. Today, we're given an informational update. However, this is the commission's opportunity to provide input on any additional management options for the draft plan of uh, the issue papers may not currently address. So since staff are currently editing the plan, any input from the commissioners now would ensure we maintain the, the timeline specifically for getting that out for public review at your February meeting. So and that include concludes any updates and I'll be glad to take any questions. Any questions? Pete. At least seven and about eight years into no reproduction for the Albemarle Sound stock of striped bass. We remove a mask. Um, I know that there have been harvest cutbacks, but is it biologically justifiable to maintain hook and line and commercial fisheries on the remaining spawning stock? Give, given that the reproduction has been zero for the last seven to eight years. Well, so it's been um, it's been just since uh, the last four years, really, that we've had those really, really poor recruitment years. Um, we had a couple of good year classes in uh, 15 and 16 were the most recent ones. Um, but yes, that is certainly certainly concerning. Um, we do have the benefit of unlike in the in the 90s uh, when we went through the late 80s, you know, 70s and 80s when they went through so many years of, of chronic spawning failure, um, didn't have a stock assessment then. They just based uh, the landings that they were going to move forward to try to reduce, you know, reducing from historical landings by 80 percent. But we have the benefit of a stock assessment uh, and the projections do indicate um, that this this uh, low tail of 51,000 pounds. Um, uh, should be sustainable and allow for the stock to recover. Uh, however, I mean, you know, the, the next stock assessment, and if if we don't get some good recruitment in coming years, you know, that very well may may be the situation. But but right now, uh, based on the results of the stock assessment, um, I think we feel confident that this very low level of harvest um, that we've implemented uh, will protect the the remaining spawning stock biomass, and there should be enough females in the system to produce enough eggs to have a good spawn. Um, when those environmental conditions are, are correct. We were very disappointed this year. We, we had pretty good flow um, during the spring, spring spawning season when we you know, have those eggs and larval transport, and we were certainly hoping for some um, better recruitment this year. 
we did see a, a poor recruitment again th this year as well. Um, flow is not the only the only thing that blue green algae blooms may have played a part in that. In the nursery area. I don't. I don't know. We didn't really have, you know, this last couple of years, we haven't had as bad of blue green algae blooms as we did um, in 2017, 18, 19, those years. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, you know, as well as anybody, there's a whole lot of things that have to happen. Yeah. Zooplankton and the, and the food sources that those larval fish need. Um, we do know that flow, you know, when the flow is really high, that almost always guarantees a poor spawn. Uh, but there are lots of other factors that, that have to be in the play too, and, and pointing to just one thing is, is kind of difficult. So, thank you. Yes, sir. Tom Roller. Uh, one comment and quick question. Um, the first is, you know, I fish up, up on the upper Roanoke and this past year, the fish spawned considerably farther down the river than they had in most other years previous. And I thought that was interesting. Um, you know, five, six, seven miles down from the boat ramp. Um, my question for you, Charlton, is um, in discussion with staff, I understand that the Wildlife Resources Commission perhaps asked for more allocation to the Roanoke River section. Could could you comment on that? Um, yes, sir. So that that was one of the um, suggestions or one of the additional options that Wildlife Commission. Um, staff um has uh, has proposed so um that was kind of part of the impetus for you know if, if there are any options that are not currently in that plan uh in the issue papers uh, you know now would be the time to to address them um as opposed to you know when we go out to february um currently the the quota allocation uh, for our Roanoke striped bass is uh, 50 percent commercial 50 percent recreational the recreational um, quota is then split between the, the two management areas. Um, this was put in place in the first uh, striped bass um, FMP in 1994. Um, part of that was uh, once the stock recovered um, and there were any additional increases at, at that time, the commercial sector based on historical landings had more of the quota than the recreational. So they, they put in place that time that when the stock recovered and um, abundance increased and total quota could increase that over uh, the, the increases, they would get to a 50 50 um, parity between the commercial and recreational sectors, which is which is currently where we're at. And um, during the previous uh, FMP revision um, that that did not come up the 2013 one. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question on a little bit about the, the history of that and, and where we are. No, I, I understand the history of it, but that doesn't really answer my question. Um, when the Wildlife Resources Commission asked about a reallocation, were they asking for to move some fish from the Albemarle Sound, the lower management area to the Roanoke? Were they asking it from commercial or did they not specify particularly? And did the uh, AC discuss that? Um, the AC, well, uh, let me get back to the WRC. So they, they had a couple of different options that they, that they proposed uh, from their um, management staff. Um, and both of them included um, I mean, obviously, moving moving quota from the other sectors uh, to the to the Roanoke River sector. Um, the AC uh, did not um, discuss that um, at their deliberations. We again asked asked the AC members if they would like to anything above and beyond any of the issues that we discussed, um, and it did not come up. But um, but yes, in in short, the the Wildlife Commission did make a couple of suggestions for a couple of options of um, getting additional uh, quota in the Roanoke River management area. What were those specific options that they asked for? Mm, I swear I did not bring that piece of paper with me. Um, I think it was, um, I don't know. I'd hate to say without looking at it. We, we can get that really quickly though, but I, okay. I did not I'd like to see it. Did, did, you, did you specifically present this to the advisory committee or to as, as for a debate issue or is it just in the paper or whatnot. I mean, how was it given to them to discuss? Um, it, it was um, wasn't given to them specifically to discuss it. It wasn't something that we discussed at the PDT level. Um, this was something that the uh, WRC, I guess, you know, managerial upper managerial level staff kind of um, sent to us in a in a memo. 
Um, so it, it was not discussed specifically any at all um, at the at the PDT level. It came in uh, kind of right there at the at the AC workshops. So, so you're saying the AC workshops had the ability to discuss this? Yes, sir. I mean they they could have they they could have discussed this if they wanted to or any other um, any other options for. Um, but how would they have known to discuss this? I mean, did they know it was an option? I, I called several of the AC members and asked them about this, and they said they never recall it being presented, discussed, or put forth in any any fashion. Commissioner Rolla, this is uh, Steve Poland. So the request from WRC to consider a reallocation came in after the AC meetings, um, but you know okay. certainly this is the Marine Fisheries Commission opportunity if they feel like that is a um, issue to be included and vetted in this amendment now is the opportunity to um, have that discussion among yourselves i think it has an awareness of what they are thinking is a good idea and not yeah. necessarily we need to vote on it or or take any action on it but mr chairman yes if i might add to that a little bit um so Again, to, to staff's point, this issue came up really the night, the day of the last AC workshop meeting that we had. Uh, this is a joint plan. WRC staff is sits on the plan development team, uh, and this issue did not come up through the entire development of the issues. Not that we can't bring it up now, certainly, uh, but it was at the last minute. Um, this, we have concerns, uh, and we, as a division, we would certainly not recommend looking at this issue during this amendment. Potentially when this stock recovers, uh, rebuilds, then maybe at that point if the commission, you know, wants to look at this issue, we'll certainly do it. We'll do it now uh, if the commission um, votes to, to for us to do that. But just based on the reductions in TAL that we've seen, the total allowable landings that we've recently had, the concerns about uh, increasing um, harvest on the spawning grounds and uh, the, the fishery is at parity. We just do not feel like this is a, an opportune time to do that. However, this is totally the commission's wheelhouse. And if y'all, if this body would like for us to look at this issue, um, we will do that at your direction. I don't think we're prepared to address it or do any action on it now, but I wouldn't mind knowing what they're thinking what their what their mindset is and if you've got that that you could maybe come back in the next day and a half on that i should probably be able to get to it in the next five minutes as i have it on a computer over here i just um, right. didn't get it printed off with me all right okay all right tom roller uh, um yes and i mean i agree with the chairman i agree with uh director rawls i think just more in line with the issue of transparency and cooperation with other state agencies. I just really like to see what the WRC is asking for and and and, and discuss it. So Okay, and I apologize. I had just printed out and left it on another daggone folder. On my, in my no office. problem. Uh, so recommended. I uh, recommend adding a third management option to examine um, allocation of the towel between the three existing fisheries. So they've got um, three or four options. Let's see. The first one is status quo. Uh, the second is equally divide the towel between the two management area areas by allocating 50% of the total tail to the ASMA and 50% to the RRMA, that's the Roanoke River Management Area. Um, that would require changes to a couple of rules. Um, the third option was um, equally divide the tail between the three fisheries, allocating 34% 34, 34 of the total tail to the ASMA commercial, 33% to the ASMA recreational, and 33% to the RRMA recreational. Uh, this option would require rule changes um, in a, a couple of um, rules as well. Um, and I think that the WRC said that they supported equally dividing the tail between the, the three fisheries. 
Does that answer your question, Tom? That answers my question. Thank you, Charles. Okay. okay. Mike. Mr. Chairman, uh, Charlton, given the, the invasive nature of the blue catfish in the Albemarle Sound over the past, you know, five to seven years and, and, and the robust amount of um, year classes that's, that's, that's showed up now um, from repeat spawning and, and repeat successful spawning, um, how concerned are we in, in, in the science world that the, the larval stage The larval stage is being um, predated on, larval stage striped bass are being predated on by the blue catfish population that has that has recently, um, you know, I say within the past 10 years, we'll just say that, has, has, has started to predate on them larval stage fish as they progress down that river. Um, you know, there's there's more than, than just a, a, a um, and the rationale behind my thoughts here is, you know, there's more than just the fish you can see and catch on on a regular, you know, size hook, right? You know, there there's fish that's inch long, two inches long, three inch long. They have to have food too. Um, I've heard mention from some of the survey, trawl survey out in Albemarle Sound that, you know, there's certain places they've trawled and, and come up with with a bag full of blue little teeny blue cat fish and and didn't even couldn't even pick them out. You know, just dump it right out because it's just it, they're you know so prickly, so thorny. You can't even go through. Um, estimating large numbers in in these toes. Um, so as these larval stage um, striped bass start settling out down that river and grow along, you know, I can only think to imagine that um, the predation effort by these invasive fish that have really tremendously taken off. Um, you know, they have salt every single piece of food they can coming down that, that river system. And by the time those larval stage striped bass start settling out to become, you know, fry down at the bottom of the system, you know, they have been heavily predated on. And, and I don't, I didn't, you know, I was concerned on how much discussion that has played into about the abundances. Um, I know recently the, the uh, commercial fishing resource fund met and um, we're going to put out an RFP in regards to blue catfish to try to figure out, you know, what abundance is there and what impacts they are having. Um, I'm hoping somebody will pick that RFP up and, and, and run with it so we can have a general idea. And so I was just wondering if you could, you know, um, maybe elaborate on, on some of the conversation of the invasiveness and the predatory effects of that blue catfish. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good question. Um, so they've done a lot of work with blue catfish in the Chesapeake Bay watershed because they've been there so long, specifically uh, the James uh, River, the York, the, the Rappahannock, the Potomac. Um, you know, lots of diet studies, lots of abundance studies, and I mean, just a very broad overview of their diet analysis. You know, I think the consensus is blue catfish will eat whatever food source is available what you know in in front of them i have not seen any um reports of um you know maybe small uh, seems like you're thinking about maybe young of year blue catfish that may be feeding on larval fish i've not seen of any reports of that but like i said we know blue catfish from their research and research research we do with just gut content analysis when we bring them back um from the gillnet survey you know they will eat blue crabs i've seen a picture of a couple of 18 or 20 inch rockfish in a you know, 35 inch blue catfish. Um, they certainly um, eat river herring, shad, a lot of species that uh, not only we're concerned about, but other states are concerned about. It's hard to actually get a, come up with a quantity of, you know, how that's impacting the, the stock. Um, we, we certainly know it is, but but specifically relative to your question on larval um, fish, I, I don't have any, I'm not aware of any Research has shown that that you know young of year or young blue catfish or catfish of any size are eating um, larval fish of any species that may be transporting down the down the Roanoke River with them. Uh, you know once those fish once those um by the time they get to the lower Roanoke, you know those larval fish striped bass are just kind of settling out into turning into what you more recognizable juvenile fish. Um, and certainly Roanoke, you know there's certainly blue catfish in the Roanoke River, but like I said, I'm not aware of any research that has, has 
shown, you know, has, has seen that, observed that yet. Um, one other question for you um, from me. Um, did WRC give any reason why they thought this change in allocation was appropriate? They, they would say, we would, we would like to see this considered. No, sir, there was no, there was no reason. And it was just on, in one of the, you know, commenting on the, the draft FMP in general. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, Thank you for your pre uh, oh, time roller. Just uh, kind of a statement. Um, you know, I understand the huge concern uh, regarding the blue catfish being an invasive species that is growing very rapidly in that river system. Charlton and I have had a, a lot of discussions on that fishery, and I really appreciate his help, uh, me understanding that. But I do want to raise the concern that as we expand that fishery, uh, the gill nets being used to catch blue catfish are also the same sort of gear that's used to catch shad and whatnot. And I'm, I'm concerned that we don't have a good a grasp on the potential striped bass bycatch in the blue catfish fishery. Could, could I? Yeah. Comment to the police. Um, so thank you, Commissioner Roller. Um, yes, I mean, obviously that's a, a concern for us as well. We we don't want um harb, you know, bycatch of shad or striped bass, either one when their harvest seasons are or when they're you know not available for harvest. So when the shad season, uh when the shad harvest season closes, um we do we no longer allow um set anchored overnight uh 24 hours or 12 hour soaks of large mesh gill nets. That that has that's done away with, um, especially since the flounder plan too. Uh, so what we do allow them to do with their large mesh nets is use them very similar to mullet nets. Um, they'll just, they'll basically go around and look for schools of blue catfish on their sonar and, and set on them. Um, so this works well sometimes of the year, sometimes of the year they're a little more scattered out. The trot line fishery um, as well has really picked up with several folks uh, using that. Again, that doesn't seem that there's sometimes of the year that doesn't work as well as others. Um, but they are uh, diversifying the way that they use that gear. Um, the flounder fishery, again, as soon as the flounder uh, fishery is closed, um, we do not allow any, any more overnight soaks of large mesh gill nets. So, um, and, and just specifically for that reason, I mean, that's why we're not doing that. It's because of the concern you raised up. We, we don't want um, discarded dead back edge of, of shad or striped bass or whatever when those harvest seasons are, aren't open prosecuting that blue catfish fishery. So they're, they're just using those um, large mesh nets as a strike net. So uh, any any catch of striped bass would be released alive pretty quickly, but but plus I just don't think the striped bass, they just don't seem to hang out with the blue catfish um, schools, so. Right, anything else? All right, thank you all for your reports and your Mr. information. Mr. Chairman, yes, really yes. quick, just one thing. Yeah. So is it my understanding that this commission does not want for us to explore uh, the reallocation of this fishery in this amendment? I don't, by consensus, nodding of heads, I don't think we really do. Is that correct? That is correct. We okay. do not want to explore that at thank this you. point. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, let's go to lunch. We got a full afternoon ahead of us. We will meet back here at 1.30 um, and proceed on. Uh, Laura.
Yeah, we got about three minutes. Uh, everybody be getting your seats. Okay, it's 1.30. We're all back from lunch. We'll resume with the agenda where we left off, which means we'll have Jason Rock up here to talk about the Amendment 2 of the North Carolina Fishery Management Plan for Interjurisdictional Fisheries. Take it away, Jason. Second. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my name is Jason Rock, and I'm the staff lead for the Fishery Management Plan for Interjurisdictional Fisheries. Uh, today, I'm here to present the proposed goal and objectives for the Commission to approve and to get the Commission's input on the management strategies being considered for Amendment 2. If you recall, at your May meeting, I gave the Commission an overview of the FMP, its policy aspects, and the roles of and coordination between this commission, the division, the Mid-Atlantic and South Atlantic Fishery Management Councils, and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission for managing interjurisdictional inter fisheries. Uh, so I won't be going into those details today. Not forward there. Yeah, forwarded on the computer here. There we go. So first I'll start by reviewing the timeline for plan development, present the proposed goal and objectives, and then re review the management strategy being considered in Amendment 2. And at the end, I'll be happy to discuss the goal and objectives prior to the Commission voting on the approval, as well as the management strategy under consideration. So this chart shows where we are in the FMP process. And today we are seeking commission approval of the goal and objectives. Once that is complete, the division will finish drafting amendment two ahead of the FMP AC workshop scheduled for early December. So 
So the draft goal and objectives for Amendment 2 can be found on page 2 of the decision document for the plan. The proposed goal for, uh, for Amendment 2, which did not change from the previous amendment, is to adopt FMPs consistent with North Carolina law approved by the ASMFC or councils by reference and implement corresponding fishery regulations in North Carolina to provide compliance or compatibility with approved FMPs and amendments now and in the future. So before going into the specific objectives being proposed, you should note that they're a little different compared to the previous amendment. The changes dealt with combining several of the previous objectives together to make them more focused and concise. Uh, with that said, the proposed goal will be accomplished through the following proposed objectives. And I'll paraphrase here, but the full wording is on page two of the decision document. Uh, so the first is to participate fully in all levels of the ASMFC and council processes for developing FMPs and amendments. And this is the same exact same as the last amendment. Uh, next is to adopt management measures appropriate for North Carolina coastal waters to implement FMPs for ASMFC and council managed species. And again, this is the same as the last amendment. So next is to promote education and public information to help identify the causes and nature of problems in the fish stocks managed by the ASMFC or councils. And this has a slight rewording, but retains the same intent. Uh, next is to develop and implement a management and regulatory process that provides the greatest overall benefit to the state. And again, this is a slight rewording, but still retains the, the same intent as what was in the last plan. And last is to support research on population ecology and dynamics, socioeconomic impacts, fisheries habitat, and environmental impacts for ASMFC and Council's managed species. And this objective combines four objectives from the previous amendment, but retains their intent. So here's where we streamline things a little bit. So in Amendment 2, we are considering one new management strategy to simplify management of interjurisdictional managed species. And here we are developing a process to streamline management and avoid duplicating effort at the state level for species that already have an ASMFC or council FMP, especially in cases where compliance requirements provide little room to adjust management at the state level or where management measures can already be adjusted through conservation equivalency or alternate management programs built into ASMFC FMPs. In instances uh, where we can avoid duplicating effort and simplifying management can be achieved, this management strategy will provide a process to retire an existing North Carolina species FMP. However, Management of the species will continue to occur through the North Carolina FMP for interjurisdictional fisheries and the appropriate ASMFC or Council FMP. Annual updates for a species where the North Carolina species FMP is retired will continue to be given to the Commission through the annual FMP review document as the species will still be managed under the North Carolina FMP for interjurisdictional fisheries. And the Commission will continue to advise the division and submit comments on the management of species through the ASMFC and Council processes. So the next step uh, for today's meeting are to receive input from the Commission on the proposed management strategy or other management strategies that should be considered in Amendment 2 and to have the Commission vote on approval of the proposed goal and objectives for Amendment 2. Questions or comments? Okay, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the goals and objectives, Amendment 2 of the North Carolina FMP on interjurisdictional fisheries. Arnt Posey, Commissioner Posey uh, makes the motion. Second, made by Tom Hendrickson. Any other discussion? Not. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion passes without dissension. Thank you. 
Jason, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, moving on to the amendment three of the Southern Flounder FNP. We will vote on the draft amendment three of the Southern Flounder FNP for review by the public and advisory committees. But we will first have a presentation by Mike Leffler and Ann Markwitz. Okay, Mr. Chairman, are we ready? Outstanding, thank you. Good afternoon, commission members. Um, for those of you listening and here in person, I'm Michael Leffler, the lead Southern Flounder biologist. Um, and joining me to my right is a co-lead, Ann Markwith. Today, Ann and I are here to present you the draft amendment three to the Southern Flounder FMP. We will be walking you through the draft amendment, including highlights of some of the issue papers and where we're at with the timeline of the FMP. We will finish, in, finish up by asking you to vote on sending draft amendment three out for public and MFC advisory committee review. Back in February of 2020, the MFC approved the goal and objectives for draft amendment three. The goal is to achieve a self-sustaining population. To achieve that goal, the objectives are to encourage interjurisdictional management strategies, address habitat and environmental quality that directly impact Southern flounder, monitor and manage the fishery and ecosystem impacts, promote stewardship of the resource, and promote habitat protections consistent with the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. These can also be found in the decision document and the draft FMP that was provided in your briefing materials. Amendment 3 was initiated immediately after final adoption of Amendment 2 to the Southern Founder FMP. Like Amendment 2, Amendment 3 is based on the results of the 2019 stock assessment of Southern Flounder in the South Atlantic. This assessment expanded on the prior division assessments by including information from all four South Atlantic states, including Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. While the assessment results are based on all four states comprising the biological unit stock, the draft amendment is focused on Southern Flounder in our jurisdiction, which is all waters within North Carolina. Continuing from the previous comments, this slide emphasizes the results of the stock assessment on the South Atlantic stock, which is independent of the South Southern Flounder found along the Gulf states. The results of the 2019 stock assessment indicated the Southern Flounder stock was overfished and was experiencing overfishing. It also indicated recovery is dependent on action by all states in the region. North Carolina took decisive action to end overfishing and begin rebuilding the regional stock by adopting substantial harvest reductions in 2019 and continuing to actively develop improved management measures. Because of the status of Southern Flounder and the need to implement reductions at a minimum of a 52% reduction, Amendment 2 was developed in an expedited fashion to implement reductions to begin rebuilding the stock immediately. In August of 2019, Amendment 2 was approved to reduce fishing mortality to a level to end overfishing with two years and allow the spawning stock biomass to increase between the threshold and target within 10 years. This was done by implementing a 62% reduction in total removals in 2019 and 72% reduction in total removals beginning in 2020. Amendment 2 included a more conser conservative reduction to ensure likelihood of meeting rebuilding targets. And at that time, North Carolina was the only state to implement management changes. However, South Carolina and Florida have both implemented management changes in 2021. Finally, Amendment 2 also specified the development of Amendment 3 to begin immediately to implement comprehensive long-term management measures. Seven issue papers have been developed for inclusion in draft Amendment 3. These include sustainable harvest, which was based on commercial and recre recreational allocations determined by the MFC in March of 2021. Increased recreational access, which investigates the possibility of creating a recreational fishery 
for oscillated flounder. Inlet corridors, which evaluates inlet corridors as a management tool for conservation of southern flounder and adaptive management, which develops the infrastructure that outlines direct changes to management in the southern flounder fishery. The sector allocation issue paper was presented and the MFC voted to approve sector allocations of 7030 commercial to recreational in 2021 and 2022, adjusting to 6040 in 2023 and to attain 5050 parity beginning in 2024. The slot limit issue paper investigates the utility of slot limits in the recreational southern flounder fishery and finally phasing out of large mesh gill net issue paper which provides information on eliminating large mesh gill nets from harvesting southern flounder by the end of the current ITP. This date is August of 2023. So let's take a closer look at each of these issue papers. At a March 2021 special meeting, the MFC approved a motion to adjust the allocation again to 70-30 in 2021 and 2022, 60% 60 commercial and 40% recreational allocation in 2023, and to achieve 50-50 parity in allocation beginning in 2024. This is important as this directly guides the sustainable harvest issue paper and impacts the increased recreational access issue paper as well. Sustainable harvest addresses overfishing and the overfish status, assuming continued 72% reduction. The 10-year rebuilding timeline began with Amendment 2 in 2019 and will not restart with the adoption of Amendment 3. Several assumptions and limitations provided in the background of this paper are important to take into consideration as potential management strategies or management measures for Amendment 3 are presented. Those key points include reductions applied to both the dead discards and landings for each sector, commercial and recreational, of the North Carolina Southern Flounder Fishery from the terminal year of the stock assessment, 2017. This determines total allowable landings, or TAL, and total allowable catch, or TAC values. Management measures for Amendment 3 were developed to meet rebuilding and are based on the corresponding TAL and TAC. Total dead discards will be added to the landings at the end of the season to evaluate if the TAC and determine if it was exceeded. Projections for rebuilding included the minimum size limits for both the commercial and the recreational fishery current gear requirements, and selected soak time and daytime restrictions. Any changes should be viewed with caution as they will have impact on the rebuilding schedule. Additional quantifiable and non-quantifiable management measures beyond seasonal closures will serve to improve the overall Southern Flounder stock while providing flexibility to fishermen. Under sustainable harvest, there are three multiple, there are multiple decisions, including how gears are divided, what areas are allowed for each gear combination, and finally seasons that gears and areas are open. For example, this figure shows possible decisions for both the commercial and the recreational fisheries. If we look at the commercial side, you'll see a potential to divide the commercial fishery into two gear components, pound nets and mobile gears with each of these being further divided. So pound nets can be divided into, for example, three areas, and mobile gears can be divided into two areas. And finally, both gears and area combinations can be allowed over differing seasons. So this just provides an example of our thought process as we're going through quota, allocation, gear, area, and seasons. This next issue paper is increasing recre recreational access by managing southern flounder separately from other flounder species. This issue paper investigates the utility of allowing an oscillated season outside of the fall southern flounder season. There are several considerations to account for with this issue, and those are all southern flounder harvest is accounted for, that conservation equivalencies may be required and would need to be approved by the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council and Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. This option would allow for limited access to oscillated flounder outside of the fall season where impacts, and I stress the key word there, impacts to southern flounder stock would be minimal. Education is crucial for the success of this option 
and is being addressed through the Catch You Later app, which you heard earlier today from Dr. Kathy, the Flounder ID guides that I hope you're all familiar with these days, and if approved, through expanded division outreach. Next is inlet corridors as a management tool to increase southern flounder escapement. This issue paper evaluates the utility in closing inlets to southern flounder harvest. Research indicates that southern flounder use inlets as corridors to exit our estuaries during their spawning migrations. But their time spent in the inlets is over a very short period of time. These inlets are high energy areas that are not suitable for many commercial gears, including gill nets and pound nets. However, when the conditions are right, recreational and commercial giggers and hook and line fishermen target many species within these inlets, showcasing that impacts from inlet protections may go beyond protections for southern flounder. The next issue paper is the adaptive management strategy for North Carolina southern flounder fishery. This issue paper outlines the what, the when, and how changes can be made in this fishery moving forward. These changes are based on biological reference points for rebuilding. They provide the best likelihood of success in achieving sustainability in the fishery while offering the most flexibility to the user groups. The more clearly defined the strategy for adaptive management, the fewer unintended consequences there will be and the more certainty there is for the regulated public and managers. Moving into implementing slot limits in the Southern Flounder Fishery Issue Paper, this is where information is provided discussing the utility of slot limits, specifically in this paper for the recreational fishery. Changes to sizes of fish harvested and released is expected as the stock recovers and the size structure increases in conjunction with seasonal closures that allow fish to grow prior to harvest. Changes can be seen in the figure to the left. The blue vertical bars show the percent frequency at length for 2017, and the orange bars show the percent frequency at length for 2020 for the recreational fishery. As you can see, the frequency of catches of smaller fish has decreased while larger fish catches have increased. Implementation of slot limits would not allow for increased harvest or extended seasons at this time and may add to increased dead discards in larger, more fecund fish, depending on the size of the selected slot limit. The last issue paper is the phasing out of anchored large mesh gill nets in the North Carolina Southern Flounder Fishery. This issue paper provides information on the potential impacts of elimination of gill net from harvesting southern flounder. Phasing out of large mesh gill nets would provide increased protections to protected species, limit the cost of the gill net observer program, and may reduce user conflict. It is important to note that the fishery can be sustainable with or without large mesh gill nets. So any harvest from gill nets can be absorbed by other mobile gears or pound nets. It is unknown how fishers' effort would shift both within the fishery and outside of the flounder fishery if gill nets are phased out. Throughout draft amendment three, there are several decisions that, that depend and build upon one another. The level selected for bag limits impacts the length of the season for the recreational fishery and also impacts if the increased recreational access issue paper is a viable option. However, the reduced state of the southern flounder stock limits what can be done in the short term, but adaptive management outlines the flexibility and how we can adjust all of these as the stock increases. Ultimately, there's a sweet spot for management that has the right amount of quota to maximize the bag limit while allowing increased access to the recreational fishery through oscillated flounder. The division's initial recommendations are based on available data and the requirements for rebuilding. These recommendations provide the public and the standing advisory committees with the way the division is leaning on each issue paper at that time. These recommendations are initial and are obviously subject to change. Additional details on each option are provided in the decision document 
and the draft FMP that are included in your briefing materials and at the location provided on this slide. Now, I'd like to review where we are in the FMP process for Southern Foundry. In December of 2019, a scoping period and three scoping meetings were held. In February of 2020, the Commission approved the goal and objectives of the plan. After completing the first draft of the plan, a series of workshops were held in October of 2020 and August of 2021 to further develop the FMP with the Southern Founder Advisory Committee. Guidance received during the workshop was incorporated into the issue papers and the second draft of the FMP. Today, we would like the Commission to vote on sending Draft Amendment 3 out for public and Marine Fisheries Commission Advisory Committee review and comments. If approved, the draft plan and its issue papers will be presented to the standing and regional ACs in January of 2022. Public comment will be taken at the AC meetings, and the public can also submit written comments during the 30-day period leading up to, during, and after the AC meetings. Input received during the public comment period and AC review will be provided to the MFC in February of 2022. And this will assist the commission in selecting its preferred management options at that time. Again, the action item we're asking for today is a vote on sending draft amendment three out for public and standing MFC advisory committee review. So at this time, Ann and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. And for those of you listening online or viewing online, if you have any additional questions or wish to reach out to Ann or I, either of the leads for this FMP, our email addresses and contact information are provided on the screen. Thank you. Discussions. Sir? Pete. My, thank you. It is my opinion that we are still behind the eight ball as far as a rebuilding schedule to make it to 2028 as required by law. <clears throat> the, uh, the Marine Fisheries Commission voted on and passed a 62% reduction for 2019 and a 72% reduction for 2020, and we got neither. <clears throat> I want to read this statement for the record. The draft Southern Flounder Management Plan should have initiated Southern Flounder harvest reductions in 2019, which according to DMF would have led to stock rebuilding by 2028. Instead, harvest reductions have been delayed and significant sources of mortality have been omitted, rendering the FMP inaccurate and obsolete. The only possibility of meeting the 2028 stock rebuilding goal is for DMF to totally revise the FMP to include harvest restrictions up to and including a harvest moratorium for all sectors if necessary. <clears throat> and I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Chairman. Okay, would you phrase your motion? So yes. yes, I make a motion that the draft Southern Flounder Management Plan not be sent out for public review, but that DMF be directed to revise the FMP to provide a current schedule of harvest restrictions and accounting for all sources of fishing mortality that will achieve stock rebuilding by 2028. Let's get a motion up here first. <clears throat> hey, Pete, is that your motion? That is my motion. That is your motion. Okay. Y'all see the motion in front of us. Is there a second to this motion? Is there a second to this motion? Okay. 
If there is no second to this motion, motion fails or lack a second. Okay, very well. All right. Okay, uh, Tom Rowley, you got a, your hand up. Um, yes, Chairman. Um, I'd like to have some discussion, but if it's an opportune time, I would make a motion that we send out this draft plan for uh, for public comment. Okay, there is a motion that we send out the draft plan for public review. Is there a second to that motion? Okay, second by uh, Commissioner McNeil. A discussion. May I? Uh, yeah, go go ahead now. Go ahead. Um, you know, to address um, Commissioner Carnegie's emotion, uh, motion, I, I am concerned to to his degree regarding everything he stated in terms of this potentially not meeting our rebuilding timeline. But I am also concerned that if we continue to delay this, given the restrictions based upon us by Amendment Two, that we could see more you know, overages this next season. So that was why I, you know, didn't didn't discuss that further. But um, I think that this plan as presented by the division, and I hope we can have some more input and discussion on this today. It includes a lot of options discussed by this commission and, and, and most of the main ones. And, I, and, I, and I'm looking forward to hearing the advisory committee's comments on it, as well as reading public comment. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's all encompassing and there's a lot there and I'm sure we won't select all of it. So. Okay. Mr. Romano. Um, this is just a general question about the, um, about the slot. Um, I was, I was pretty, I was, I've been in favor of this slot. A lot of people in this commission and we've talked about it a lot. And, um, I'm just kind of curious trying to understand this. If it, what you're saying is. If we don't, if we implemented a slot, then there would be too many dead discards of the larger fish. Um, but if we don't institute a slot, those larger fish will be able to be captured. So I, I, I kind of, I'm having a hard time understanding why we wouldn't get um, the reductions we are looking for because we are looking to preserve the larger fish. And so I, I, I understand that it's difficult to, to. Um, Kind of understand what that reduction would be, but um, yeah, I just want to know kind of your thinking with that. Sure, um, I think it's a two prong um, process there, and the the one side of the process which I don't think any of us want to lose sight of is the volume of reductions that have occurred. Right, 2019, we we're in the low 30 percent reduction, so that means 30 percent of the biomass when compared to 2017 hopefully escaped out of the estuary to reproduce. In 2020, we were at 52% reduction when compared to 2017. So that's a very, very large volume of fish, hopefully, that escaped the estuary to reproduce, right? So that's number one. Number two is there's a difference between harvest and waste, right? If we allow fishermen to harvest larger females today, they can take those fish and they can utilize that fish, right? Keep it in mind, we've got this big volume of fish that are escaping, even with harvest on those large females. And a lot of those fish are large females escaping the estuary. Um, whereas if we did a slot limit with a larger maximum size, say 22 or 23 inches, then 10%, 9% on average throughout the year are gonna be dead discards and that's waste. Right? So those are fish that are harvested, released, and succumb. Right? And so it's a trade off of what's the benefit. Right? And the issue with southern flounder is, unlike some other species, we don't have a large inventory of knowledge on fecundity relationships and size. We don't have a expanded age structure. We don't have an expanded size structure. Right? So right now we can't quantify to tell you the benefit of protecting a 23 or 24 or 25 inch southern flounder today, right? Yes, convention is the larger the fish, the more fecund. But what we see in the southern flounder fishery is a fishery that operates on young fish, right? Yes, a lot of those fish are mature, 
and some of those are immature. But what we see, just like we saw in 2020 and 2021, is a higher likelihood of encountering a larger fish. But what we're not seeing are an expanded age structure of those larger fish, right? So if you capture a fish that's 18 inches and it's a two-year-old fish, or you capture a 23-inch southern flounder, most likely right now it's still a two-year-old fish. So is there bang for your buck for that? And that's kind of what our thought process has been as we mold over these slot limit issues. And with that in mind, we don't feel that slot limits are a bad idea. It's not that at all. We absolutely support the utility of slot limits um, in the southern flounder fishery when some of these criteria are met expanded age structure, expanded size structure, and all that. And we got to keep in mind with the reduction in the fishery, we're getting the escapement. So those big fish are still leaving the system in greater numbers than they probably have in a long, long time. Mr. Posey. Do you think there might be any interaction though, <clears throat> if we reduce the catch to one fish per day, then isn't there going to be a tendency to always go for that larger fish? You only have one, which means that the combination of those measures may lead to more emphasis on that one fish. I think back in my days of hunting deer, we were allowed up in Maryland to have one, um, one deer. And so you wait, you let little pronghorn goes by, that little four point goes by, you wait for the big one until the season ends. Yeah, absolutely. I have no doubt that that's going to occur. In fact, I've had people tell me. That's exactly what's going to occur. Um, but the other side of that story, which is where we draw a lot of concern with, with drop in a bag limit, is trying to protect the growth of the stock, right? So if you look at the recreational data, and we've talked about this in the past, where the average angler in North Carolina was, was keeping one fish per trip, right? And anybody who's been on the water the last year, year and a half for Southern Fauna has seen that change. 2020 data suggested we were up to a fish and a half almost per trip. So we're already seeing that trend of success increasing, right? And so that's where our concern is for the recovery of the stock, is we've got to have a way to limit those removals. And we can limit those removals by saying, now you can only catch one fish. And what that does is it removes the potential as the stock rebuilds of capturing two or three or four fish per trip and negating everything we're trying to recover. If I could do a quick follow up. I wasn't thinking of so much of getting rid of the one fish as if you have the one fish, does that then make a slot limit preferable? Um, I don't know if it makes it preferable. And that's one thing that I'm, I'm excited to hear from public comment, right? On what the public's thoughts are on that. But if you really dig into the slot limit issue, there are some impacts that go beyond just a one fish, right? It's the gig industry and the recreational giggers identify the size of a Southern flounder before they gig it. Mortality on gigs we estimate is hundred percent. Certainly some, you know, survive, um, but that's a concern, right? So there's other issues associated with a slot limit other than just protecting these large fecund females. Commissioner Roller. Um, yeah, thank you, Mike. You actually touched on a little bit what I was going to ask about regarding the slot in the sense that that's going to also have an impact on the gig fishery as well. But I understand Commissioner Posey's point in terms of having that, having that this may lead to more recreational fishermen trying to target those bigger fish. I think that's fair and I think that's going to happen, but that's also to the benefit of reducing one fish that in in this circumstance of rebuilding this population, and 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 Mr. Lockwood, please comment on this when I'm done. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that reducing the bag limit will actually reduce effort to some degree because it, it, we've really created a bit of a derby fishery, particularly as high a quality of the fit. I mean, the fishing has been for flounder the last couple of years probably the best it's been in a long time. Part of that is you know we've given the recreational fishing world. The first crack at these fish for the first time ever, uh, first time in modern history anyway. So we've been able to catch more of them, and that's been a big concern of mine. 
But on the same note, if we did go to a recreationally only slot, I would also be concerned that we would just be preserving some of those larger fish to be caught in pounds and gill nets later in the fall when the season opens. And if you could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, Commissioner Roller, I think you're 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 spot on on those those comments. And you know, one thing that we can't predict is is angler behavior, right? We certainly saw a shift in 2021. And the uh, issue is when fish are around and they're abundant and they're large, people are going to fish. Nobody wants to go fishing if they're not catching anything, right? And we've been fortunate enough through management measures that y'all have implemented, we had a great fishery this year. And we're on that, that increase in abundance direction. I mean, that's what we want to see. The painful part of it is, is if y'all remember, we're at about, according to the stock assessment, 1,000 metric tons for a spawning stock biomass. We're trying to get to 5,000 metric tons. That's five times higher than we were in 2017. So there's gonna be major growing pains and major access to the Southern flounder stock as it begins to rebuild because we're looking at five times more fish out there than what we really have. So everybody's gonna encounter more and more and more. So how do we constrain that and allow the stock to rebuild? That's the difficult question. Um, and, and going back to Tom, question about the slot limit and what it's going to do on the on the commercial side you know that certainly is an issue if a recreational angler is out there and he catches a 24 inch southern flounder and we've got a 22 inch size for a maximum size limit and they throw that fish back what does that do is the gill netter that's coming six weeks later going to catch it is the pound netter that has his net set going to catch that fish six weeks later the likelihood of that occurring is probably pretty high because that's when those fish are actively moving you know, in the fall, they're likely to get caught if they're released by the recreational fishery. Hey, Commissioner Romano. Um, so was there any thought to give for, for a slot for both commercial and recreational? There was a lot of thought yeah. given to both commercial and recreational. And, you know, as we, as we move through this issue paper and our discussion with our plan development team and with our managers, there's a lot of question marks on the commercial side relative to a slot limit. And that is, what is the impacts to the gears in the commercial fishery to accommodate a slot limit, right? You certainly wouldn't want to increase bycatch in a large mesh gillnet fishery because you've implemented a slot limit. It's not, it's selective to a point, but you're gonna encounter fish above that slot limit at a higher mortality rate. Right, you've got differing gears and differing targets of size of fish, right? And that changes across the state. Our fall pound net fishery, they typically see some of the biggest fish, right? And so we had a lot of comments from that part of the industry that said, you know, we see a lot of those big fish. Is the slot limit really appropriate for this gear? Knowing that that gear can probably call those larger fish much easier than say the gillnet fishery. And then of course, like we mentioned earlier, the gig fishery, you know, do we have enough avid diggers that I can identify a Southern flounder by size underwater at night with lights, right? Again, most likely hundred percent mortality. So if you had a, a small range for a slot limit, your likelihood of dead discards in that gig fishery is going to increase both on the recreational and the commercial side. Right. And I, I guess I understand that. I mean, you know, to, to your point of, uh, you know, whether they can identify, I mean, already have to do that for a small fish. And I, I, I guess when I hear 23 or 24 inch fish, and I could see maybe that wouldn't cause the reduction that you would want. But even a smaller size, I just feel like there may be a sweet spot there. And the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is because, you know, um, my experience from talking to people during these seasons, it's the seasons that get to people. It's the, it, and that's what creates the conflict. That's what gets on the news. That's what gets people uh, up in arms. So if there is any way, I mean, we should put the resources into figuring out how we can really avoid that if possible. And it, it and you know, I don't believe it's impossible. It seems to me that, you know, you can look at the, the spread of these fish and there's got to be a sweet number there um, that we could actually do something. And, you know, I, I can kind of see where Martin's coming from with, you know, people are, they're going to be um, discarding in order to get that big fish. And I, I, that's the one thing I've, I've had a hard time understanding because I know we don't know the fecundity of the large females. 
but you know we're tagging large fish so we got an understanding that we we know that there's there's got to be at least an inkling that there may be the bigger the fish the more the spawn if we if if that were the case then we wouldn't be you know we wouldn't be tracking those specifically um so you know i just look for low hanging fruit i think that uh you know, people, people are recreational fishermen are going to be fishing year round and having discards regardless. Um, you know, I would just like to see them um, discard what we're trying to, to, you know, basically stay away from the things that we're really not trying to catch. Now, I feel like that's, I just know talking to people, that's something that I, I get kind of the most headway in, in terms of explaining to them, you know, that based on, you know, what reductions we have to make, we have to make action you know, the, the seasons they start, you know, we get into the weeds with, but a slot seems like something that everybody can kind of understand. So, you know, I, I just want to pursue this as much as we possibly can. You know, I don't know what resources we need to kind of get a better understanding, but I'd be in favor of, of really researching this and, and putting as much effort because it is an important fishery and, you know, I, we all know that. So, thank you. Mr. Cross. Mike, I got a couple of things. The first thing, and I, I agree with Tom, when you go to one fish, you would think that you'll see reduced effort, but that has a double-edged sword because, I, you know, these people, including me, they want to catch fish every day if they can go fishing. And then when you reduce it down to a season, it's a hard pill to swallow. So, you know, I look at a mechanism of some kind to where you can give these people enough fish that they want that their fishing trip is valid to go and you and i've talked about it before you know what i'm hitting with you so uh you know when it boils down to it what you're trying to do is extrapolate enough catches to where you're meeting the target and not going over it and you know we may and i still believe we need to look at a possibility of some kind of system to where you more or less have to have some kind of uh, tagging system where you give the individuals X number of tags that they can catch them over, over the period of the season. And that's it. That allows them to make one or two trips. If the, you know, they're not going down there back and forth every day, they deem it a viable trip that they can enjoy themselves and stuff like that. Now, how long a, how long a season that would be or not be, and would a lottery be involved? I don't know, but, I keep looking at a way to have a rational way that the recreational fishermen can get more than one fish a day traveling back and forth and stuff like that. So I think that's something that still needs to be looked at. Um, the second part of this, uh, and I think you probably got the data in front of him referring to what uh, Commissioner Cornegie was saying earlier. Uh, the last two years that we've had a target in place for the recreational and for the uh, commercial side, what percentage have we been over on the commercial side each year with the trip ticket system that we currently have in place? We had, what well, I mean, the last two years, I know it was over, but it wasn't over much. I mean, it was a small percentage comparatively. Do you, do you have that data? I don't have it right in front of me, but I'm, I remember it fairly closely in, in 2020, the commercial industry, was at about a 62% reduction. And then in 2019, I believe the commercial industry was in the 30s percent reductions. Mm -hmm. um, in both of those years, the recreational fishery was 16, 17% reduction. Right, but I, I was looking at what we went over. Oh, well, if- do you, do you know what percentage we went over on our target? Maybe she's got that there and just- Yeah, Ann's looking at it now. It was, it was um, certainly more significant in 2019, I believe we're at. 900,000 pounds in 2020, and we were looking at about 500,000 pounds. So we were almost over 80% in 2020, the, and it was greater than that in 2019. On the commercial side? On the commercial side, no, sir. We were and less. That's what than I'm that. asking. On the, uh, you've got the numbers. You should have what we were over on the commercial each year. So for the commercial fishery, we were over 272,000 pounds. What percentage was that? Um, that's right at about 100%. About, mm, let's see here, about 33%. Okay, um, 2020, 
we were over 91,000 pounds. So of a uh, 390,000 pound quota. So that's about 25%. Now what right. were the recreational? Recreational. For those two years. Yep, so 2019, we were over 254,000 pounds. We were allowed 207,000, so over 100%. And then we were over 303,000 pounds in 2020 um, of an allowable landings of 152,000. So that's so over 200%. 200%. Right. And so the take home message there was overall reduction combined for both user groups. Right. In 2019, we we're at 35% reduction. And in 2020, we were at a 52% reduction. And keep in mind, the stock assessment indicated for um, the first goal, which is two years to end over fishing, the minimum was a 31% reduction. So we met that in both 2019 and 2020. Right. Well, my, my point in this is with the MREP data being so delayed, and it's not y'all's fault, I understand mm -hmm. that, with MREP data being so delayed that the recreational fishery is the one that's overfished it so far, and it's not its not necessarily their fault because you couldn't close it down or couldn't get the data into it correctly, but that's what's skewing the data from even having further reductions was a lot to do with the MREP because we don't know until this year, based off of last year's data, when you can't set it at two weeks, we didn't really have a plan to go forward with it so far as the time lapse involved. So, I mean, this additional data program that we're coming up with, you know, I hope you incorporate that to the future readings, you know, and because I mean, this MREP thing with the recreational side, while I know it's a useful tool, it's causing us angst to try to be able to do an appropriate closure on the recreational side, and it's causing them angst because I don't. They, they, I'm sure they don't want to go over that far, but they are. So, and our numbers are getting skewed overall from that side of the equation. Thank you. Commissioner Henderson. Um, on the slot limit, I appreciate the conversation. I had to stir some of that up a while ago. And, uh, and as I listen to it now, it's like, well, you can take a simple question and convoluted pretty pretty uh, badly here um the bottom what uh, what we have in the uh, draft is an abomination of a slot limit relative to the original concept the original concept of my request was to figure out when we could potentially put a slot limit of say a 14 to 16 inch fish 14 17 to allow for an additional uh, fish in the bag limit. Uh, you know, I've read the reports from the CCA uh, document recently said, if you do one, you got to do it one way versus the other. Well, the commercial is regulated by poundage. You know, recreational is monitored by poundage, but regulated by bag limit. And the only way we can increase a bag limit is get to the point where the science, the data that apparently we don't have yet, and I've, we've had a long conversation about it. So I think the whole slot limit thing personally is premature because what it is now is just penal. There's no upside. Uh, and the, when it can become an advantage is if it turns out that we can increase a bag limit by having a 14 inch fish for the recreational hook and line fishery period, then that creates a potential upside that can help alleviate some of the pressures that we're seeing with the fishing trips from the recreational anglers. Until that point, I want to caution us all to not get so damn complicated on it that we get off on a tangent, turn it into something that that is is unnecessarily complicated without any any real benefit. I also look at so that's my comment on slot limit. Um, because by the way, if it's not something that the recreational anglers want, let's stop talking about it. Because that's that the only reason to have it on the table was to potentially get to a point where there could be an incentive that would include an additional fish in a bag limit for recreational hook and line anglers. If that's not something that's desired or wanted, then we don't need to waste time talking about it. As to our overall situation, I work in, back to your motion, which I, there's parts of that that I think there's a lot of validity there a lot of conversation early on that you know we probably ought to look hard at just a full moratorium that's the only way we could actually 
know that we had full stock re being rebounding whether without, without everybody pointing fingers saying well you took too much or you took too much or y'all took too much old farmer's adage of, don't cut the puppy's tail off in an inch at a time because every time you chop it it hurts the same to the dog and we're doing that now um, we need to get the real data on where we're make sure we're getting somewhere to make sure that each of these chops is worth the pain so i would encourage us obviously this next year we'll see what the data uh, comes back at but on our um, you know we're making progress but the question is are we making enough progress to get there and and um so back Pete, to your point there I'm, i mean we're, we're nowhere near out of the woods yet and and without having anything other than a pure wild guess on the amount of actual take with your data showing a 200 percent overage on the recreational landings um you know, it means we're putting a lot more pressure out there than we said we would. There was an incredible fishery this year, and there was an incredible derby fishery this year. And, you know, that's, I'm, I'm really not sure that's the best way to manage it. I'll defer to folks who are smarter than me about it, but it, it just doesn't, it feels like we've gotten into a little trap here that, that uh, I'm not sure what, that it's going to get us out to where we need to be. I hope so. Okay. Commissioner Roller. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try to find my last thought. There's been a lot said there in the last few minutes, um, much of which I agree with. You know, you know, when we talk about, you know, a slot in terms of people trying to catch a bigger fish, we could make that argument just about any harvested fish, whether it's a, um, a red drum and even in the slot, people throwing back a 20 inch fish try to catch that 26 and a half inch fish. Um, so I, I think that in two degree is angler nature. But to the comments made by Commissioner Cross and whatnot about making this fishery worthwhile for people who wanna go out and fish for them, I think we do that by rebuilding this fishery, plain and simple. I mean, this fishery has been abused and mismanaged for three, four decades. It was mostly a commercial problem and has been for a long time. And we've made great strides in improving that. Um, and I, I think that the last couple of years have really shown how far we have come to increasing escapement and letting more of these fish get out. And yes, we are not where we need to be. Um, but I am hopeful that what is included in this, as painful as it's going to be, short season, one fish per person recreational, big cuts to the commercial sector. I am very, very hopeful that this is going to put us on the right track. Okay. Commissioner yeah. Blanton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just listen to the conversation a little bit. I, I'm just curious to, to know when, when we can expect an update to the stock assessment or an, another bit of, you know, timing for another benchmark so that we can seemingly see what progress we have made or not made. Um, so that's question number one, and I'll pause right there just to kind of hear your thoughts. Yeah, so I'll make my thoughts brief on this topic. We've had a lot of discussion about this internally. Um, if you all recall, we also have discussed with our multi-state work group so representatives from South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia, and North Carolina. And the reason we've done that is because it takes all four to make this not next stock assessment a reality, right? And a lot of the conversation has revolved around what do we need to do this next stock assessment? And there's a couple of things that have come up. And the first conversation is always, well, how long has management been implemented since the last stock assessment? And we started all that, as you, if you recall, in 2019, right? So one would argue you wait about four to five years after you implement management measures before you do the next stock assessment. You see what impact those management measure changes have had on the stock. Unfortunately, South Carolina and Florida just implemented changes in 2021. So that's the question. Well, when does that time frame start? Does it start from when we implemented changes or them? We don't want to jump the gun on that because we want to see what Florida and South Carolina changes are having on that stock. 
The other side of that story is we've got some research that's going on right now. We've got our satellite tagging project that's been going on, and we want to see the results of that and incorporate the results from that in the stock assessment. And those aren't ready yet. Um, the legislature in South Carolina had said we want to do stocking in South Carolina. They directed their agency to start deploying stock fish in six years. So they just now implemented this year a genetic study to evaluate can they even stock fish and not have impacts, unintentional consequences to the overall stock, right? And so the, the, the multi-state group looks at that and says, well, we kind of need to know those answers before we can, you know, respond in kind with the stock assessment. So I think we're probably four to five years down the road um, before we have a review of this, this stock assessment. And Director Rawls, if you want to add anything to that, feel free. No, I really don't, Mike, but did have we ever said, and maybe we don't know this, but I was just curious as you were talking about this, does the states to our south, have they said what what their management actions have been, what reductions they're getting from their management actions? No, it's too early t for them to determine reductions because they were just implemented. Um, however, uh, the state of South Carolina indicated that they were hoping for greater than a 50% reduction. 52% is what they were shooting for. That was the minimum from the stock assessment with their um, changes going from a 15-inch um, minimum size limit to a 16-inch minimum size limit and from a 10-fish recreational bag limit to a 5-fish recreational bag limit. They were hoping for a 52% reduction. Anything else, Mike? Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Uh, you know, um, when we first started this, we we talked about, you know, what what it was going to take to to get these fish back to par the quickest. Um, and moratorium was mentioned. And 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 while I'm sympathetic, of somewhat of Pete's um, concerns, you know, we had that option to start there at ground zero stop harvest altogether between sectors and get like two really good chances at year classes to you know be maximized so i think we really missed that bus um and we would be backpedaling somewhat you know and i don't think the indications of growth you know that we're having justify moving backwards in the process and going to a moratorium type situation um Logically, I don't think we're there yet. Um, my biggest concern is, you know, fingers have been pointed at the commercial. Sure, in North Carolina, we've we've caught the most fish, but coastwide, you know, um, again, I want to recreational has had the biggest amount of takes overall coastwide. Um, you know, and looking at the overages <clears throat> in the recreational sector, I think. You know, that's the biggest part of needing to be addressed. And so while um, slot limits seem to be, you know, an, a viable option and, and you know, I, I can't somehow see that turning some fish loose versus retaining all large fish, you know, that's 100% retention versus you know, if you're slotting fish and you're and you're returning fish, there's going to be some survival. So it's hard for me. Um, in my mind to, to think that the math wouldn't add up to be better for a slot and, I, and I'm not opposed to a slot at all. You know, I, I think it's a great idea, especially as a recreational management tool. Um, and I think we've heard all the reasons why it's difficult to implement that. Um, with the different types of gears that pursue commercially um, flounders. So um, I definitely don't think we should leave that option off the table or, you know, continue to not con or to not consider it further. And I definitely think it needs to be in the draft. Um, so anyway, that's my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hendricks and then Commissioner McNeil. And, and by the way, Mike, so I, and I agree the slot, obviously I've been been saying slot every time I could. I, I just I understand from from the team that we cannot put a 14 inch fish in the slot today because we don't have the data that I'm 
been asking for two years and we don't have the data. So I'm hoping to be around when we do have the data so that there is some upside to a slot rather than just penal for the slot. Um, that said, I am concerned, and I just want to put this on the record. This was adopted under our legislative mandate with a 10 year time window. And I'm appreciative of what the other states are doing, and I am completely out of the loop on what it takes for us to figure out our stock assessment for North Carolina. But we can't wait till year six to con then conduct a, a one or two year um, stock assessment to then be in year seven or eight of a 10 year plan and figure out we're missing the boat. So I, I would ask us to make sure we have for our statutory directives, a timeline that fits and and not asking for it now, but when we come back, I would like to know when, how do we, what are our options for knowing that we're doing what the, uh, what the general statutes require of us? And they don't require Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, they require us. So I would, and obviously we'll have to have a stock assessment for us in time to be able to create an additional remedy should one be needed. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil. Um, just a couple things here. Um, you know, my concern is with, you know, the overages that the rec industry has had, and it's because we've shortened the season down and has created the derby fishery. Uh, it's kind of hard to sit here and make a decision and not have the data from this this season and how do we get better this year? Do we stay about as bad as we were previous year? <laughs> um, you know, I, so we got to do something with the season next year to, to, to kind of get rid of that derby season. I don't know if it's spreading out the time, like, well, what was it? it was four fish per day for two weeks last year. What if it's four fish a month per person all year? I don't know if you spread it out, maybe there's not a derby. Um, just something to try to think about to try to just decrease the derby fishery if we're still over uh, the total but allowable tonnage like we were the previous couple of years. I guess we'll know that answer in a couple of months when the survey comes out. Uh, so I look forward to seeing that. Um, and then I, I think you uh, answered it a few minutes ago, but I'm concerned with the same thing that Pete mentioned earlier. Uh, did you say that we did reach our, our minimum thresholds for uh, rebuilding the stock in 10 years? Again, the, the minimum for rebuilding in 10 years was a 52% reduction. For Two, both sectors combined. combined. 2019, we met um, a 35%, so we were off on that one. Okay. However, that exceeded the minimum for ending overfishing in two years. And then in 2022, or sorry, 2020, we were at 52%, so we were spot on um, meeting that reduction for 2020 so we're for close. the minimum. So how off is that timeline then? It's not far off, does it sound like? No, I don't think it'll be far off. And remember the actions moving forward um, for Amendment 3, based on what Amendment 2 did, was a 72% reduction moving forward from 2020. So that 72% is 20% greater than the minimum to rebuild that stock. Should make up for that first year. That was the intent when y'all passed uh, Amendment 2. That's why you went conservative with a 62% reduction first year and 72% moving forward to increase the likelihood of successfully meeting that 10-year time frame. Any other discussions? All right, ju just I'll just throw in something before we go to the vote. But uh, I like the concept of slots, and I think it can should be something we apply or try to apply to all species going forward. I think it's a great concept. So, with well, there's no other discussion, we will call. I'll call for a vote and a roll call vote. Laura, will you conduct that, please? Does everybody understand the motion? Right here on. Okay. Commissioner Cross. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton. Aye. Uh. Thank you. 
Commissioner Hendrickson. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Cornegi. Abstain. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Posey. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Romano. Aye. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle. Aye. Thank you. Eight four in favor, one abstention. Motion passes. Thank y'all for your work on this. Okay, we're moving forward with the agenda. Amendment two to the shrimp FMP. Chris Stewart, Jason Rock, Dan Zampf. Mr. Chairman, yes, before they get going, I, I do have a few comments that I'd like to make on shrimp. Please. I'd like to just take a few minutes to say a couple of things about shrimp. Just so we all are kind of knowing where we started and where we are today. We've heard some of this, but I'm going to repeat some of it anyhow. So back in 2018, this division was tasked by this body to draft Amendment 2 two years prior to when that FMP was up for review with the focus on management to further reduce bycatch and provide additional protections for critical habitat. We started uh, interacting with the public on FMP development with the scoping period in January of 2020 to get public input on these issues that are in this plan. We assembled the Fishery Management Plan Advisory Committee, and in March of 2021, we held the advisory committee workshops with that group scheduled over the course of a couple of weeks. And these meetings were open to the public. This commission approved this plan to go out for public comment and uh, MFC advisory committee review in May of 2021. Uh, in the summer, this FMP draft went to this commission's five standing and regional advisory committees, providing opportunity for public comment at each meeting and including a 30 day public comment period. The document that the division has prepared represents a tremendous amount of work by the staff and our AC advisory committee. It is grounded in the best available data. It is reviewed by the public and contains a variety of management options for the commission to choose from to adequately address the goals and objectives of this fishery management plan. Because there is no statutorily required target for these management decisions, the, the division did decide uh, not to make recommendations uh, until public comment was gathered, which is this is later in the process. We have completed that process and we have provided you with that outcome. DMF's recommendations were, as always, based on the best, best available science and data and on a statutorily responsibility to manage this fishery for the greatest overall benefit to the state with respect to food production, recreational opportunities, and the protection of marine ecosystems, word and taken directly from the law. There is a difficult but legally required balance to strike here between access to the resource and protection of the largest estuarine system of any single Atlantic Coast state and those associated resources. That language taken directly from the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. We saw the difficulty of this in our FMP development. We saw the difficulty of this discussion um, during our internal discussion process. And if you didn't see the difficulty of this last night with those comments, we saw it there as well. And it, it, this is not an easy situation for y'all to be in, not, not easy decisions to make. And it is now up to this commission to select this preferred management options. And we are here to support that, to try and explain our thought process behind our recommendations, explain our data, where it comes from, how we applied it to our recommendations, and try to help you as you, are, as you discuss the plan here to move forward. So I just want to offer those comments, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that. Opportunity. Thank you, Madam Director. Appreciate those. Gentlemen. Um, good afternoon. My name is Chris Stewart, and today I'm joined by my colleagues, Jason Rock and Dan Zapt. Today we'll give you an overview of input received from the public online questionnaire and the Commission's standing and regional ACs. We will also present the division's preferred management measures for Amendment 2, and the Commission will vote on its preferred management options. 
In June 2021, a 30 day public comment period was held and the draft FMP was sent out to the northern, southern finfish habitat and water quality, shellfish and crustacean ACs for review. Today, we will, today you all will select your preferred management options. And once selected, the plan will be sent to the DEQ secretary and legislative committees. Barring there's no substantive comments from the department or legislature, the commission will vote on final adoption of the FMP at its February 2022 business meeting. The draft plan contains four issue papers that address bycatch reduction and habitat protection through area closures, gear modifications, and effort controls. Because of differing levels of data richness for the issues, the DMF recommendations were primarily influenced by options with more supporting data and existing research where cumulative impacts are better understood. While we will not review these in, uh, issue papers today, pertinent information from these issue papers is annotated in the decision rationale section of the decision document. To further aid in your discussion, figures and tables and uh, page numbers are represented beside the recommendations in the decision document. Next, we will review input received from the online public questionnaire. All written comments received can be found in your meeting materials. In total, 378 respondents completed the online questionnaire, 98% of which listed themselves as North Carolina residents, and 90% identified themselves as non-commercial, as seen here. In the next three slides, respondents were asked to rate their answers from one to strongly disagree to five strongly agree, and respondents who self-identified as commercial were represented by the gray bars and non-commercial by the blue bars. Commercial and non-commercial respondents largely preferred to purchase North Carolina wild shrimp. When asked uh, if they were concerned about the availability of North Carolina wild caught shrimp if new management was implemented, commercial respondents strongly agreed while over half of the non-commercial respondents strongly disagreed. As you can see here, this working. So strongly disagree, strongly agree. Again, using the same scale, there was moderate support by commercial respondents, shown in gray again, to use headroad limits to limit effort. Non-commercial respondents largely supported the use of headroad head limits. Uh, when asked if access should be given to non-trawl gears in uh, trawl closure areas, both commercial and non-commercial respondents largely neither agreed nor disagreed or agreed. Commercial respondents largely did not agree that daily fishing times, uh, tow times, and trip limits should be used to limit effort. And uh, non-commercial respondents, as shown by the blue bars, strongly agreed. When asked if the number of fishing days per week should be reduced further, commercial respondents largely answered no, as shown by the blue slice in the pie. Uh, whereas non-commercial respondents answer yes, as indicated by the orange slice on the uh, right-hand pie. When asked how many days per week should be closed for shrimp trawling, the majority of commercial respondents indicated one to two days, where most non-commercial respondents, as shown in the blue bars, indicated seven days. Currently, internal coastal waters are closed from 9 p.m. Friday to 5 p.m. on Sunday. When asked if the recreational cast net harvest limit and trawl closure areas should be the same as open areas, the majority of commercial and non-commercial respondents answered yes. Respondents were asked to rate their answers from one to, to strongly disagree to five to strongly agree again. And comparable amounts of commercial respondents strongly disagreed and strongly agreed that area closures are an effective approach to habitat protection. Non-commercial respondents, as shown in the blue bars, largely supported the use of area closures to protect habitat. This figure shows the preferred management approach for critical habitat areas by user group. General areas where critical habitats have been observed are listed below. And commercial respondents are shown in the top graph and they overwhelmingly responded no management changes were needed as shown by the green bars 
our non-commercial respondents on the bottom uh, recommended complete closures, which is represented by the blue bars. This figure shows the preferred management approach for each of the remaining special secondaries by user group. Commercial respondents are again on the top, and they mostly prefer that special secondaries keep their current designation as shown by the orange bars. However, there was moderate support uh, to designate the special secondaries as secondary nursery areas as shown by the blue bars. And management, uh, management using other static seasons is shown by green bars. Non commercial uh, respondents overwhelmingly supported designating special secondaries as secondary nursery areas, thus prohibiting trawling in special secondaries. And this is shown by the blue bars. Commercial respondents, uh, again shown by the gray bars, supported no permanent closures in the Pamlico Sound. However, there was limited support for Area A at the mouth of the Pamlico, Pungo, and Bay Rivers, and C at the Croatan and Roanoke Sounds. Non-commercial respondents in the blue overwhelmingly supported permanent closures at the mouths of the Pamlico, Pungo, and Bay Rivers, as shown in Area A. And the majority of commercial respondents did not support seasonal closures in the Pamlico Sound. However, there was some support for Area A at the mouths of the Pamlico, and Pungo, and Bay Rivers. Non-commercial respondents mostly supported seasonal closures at the mouth of the Pamlico, Pungo, and Bay Rivers with moderate support for no seasonal closures. Now I will review input received from the standing and regional ACs for issue papers developed for Amendment 2. Regarding the protection of critical seagrass and shell bottom habitat issue paper, the Northern AC recommended status quo. The habitat and water quality AC recommended aligning shrimp trawl areas and mechanical clam harvest in Core Sound and North River and allowing trawling in the Straits Channel of Core Sound. They also supported management strategies to protect SAV and shell bottom habitat from trawling. Additionally, the habitat and water quality AC asked that a decision analysis be completed to measure the benefits of taking uh, action versus the costs associated with taking no action. And it's important to note this type of analysis only describes the pros and cons of an action and would not quantify potential reductions in bycatch or the economic impact from management actions. And in the issue papers, the pros and cons of each of these management options are listed. The southern finfish, shellfish crustacean, ACs did not pass a motion on this issue paper, but noted the importance of critical habitat and their protection. For the management of special secondaries, the Southern AC recommended the designation of all special secondaries be changed to secondary nursery areas. No motions or recommendations were made by the other ACs. The Southern AC did not support additional area closures without supporting information to inform these closures. The shellfish and crustaceans AC did not support closing all internal waters or additional seasonal closures. No motions or recommendations were made by the other CD ACs. Both the Northern and Southern ACs did not support additional effort and gear measures due to the lack of quantifiable data and or targets. The Southern and Finfish ACs also recommended that additional data be collected to better quantify bycatch effort and the impacts of bycatch on populations of concern. And lastly, the finfish and shellfish crustacean ACs recommended the division in the industry work group continue toward bycatch reduction with gear modifications and birds. And before we get into Amendment 2, I'd like to briefly review the achievements of the industry work group and the division's continued efforts to develop bird configurations that reduce bycatch. Um, as a part of Amendment 1, the industry work group was formed to test different gear combinations to achieve a 40% reduction in fin by, finfish bycatch. The work group consisted of fishermen, net makers, and scientists from DMF, National Marine Fishery Service, and North Carolina Sea Grant. Testing was conducted in the Pamlico Sound and Atlantic Ocean during the summer and fall of 2015 through 2017. For each of the 267 comparative toes, the entire catch was sampled by DMF observers and sorted by species group. 
Four years were found to reduce bycatch by 40 to 57 percent, and this is in addition to the 30 percent reduction in fin fish bycatch mandated by federal bird certification process. And in July 2019, the use of these gears was implemented in the inside waters where up to 220 foot of head rope is allowed as part of the May 2018 revision to Amendment 1. And in the fall of 2019, two additional gear combinations were tested in the Atlantic Ocean using the same methods and target reductions used by the industry work group. One gear was found to reduce bycatch by 52%. Public outreach has been completed and the use of this, um, this gear configuration will be required in the near shore ocean waters in 2022. The division and industry work group will continue testing new birds and gear designs to further reduce uh, shrimp trawl bycatch. Now, Jason Rock will briefly review uh, development of Amendment 2 and its issue papers as well as the goal and objectives of the plan. All right, so Amendment 2 was developed to address a motion adopted in August of 2018 by the Commission instructing the division to move up the scheduled review of the shrimp FMP from 2020 to 2018 and to focus, management, focus on management strategies that further reduce bycatch and provide additional protections for critical habitat. The division drafted and the public and advisory committees have reviewed four issue papers that address habitat protections, special secondary nursery areas, area restrictions, and effort in gear management. In addition, the division prepared a review of shrimp trawl bycatch information to inform the commission and stakeholders about bycatch impacts and data needs to better inform future decisions. Additional background information can be found on page two of the decision document. And it's important to note that while there are no statutory requirements for this plan specifically regarding the status of shrimp stocks, status quo will not meet the goal and objectives approved by the commission. So the goal of amendment two is to manage the shrimp fishery to provide adequate resource protection, optimize long-term harvest and minimize ecosystem impacts. The objectives include bycatch reduction, habitat protection in a manner consistent with the coastal habitat protection plan or chip, develop a strategy to review nursery areas through the chip monitor and manage the shrimp fishery and its impacts, and promote research and education on shrimp trawl bycatch and its impact on fish population dynamics. And the full text of the goal and objectives can be found on page two of the decision document. And again, I would like to reiterate that status quo does not meet these objectives. As tasked by the commission, the goal and objectives of amendment two were developed to address concerns outlined in petitions for rulemaking submitted by the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. The amendment to issue papers examine the utility of management strategies contained in the petitions to reduce bycatch and protect critical habitat. In the decision document, recommended management measures that address concerns outlined in the petitions for rulemaking are denoted with an asterisk. So amendment two has two objectives directly related to habitat and the chip. Uh, which you'll be hearing about tomorrow. The first is to promote the restoration, enhancement, and protection of habitat and environmental quality in a manner consistent with the CHIP. And the second is to develop a strategy through the CHIP to review current nursery areas and to identify and evaluate potential areas suitable for designation. Some work has already been conducted and other work is ongoing that specifically addresses these objectives. So strategic habitat areas or SHAs are specific locations of individual fish habitats or systems of fish habitats that have been identified to provide exceptional habitat functions or at risk due to imminent threats, vulnerability, or rarity. SHAs have been nominated statewide through the CHIP, including throughout Pamlico Sound, which are shown in dark blue on this map. So verification is underway, but it will take time. The rigorous scientific process in which SHAs are identified, nominated, and designated is the best long-term strategy for providing habitat protection. 
So when evaluating existing nursery areas, juvenile abundance was the primary metric used in those designations. However, as ecosystem science has advanced, so has the definition of nursery areas. Current nursery definitions focus on contribution to adult populations and include growth, survival, movement to adult habitats, abiotic factors, and landscape position. Evaluating these metrics is data intensive, logistically challenging and expensive, but work is ongoing through couple projects to evaluate currently designated nursery areas and to propose new criteria for nursery area habitat designation in line with current ecological concepts that can be achieved. This approach is consistent with current ecological concepts and is a science-based approach to fulfilling the objective, but it will take time and resources. This level of review is necessary because nursery area designations are not species specific and are not designated with the intent of excluding a particular gear, fishing method, or fishing sector from an area. These are issues addressed in species specific fishery management plans like the shrimp FMP. And existing management tools can be used to immediately address habitat and bycatch concerns in the shrimp fishery using available data. So Dan Zapf will now review the division's recommendations for Amendment 2. And it's important to note that these are only the division's recommendations and that a suite of additional options can be found in each issue paper, ranging from status quo to complete area closures and additional effort controls. All right, thank you, Jason. So when making management recommendations, the division reviewed the best available science and the potential impact of various management options to the resource and various user groups, keeping in mind that stock assessments and FMPs for Atlanta croaker, spot, weak fish, and southern flounder do not provide specific recommendations for shrimp trawl bycatch reductions. As Chris mentioned earlier, recommendations were primarily influenced by options with more supporting data and existing research. More comprehensive data for critical habitats and special secondary nursery areas is available to inform recommendations than there is for bycatch and effort data. Division recommendations were informed by multiple data sources, providing information on habitat type and prevalence, fish abundance and diversity, fishery effort and landings data, bird studies, bycatch characterization studies, and hotspot analysis. And these data sets are similar to the data sources used for initial Shaw recommendations prior to their nomination. Protection of critical habitat, potential bycatch reductions, and resource access was considered for individual areas throughout the state. So four gear configurations tested by the industry work group and mandated for use in inside waters were up to 220 feet of combined head rope as allowed, reduced bycatch by an additional 40 to 57%, and their continued use is strongly considered an effective method of bycatch reduction while continuing to allow access to the shrimp resource. The division recognizes the need for continued research and enhanced data collection to meet the goal and objectives of the shrimp FMP and has provided high priority research recommendations needed to better manage the shrimp fishery. So throughout the FMP and decision document, connectivity is discussed as part of the rationale for some area closures. So what do we mean by connectivity and how creating connectivity can reduce shrimp trawl bycatch? The connectivity concept here is looking at connecting fragmented closed areas and smaller water bodies to create larger continuous closed or protected areas that juvenile fish can use to disperse into larger bodies, water bodies like the Pamlico Sound and the ocean. And this approach is supported in the published literature. Juvenile fish and shrimp settle in nursery areas, which we know from existing sampling programs. Because these nursery areas are close to trawling, they're not susceptible to being captured in shrimp trawls when they're in these areas. However, fish and shrimp don't just settle in these nursery areas and stay there. They use multiple habitats throughout their lives. As fish and shrimp grow, they leave nursery areas and enter the rivers and bays before moving into larger water bodies like Pamlico Sound and eventually the ocean, where most of these species spawn. And again, we know this occurs because of existing sampling programs and published literature. 
So once they leave nursery areas and other no trawl areas, they become susceptible to capture in shrimp trawls. Closing additional areas to more fully protect juveniles of these species prevents them from being caught as bycatch in shrimp trawls. So let's look at an example in, um, in Bay River, which is in the center of the map here. The areas in blue on this map indicate area that is open to shrimp trawling. The areas in red and orange indicate areas that are closed to shrimp trawling. So all these tributaries coming off of Bay River are designated nursery areas that are closed to shrimp trawling. Juvenile fish settle in those areas and then they grow and move into the main stem of Bay River before moving into Pamlico Sound. If Bay River is closed to shrimp trawling, the fish moving through Bay River can't be caught as bycatch in shrimp trolls. This would create a continuous closed area connecting nursery habitats and the more open water habitats in Pamlico Sound. And because Pamlico Sound is a large water body, there's more room for juvenile fish to disperse, making them less susceptible to shrimp trolls. Additionally, we know from hotspot analysis that fish are not uniformly distributed throughout Pamlico Sound. Some areas have higher concentrations of fish than others. We can use the connectivity concept and the information from the hotspot analysis to inform targeted area closures to help reduce bycatch. So now we'll move on to a statewide recommendation. Additional information about rationale for effort and gear modification recommendations can be found on page nine of the decision document. The division evaluated available, available data to examine the effectiveness of effort and gear modifications in reducing bycatch. The division recommends to maintain existing head rope limits for shrimp trawls in internal coastal waters, and if needed, implement additional head rope restrictions to resolve user group conflicts. Allow non-trawl gears to harvest shrimp in areas close to shrimp trawling, and eliminate the four quarts heads on or two and one half, and one half quarts heads off recreational creel limit for cast nets only in areas close to the taking of shrimp. Additional information about statewide closures can be found on pages seven and eight of the decision document. Area restrictions are an effective tool for protecting critical habitat, achieving bycatch reductions, delaying harvest of shrimp, and reducing user group conflict that have been implemented in many North Carolina fisheries and can be used to meet the objectives of this plan. Area closures are already in place throughout the state's estuarine waters to protect critical habitat and reduce bycatch. But fishing gears that contact the bottom can have negative effects uh, on critical habitats. Um, and the impacts of trawling over structured habitat like SAV and shell bottom are particularly well documented. Soft bottom habitats, which are the most common habitat type in North Carolina estuaries, are the most resilient to trawl damage. Shifting shrimp trawl effort from areas with critical habitat to soft bottom areas is not expected to result in habitat degradation. Because patterns of fish, fish distribution are known uh, and known life history characteristics, um, area closures that create linkages between closed areas, allow movement between habitats, and protect areas where fish are concentrated will reduce bycatch. Gear modifications, including the use of birds, turtle excluder devices, towel bag modifications, area closures and restrictions, and harvest restrictions have already reduced bycatch. Because of bird requirements and effort restrictions, shifting shrimp trawl effort to larger water bodies where fish can disperse is not expected to increase bycatch. Given the available data on the presence and location of critical habitat and the distribution of common bycatch species statewide, the division recommends using targeted area closures to protect critical habitat and reduce bycatch rather than broad, regional, or complete closures. And it's important to note that area closures refer to closures of an area to shrimp trawling. These areas would be accessible to all other gears used in the shrimp fishery if the use of non-trawl gears is allowed in areas close to shrimp trawling. The division recommends changing the designation of all special secondary nursery areas to permanent secondary nursery areas. It is unlawful to use trawl nets for any purpose in special secondary nursery areas. These closures are targeted in areas that will protect critical habitat 
and reduce bycatch by creating additional connectivity. This change would result in 19,804 additional acres being closed to shrimp trawling. Changing the designation of special secondary nursery areas to permanent secondary nursery areas also extends gill net attendance requirements from 50 yards from shore to all waters from May 1st through November 30th. The division recommends prohibiting trawling in all crab spawning sanctuaries. Crab spawning sanctuaries are located at all coastal inlets and it's unlawful to set or use trawls, pots and mechanical methods for oysters or clams or take crabs with commercial fishing equipment from March 1st through August 31st in the northern sanctuaries, which are located here on the map on the left. And from March 1st through October 31st in the southern sanctuaries, which is this map on the right. These targeted closures will permanently prohibit all trawling, both shrimp and crab trawling, in crab spawning sanctuaries, providing year-round protection for fish and crabs moving through these areas and provide protection for critical habitat found in these areas. This change permanently prohibits trawling in 9,737 additional acres. So moving on to region specific recommendations. Additional information about area closures in the northern area can be found starting on page eight of the decision document. The northern region includes Pamlico Sound, Roanoke Sound, Croatan Sound, Pamlico River, Bay River, and Noose River. The northern region accounts for most of the landings, value, and participants in the shrimp fishery, with nearly all of that coming from Pamlico Sound. The Pamlico Sound averaged around 5 million pounds of shrimp landed, just under $11 million of value, and 204 participants from 2010 through 2019. Additional information about Croatan and Roanoke Sounds can be found on page 11 of the decision document. The division recommends to prohibit shrimp trawling in Croatan and Roanoke Sounds and in the Oregon Inlet area. These closures would prohibit tra shrimp trawling in 71,565 additional acres. These targeted area closures essentially extend existing closures in Albemarle Sound and on the eastern side of Pamlico Sound. These closures will protect areas of critical SAV and shell bottom habitat and allow fish area to disperse as they migrate from Pamlico and Albemarle Sounds through Oregon Inlet. Hotspot analysis indicate hot, indicates hotspot of hotspots of abundance for many species, including Atlantic croaker, summer flounder, and blue crab in Croatan Sound. These closures create additional connectivity between existing closures and provide some protection for these areas, which will reduce bycatch. The Croatan and Roanoke Sounds average just under 30,000 pounds of shrimp landed, about $66,000 of value, and 22 participants from 2010 to 2019. Additional information about Pamlico Sound bays can be found on pages 12 through 13 of the decision document. In the bays along the northern shore of Pamlico Sound, the division recommends to prohibit shrimp trawling in Parched Corn Bay, Berries Bay, and East Bluff Bay. The division also recommends to extend existing closures to prohibit shrimp trawling at the mouth of Stumpy Point Bay, Paynes Bay, Longshoal River, and Otter Creek. These closures would prohibit shrimp trawling in 6,289 additional acres. These targeted area closures protect critical SAV and shell bottom habitat, create connectivity with existing area closures, and allow fish area to disperse into Pamlico Sound as they migrate from these bays. Additional information about the rivers can be found on pages 14 through 15 of the decision document. In the Pamlico, Bay, and Noose Rivers, the division recommends to prohibit shrimp trawling in Pamlico, Bay, and Noose Rivers, and in West Bay. These closures would prohibit shrimp trawling in 140,132 additional acres. These larger targeted area closures protect areas of critical SAV and shell bottom habitat, create connectivity between existing closed areas, and allow fish area to disperse into the Pamlico Sound as they migrate from these rivers. Hotspot analysis indicates hotspots of abundance for many species, including spot and southern flounder, at the mouth of the rivers. These closures provide some protection for those areas, which will reduce bycatch. 
The Noose and Pamlico Rivers averaged just under 50, 57,000 pounds of shrimp landed, about $98,000 of value, and 57 participants from 2010 to 2019. The targeted closures recommended in the northern region would prohibit shrimp trawling in 217,986 additional acres. Overall, in the northern region, the targeted area closures combined with the closures of special secondary nursery areas and crab spawning sanctuaries closures would result in 228,733 additional acres being closed to shrimp trawling. And now I'll turn it back over to Jason Rock to discuss the central area. Thank you, Dan. Uh, additional information about the central region can be found on pages 16 and 17 of the decision document. The central region averaged over 475,000 pounds of shrimp landed, $696,000 of value, and 119 participants from 2010 to 2019. So here the division recommends to prohibit shrimp trawling in Core Sound and its tributaries, except for the mechanical clam harvest area. And to prohibit shrimp trawling in North River, Back Sound, and their tributaries, except for the mechanical clam harvest area in North River. And to prohibit shrimp trawling in Newport River and its tributaries, except for the mechanical clam harvest area and waters north and west between the mechanical clam harvest area and the trawl net prohibited area. These targeted closures will protect critical SAV and shell bottom habitat and will reduce bycatch by creating connectivity between currently closed areas while continuing to allow access to the resource in these areas. Additional information about Core Sound, Back Sound, and North and Newport Rivers can be found on page 16 of the decision document. In Bogue Sound, the division recommends to prohibit shrimp trawling in Bogue Sound and its tributaries, except for the intercoastal waterway. This targeted closure will protect critical SAV and shell bottom habitat and will reduce bycatch by creating connectivity between currently closed areas while continuing to allow access to the resource. And additional information about Bogue Sound can be found on page 17 of the decision document. In the White Oak River, the division recommends to prohibit shrimp trawling in the entire river. This closure protects critical shell bottom habitat and will reduce bycatch by creating connectivity between currently closed areas. These targeted closures recommended in the central region would prohibit shrimp trawling in 53,894 additional acres. Overall in the central region, the targeted closures, special secondary nursery area and crab spawning sanctuary closures would result in 68,919 acres being closed to shrimp trawling. And additional information on the White Oak River can be found on pages 16 and 17 of the decision document. And now I'll turn it over to Chris Stewart to discuss the Southern region. Um, additional information about the Southern region can be found on pages 18 through 22 in the decision document. The southern region averaged about 257,000 pounds of shrimp landed, roughly $447,000 of value, and 96 partic participants from 2010 to 2019. In the southern region, the division recommends prohibiting shrimp trawling in Queens and Bear Creeks, which would close 633 additional acres to shrimp trawling. Additionally, the division recommends prohibiting shrimp trawling in the channels connecting to the Atlantic Ocean. However, the intercoastal waterway would remain open. These closures create connectivity between existing closed areas, which will reduce and provide protection, reduce bycatch and provide protection to SAV and shell bottom habitat. Additional information about Queens and Bear Creeks can be found on page 18 of the decision document. In the New River, the division recommends changing the designation of the New River and Chadwick Bay Special Secondaries to permanent secondary nursery areas, which would prohibit shrimp trawling in these areas. The division also recommends prohibiting shrimp trawling in the channels connecting to the Atlantic Ocean. In the New River, the mechanical clam harvest area and the adjacent channel would remain open. 
these targeted closures continue to allow access to the resource while protecting critical SAV and shell bottom habitat and create con connectivity between closed areas, which will reduce bycatch. More information about New River and Chadwick Bay can be found on page 19 of the decision document. From the New River to Rich Inlet, the division recommends changing the designation of the Stump Sound Special Secondary to a permanent secondary, which will prohibit shrimp trawling. The division also recommends prohibiting shrimp trawling in the channels connecting to the Atlantic Ocean. Outside of the Stump Sound Special Secondary, the intercoastal waterway would remain open to shrimp trawling. These target closures will allow access to the resource while creating connectivity between closed areas, which will reduce bycatch. See page 20 of the decision document for additional information about stump and topsail sounds. From Rich Inlet to Carolina Beach Inlet, the division recommends prohibiting shrimp trawling in the channels connecting to the Atlantic Ocean and the Carolina Beach Yacht Basin. These closures would allow access to the resource while creating connectivity and would reduce bycatch. The intercoastal waterway would remain open except for the area between marker 139 and marker 146, which was closed as part of the 2006 shrimp FMP. Additional information about these area closures can be found on pages 20 and 21. In the Cape Fear River in Brunswick County, the division recommends closing the channels that connect the Atlantic Ocean, but leaving the intercoastal waterway open. These target closures will allow access to the resource while creating connectivity between closed areas, which will reduce bycatch. No additional changes in the new in the Cape Fear River are recommended. Additional information about the Cape Fear River in Brunswick County can be found on page 22 in the decision document. Overall, prohibiting shrimp trawling in the channels that connect to the Atlantic Ocean will prohibit shrimp trawling in 7,845 additional acres. This includes areas from Queens Creek to the North Carolina state, state line. The, uh, the division evaluated critical habitat and fin fish data to identify areas where targeted closures could be implemented to protect habitat and reduce bycatch. In addition to these closures, the division also recommends the continued use of birds to reduce bycatch while still providing access to the fishery. Overall, the proposed area closures would close an additional 15% of estuarine waters totaling 315,206 acres. If selected as the commission's preferred management options, 62% of all estuarine waters will be closed to shrimp trawling. I'd also like to note that 4,177 acres of ocean waters would close as part of the crab spawning sanctuary closures. And as Dan mentioned, uh, it's important to note these area closures to shrimp trawling would be accessible by all other gears used in the shrimp fishery if the use of non trawl gears is allowed in areas close to shrimp trawling. So looking at the statewide area closures as a whole, up to 38% of estuarine waters that would remain open, most of this area is in Pamlico Sound. The precise economic impacts to the shrimp trawl fishery for any area closures cannot be quantified. We've discussed landings, participants, and value data for broad areas, and rivers, and large water bodies, and those data are available in the decision document. But we cannot quantify impacts to more discrete areas or predict how fishing behavior may change. However, even with the implementation of these closures, we cannot quantify the magnitude of bycatch reductions or predict what the benefit of any realized reductions might be to fin fish stocks. Bycatch reduction impacts on stock status is determined through quantitative stock assessments. Due to bycatch species, coastwide and regional stock units, it's unknown if bycatch reduction solely in North Carolina will improve species stock status. So given these limitations, the division also recommends that the commission support investigating the feasibility and utility of a shrimp trawl observer program in the continuation of the industry work group to develop, identify, and test gears that reduce bycatch. So with that, we will take any questions. Hey, um, Commissioner Oler, I'll see you have your hand up. Hold on me, Chairman. Yeah, I saw you had your hand up. Um, I'm ready to make a motion if you're willing to accept one. Okay, go ahead and we put that on the floor, have some discussion. I move that we accept the division's recommendations. 
um, as, our, as our preferred management options and send them forth to the Department of Environmental Quality. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Keneally. Let's make sure we got the, yeah. Okay. So that's your motion as you made it? Yes, sounds great. Yeah, great, all right. There's been a motion and a duly made second discussion. Commissioner Bland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What's unique about this um, whole conversation is that Recalling the day that the motion was made in 2018, there was one commercial commissioner sitting on this commission, and that's me. It was Mr. Hendrickson's very first meeting and the chairman's very first meeting. I recall thinking back to approving the schedule of FMP timeline and this secondary motion coming along in issues from commissioners. What we're looking at here is a want from commissioners that were presently sitting on that day in 2018 and not a need brought to that commission whatsoever. I recall there being a great big discussion from the legal team. And I recall the director asking quite a few times what the need was to bring that back up. And I just wanted to start this conversation out with, with that little tidbit because I recall that day very, very keenly as it was me sitting here with no other commercial commissioners sitting here to discuss the need to review shrimp again in another amendment. I'm sure I voted no. I hadn't gone back and investigated. I either voted no or abstain. And I was the only commercial commissioner I will reiterate again on the commission at the time. When I look at this, recommendation by the division, I automatically focus in on the northern area. And then I listen to the presentation. And a 10 year average amounts to nuts and bolts, according to the data. But I can recall thinking that this is only solely from trip ticket data. And I'm willing to bet anything in the world that that trip ticket data is not accurate. I'm willing to bet that quite a few of the shrimp that were caught in that northern area around Juan Cheese were reported as Pamlico sound caught shrimp. And I'm gonna tell you why. I report my crabs on trip tickets every year for years. For years, I've caught them solely in the Pouse Tank River. I have told the fish house this, and still my trip ticket comes back Albemarle Sound every time. Not a single one of my landings from the Pouse Tank River has been denoted landed in the Pouse Tank River. I can attest to this for years. This is a huge, huge problem. I can attest to because it happens to me all the time. And I'm not gonna to talk to the fish house till I'm blue in the face to change that because I'm not required to. I tell them where they come from and that's where they, you know, if they take it or leave. So when I look up at that Northern region, I say, there's no way because I've gone up there shrimping just on the back of the boat. Times I ain't had other things to do with some of my buddies. I watch every day 
as Facebook posts are made with families come from out of town to use that area recreationally. There's charter guides that take folks out. They shake 20 crab pots or so, get them a basket of crabs and they pull a net for two or three toes and get them a cooler full of shrimp. This motion and those options will cut all of that out. These people are taking two or three trips a day. Some of them four or five boats. I don't, I'm not exactly the, the, sure of the number because there's no reporting mechanism at all to prove that this is occurring at a very minimal level. Other than that, Collington crowd, they go out there in little 25 foot boats with 35 foot nets or whatever they are. They get however much weight. They have small dealers license and they, they uh, probably pedal them shrimp for quite a bit of money at a very low poundage. This is just right off the top of my head you know, of, of the detrimental effects that it's gonna have just to that one area. Dare County brings in the most revenue in the entire state. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people pass into that county and spend a lot of money. Spoke with the Dare County representative last night. He was very disappointed at that recommendation, as was I because the small boats that come out of Juan Cheese take advantage of the opportunities given to use those smaller water bodies to get away from rough seas and adverse conditions. And they use it as, as shelter and safety on the days that is needed, that they can't go out and use the bigger water bodies. You're talking about destroying the entire shrimp fleet out of wine cheese with that. So I can't get behind this motion whatsoever for the multiple reasons that I've list, that I've talked about here the last few minutes and mostly the one being that how this all came about. You know, being a new commissioner is, is intimidating enough, but to get to issues from commissioners and have this thrown in your lap I didn't think that was quite fair, and I didn't know how far it was gonna go, but now we see. As I look down the map and look at the additional acres closed, that's a lot of acres to a lot of small boats that don't pull very big nets, that have minimal impact, that contribute to eco tours, that contribute to the charter industry, that contribute to the recreational industry. We've heard from consumers. We've heard from recreational guys that like the shrimp. We've heard from big boats, little boats. Tons of comments, tons of, 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 of spoken comment, tons of written comment, tons of email. We've heard from other state agencies. We've heard from big organizations. This is a very important issue. And to approach it this way, it's not the right way in my opinion. We had a uh, commercial funding committee meeting. And, you know, to put it out there, we, we've got some requests for proposals that's gonna address uh, looking at shrimp bycatch. We want to, as the commercial industry, look at the bycatch. We want to quantify, we want quantifiable numbers. We volunteered our money that we're able to use to put toward that and to get proposals back to start addressing these issues rightfully, to do gear work more, but to, to, to blanket areas that are supposedly connected to areas used by fin fish and all other kinds of critters, just as a way to maybe reduce bycatch because that's what I heard in the final statements of the, of the presentation. Nothing's quantifiable. It may reduce. I might could ask you to read that whole little final statement y'all made right over again, just to listen to it one more time. But this right here, I don't see it working. And I see businesses, fish houses, 
and entrepreneurs, which we heard that as a big word last night, being destroyed immediately. You know, there's not but so much left we can do. And, and we're trying to adapt and we're trying to do the right thing. And we've done everything that's been asked of us to this point. ITPs, work groups, bycatch reduction. We're leading the world in shrimp bycatch reduction. Other states are taking our research and putting it into their nets and their activities. So I don't see where we're making a proper decision by just accepting the fact that we're just going to take in all this bottom and leave 38% which equates to the middle of the Pamlico Sound open. We've had the entire Albemarle Sound closed for how many years, 40 some years? That whole place has been used as a nursery area. Nobody said a word about it. There's never been anybody to ask to go up there to open trawls. There's plenty of bottom closed right now and there's plenty of room for improvement, but the continue to close bottom and take away from the small boats. I'm completely against that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Hendrickson. Mike, I well remember that meeting also because the first first meeting on the Marine on this commission can be intimidating particularly when you see an issue being steamrolled and you're not quite sure what, what the role is rolling. Um, takes a while for things to come around. Um, I appreciate what you guys do and have done. Um, I really appreciate it when we are grounded with our legislative backing and the science. I attended a lot of political briefings and watched poll results and and um, would always question the pollster on the, the quality of their data. And the, what struck me for the first time since I've been on this commission is the first part of the presentation was a presentation of a sort of hybridized poll, which really doesn't have uh, standing when we're looking for scientific uh, data to, to uh, manage the resource, as everybody wants to say. Um, this is the shrimp management plan. And I haven't heard a word about shrimp. I don't think shrimp was mentioned once in there other than dealing with some some amount of capture. Point is it's an annual resource. You know, this and so if we don't have a compelling reason to have to take an incredibly drastic action that will have an significant impact on our economy unless you absolutely couldn't see or hear last night you could feel people's pain i'm at harker's island and i look on this map and i've been down there for 30 years i look out on the back sound we can all walk off the end of my pier and jump out into it right now a little chilly but you see people out there shrimping you see the straits, which isn't even mentioned here, but it's a body of water down there that's important to a lot of folks. Yeah, you know, there's areas down there that people can tell you, see Brownie Lawrence in the back. Brownie can tell you where you can shrimp down there and be in out of the SAV. Unless you just don't have any sense, you're not gonna be trawling across oyster rocks because the nets are too damn expensive. So the issues that you know, we get off on in a tunnel here uh, chasing something. We've got a million acres closed today. And we're talking about proposing to close an extra 492 square miles of water. 492 and a half to be exact. Around the central area in Core Sound, Back Sound, North River, Straits, which isn't even counted for here, uh, Newport River, areas where a lot of the folks you saw last night make a living out of. You know, we're closing it down completely for no good reason other than convenience on a map. 
Yeah. None of us want to be trawling in SAV. None of us want people to be. I'm not trawling. Uh, no, we wouldn't trust me, captain in the boat, to pull to pull a trawl. But no, you know, no one, no responsible trawler is into the SAV. Around our area, the SAV water is so shallow that you know you get more damage with folks who can't figure out where the channel is, and they get up with their outboard engine, and that tears up a lot more uh, SAV around our area than than you than than anyone on a trawler. But I'm sitting here and I'm listening to the public comments, which you, this body, you know, we're not a political body, but when you have an, a matter that is here without science relative to the shrimp, we can talk about CHIP, we can talk about protecting SAV, but this is a shrimp management plan. And what we're doing here has nothing to do with that. I would t you know, tell you, I think it's inappropriate thought it was inappropriate a while before. If we'd have seen some of these recommendations coming, we could have had some more discussion, but the, the uh, we didn't see this until late in the process. And Pat, Director Ross has addressed some of that, but the nature of how it got here, it has gotten here awfully late. And uh, I think it's without appropriate public input, although we have now had a significant amount of public comment including uh, one of our largest in, uh, associations in North Carolina Farm Bureau. You got the Department of Agriculture. You've got, uh, I'm not sure how many county commissioners have, have done resolutions and had representatives come here to speak. And I think we should listen. We're, you know, we are not seeing, you know, we're, we're having a potential, we created a solution that fits in somebody's mind to a problem. We've invented a problem and we're creating a solution for it. Never once talking about how we lead the nation with bycatch reduction. And yet we want to say here, we'll continue doing that. Well, that's a lot like saying, we'll continue decorating the house after it burns down. Who's, you know, we're going to shut, put a bunch of people out of business and then say, now we ought to work on helping the small boats improve their bycatch reduction. There won't be any small boats. Where are they going to go? We heard it last night and we know it in reality. We're, we're cutting the waters out that anybody with a small boat could safely trawl. And that without, you know, that would be a tough decision if the, if the resource data and science required it. These founder decisions we make are tough, but we know what the data is. We have tough decisions to make when we have data in this case you know you cannot in good conscience ruin an economy throw people out of business put other people who are going to try to stay in business lives at risk having them try to push their boats where they don't belong without hard data and science to back it up and that's that's the biggest thing i have you know, when i look at all this i just I, you know, I, and i look at the folks, when I come on Harker's Island, every time you come and go, there's a refuge harbor there that's maintained by the county. And those are the boats that everybody ends up putting on their posters and their pictures and stuff. And it is part of the heritage that is down east. And that may not be important to a lot of folks, but I think we should, you know, we should destroy it at our peril. We should destroy it only after thoughtful consideration of, with absolute facts and hard science, which I don't see, therefore I can't support it. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Henderson. Before I recognize Commissioner Cross, just want to clarify something. You mentioned that was my first meeting. That was my first meeting this cycle. I was originally appointed by the Governor Aces and Commission, just for clarification. Commissioner Cross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First thing I want to do is commend the division on a response that they were more or less forced to formulate from the actions of the prior vote on speeding up the FMP, FMP2 on the, on the FMP on the shrimp committee and also from the uh, petition. Uh, I know you were basically forced to do something along this line in a basically a, a much bigger hurry 
than what you normally would have put into this process. And I recognize that. But you know, this this argument is a three prong argument so far as the argument that these people use against trawling. First one being uh, Habitat and SAV. Well, let's let's look at that. You know, no trawler in its right mind will trawl an oyster bed or trawl an SAV. Oyster beds tear up expensive gear and grass will foul up a net in a heartbeat. So, you know, you keep saying protect more SAV and protect more bottom. We're doing that already. We're doing that because we don't want to tow in that already as a trawler or as the industry would, you know, shrimp boats. Second thing you come down the line with, you're talking about bycatch and you're going to always use the spot and the croaker and the weak fish so far as uh, your, your whipping board on that. And I understand that, but you know, from some of the data we've looked at earlier today, you can't begin to say a speckled trout falls into that equation. And when I look back at some of the comments of the people we had speak last night and this morning, I find it really rich that some of these people have basically got different positions in their head not long ago, and we, we talk about the science. And when we're talking about the science here, to my knowledge, there is zero data available anywhere that will show you how the bycatch of spot, croaker, or weak fish in the Pamlico Sound affects that species overall abundance anywhere. Now, no, there's no doubt it affects it regionally, but to my knowledge, there's no data that can empirically show you anywhere where a capture through these trawls and the bycatch reductions thereof affects that species overall whatsoever. But I do have some comments that prior people that have spoken up here in the last few two or three days have made in the past, and I'll refer back, number one, to the, um, excuse me, to the transcript of the meeting in New Bern when this all got started with the original petition. And in the transcript, I'm going to quote Dr. Daniels to begin with. Um, and I find it interesting that his position at the North Carolina Wildlife Federation is kind of flip-flopped. I don't want to say it's an apology, but the issue of the four to five one, I was under extraordinary pressure to come up with the number. And the estimate on average of four to five one, that's clear. Well, that's well established, but it's not a good estimate. So I've seen a lot of these basic numbers extrapolated from that on bycatch. I don't like the number any more than you do. It's not the appropriate way to characterize bycatch. So it's been misused in my opinion. But again, they wanted a number, and so I gave them the number. I would love to spend the rest of the day talking to you about the flaws in the petition from a biological perspective. Now, this is verbatim. Well, it's been, now he's referring to the fly net fishery offshore. It's been closed 14 years. And can you point to any quantifiable measure, measurable positive benefit from that closure? No. So he's talking right there about a fishery directed at these species that's been closed and it had no quantifiable results. You know, the number of trips are down 75 to 90 percent. Now, this was back in 2014 or 15, talking about shrimping already. You know, and he goes on to talk about eliminating fly net closures and stuff like that. So I sit there and I listen, and his basically a summary was, so removing the remains of our inshore shrimp fishery, we can come back here in five years with seeing not one single difference in the population of spot, croaker, and weak fish. Is it worth it? No, in my opinion, it's not. Not for the economy, not for the social aspects of the economy in North Carolina. And then amazing, we're here three or four years later, we've got a flip-flop in the exact information that he was given then. Then I'll refer to another letter from Dr. Daniels to Joe Alby. The decline in the stocks of these fisheries is in fact coastwide and not just a North Carolina phenomenon. Along the mid-Atlantic coast in the areas where weak fish production is the highest, the abundance and landings of weak fish have decreased precipitously since the late 1990s. 
This decline has been most apparent in the state where inshore trawling is not allowed. So we're looking at bycatch or weak fish is declining greater in areas that's not allowed. And where recreational landings have historically been the highest. Scientists along the Atlantic coast have concluded that it is likely natural mortality and not fishing mortality that is the driving factor in the current weak fish decline. North Carolina is a national leader in developing innovative ways to minimize bycatch and protect stocks of juvenile fish, shrimp, shellfish, and crabs in our sounds, estuaries and ocean, and our heavily regulated estuarine and shrimp trawl. Furthermore, North Carolina was the first state to require bycatch reduction and the first state, state to designate primary nurseries. Right. So, I mean, when you're listening to this science, so-called science, that we hear stuff from, I'm not saying that y'all aren't using your best, best available science. I'm saying you're using the science that is available that doesn't have the answer because you don't have the answer. And uh, you clearly stated that in the petition. And I understand that. You know, and then my last thing on weak fish, I have an email from a Desmond Kahn, who was the chairman of the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission a while back. As a longtime former member and sometimes chair of the ASFMC Weak Fish Stock Assessment Subcommittee, I can assure you that we had included estimates of shrimp bycatch in our earlier assessments. We then revised the assessments accordingly years before the 2006 assessment that originally concluded natural mortality had greatly increased on weak, side, on weak fish coastwide. If you are making a claim that shrimp bycatch is the cause of the coastwide weak fish decline, you are overreaching and your claim does not hold up. Let me, let me read that again. If you are making the claim that shrimp bycatch is the cost, I mean the cause of the coastwide weak fish decline, you are overreaching and your claim does not hold up. So there's some science from the ASFMC that states that, you know, weak fish is not being affected by trawling whatsoever. So when you talk about your spots and your croakers and stuff like that and your bycatch, you know, you need to have the data that empirically, without doubt, shows that you are affecting the overall species abundance, not something local or anything like that, but the overall species abundance before you start looking at closing areas to North Carolina shrimpers that is going to destroy the economy of their local counties. It's going to deny the North Carolina consumer its access to shrimp as we've been seeing in the past. And it's just like I hear, I hear, I hear discussion on well, we, we use 40 million pounds of shrimp a year. Well, that may be true. We may only supply 10 million pounds of shrimp a year. But that 10 million pounds is bought 20 to 1 over any imported shrimp. That's what North Carolinians want. They want our local product. They want local shrimp from local dealers, local peddlers. They want the story behind it, and they want it to eat in the restaurants and go to the retail markets and handle it. They buy imported product if they have to. They don't want to. They will buy product from North Carolina on every species, flounder, shrimp, whatever, 100 to 1 over anything else, but they will certainly buy North Carolina shrimp. So when you go to talking about you can't supply it all, there's no state in the nation that can supply all their shrimp needs. The Gulf is in the same situation we are right now with all their so-called closures and everything else. They've had a bad brown season this year. They're having a bad white season. We had a horrible brown season. It was maybe three or four weeks long. That was it. But where were those shrimp this spring? Where were the brown shrimp? They were in the mouth of Neuse River. These closures were, were in place now. The entire spring, summer, shrimp crop would have not been touched. They didn't have anywhere. They, they didn't go anywhere. They stayed right there, and they'd have gone outside, and they never got caught. They got caught as juveniles, 3135s and 2630 head on, which is another problem we've got because of water quality. We've got something going on with our brown shrimp. They're not growing. But we're not addressing that. You know, we're addressing shutting the commercial fishermen down in these areas. So there are important things we need to be doing. There are a lot of factors involved economically, you know, sociologically. There's just 
you can't begin to count why this overall amendment is wrong as it's written. You know, there's a lot more that should have gone into it. I know where you were forced into a corner in your timelines, but anything of this magnitude should not be crammed into two years. It should be crammed into a period where you're, you're carrying it out and you're bringing it back and you keep carrying it out for discussion until everybody can just about get on the same page. You don't send it out and take data back so far as internet data where you got people that don't commercial, commercially fish versus the ones that do because you know how that's going to come back. Science and practicality is what needs to be used. Talk to people about where they work these boats. Talk to about people where they catch shrimp and don't catch shrimp. We're going to implement a study through the, the committee that Mike was talking about earlier about how much actual acreage is actually trawled in this sound. When we get that study back, you may find out that you got all the daggone connectivity and all the closed areas you want anyway because people aren't working in it. But find that out. Don't carte blanche shut down areas to appease special interest groups putting through special wants and needs because that's what this is. This is a big package that you had to respond to of wants and needs, not data driven, not economically driven, but it's in its entirety, it's extremely arbitrary, arbitrary and capricious. My friends, that's dangerous. You're teeter tottering on severe legal issues then. And that's where we're at. We're right down that edge line right now if we're not already crossed it. So this is why I won't support this. I'll never support anything that puts as many people out of work just because another group wants that to happen. Not to mention the dangers involved of the small trawlers having to work in areas they can't work and stuff like that. So, you know, you have to think of the fishermen as part of the resource also. I've heard contrary, it all goes together. It's just like, you know, if I was to say, I don't want any guides. Why? I mean, that would be arbitrary and capricious. That's wrong. Show me the data where they're causing harm. Show me the empirical data that proves it. But don't just show me some because somebody wants it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Okay, let's go with uh, Commissioner Posey first. Oh, Dan, okay. See, you, okay. We'll go with Commissioner McNeil and Commissioner Posey and Commissioner Romano. So, I mean, I assume you guys have real data to support your recommendations. Uh, what, what's your data based off of? How, how long is the study done for, to get the data? Well, I mean, we have habitat data, but we know where SAV is. We know where shell bottom is. So we have that map. Our, our recommendations to close those areas are based off that. Our data support other recommendations, such as some of the area closures around the river mouths was based on hotspot data. We know these abundances where these fish are, and that's what is shown in the maps that were included in the base plan. And you can see quite clearly the abundances of fish or in these areas where we suggested our recommendations. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like if we can't trust data that the division is making recommendations on, then we've got a, a bigger issue there. Um, but I don't think anybody's completely proved that that's the case. So I have to trust the recommendation that the division is putting forth based on the data that they have. So I appreciate you guys doing the work. Okay, Commissioner Posey. Well, first of all, I really want to thank you all for um, putting together this information. I know it was a tremendous amount of work, and you know it's a difficult set of data to bring together. I'm familiar with the connectivity models and and some of those how they've been used and some of the other theoretical base. So you know, really appreciate the work. Um, I was going to on address both habitat and then bycatch separately. Um, for habitat, um, thinking about from a trip perspective, we have several different habitat um, categories. First, that most common one, which is your broad, fine sand to medium sand. You call it mud. You know, I, I call it fine sand, medium sand, coarse sand. Um, and this is an area where I've spent a tremendous amount of my time. 
um, you know, all these cute little creatures that are there that in my lab, we, we look out under scopes and I've raised up from little babies. Um, and they're very tolerant of the cervix, just like you said. Um, they can um, reproduce fast. They are adapted to being disturbed in a fine sand environment. Um, I've gone through a series of papers. I've probably looked at in the past four months doing discussion with this here, we looked at, I would say close to 70, 80 papers. And pretty much, you know, there's a few where you get effects. Most of the time, it's a very resilient community. And that's something you've already talked about. Um, moving next to um, SAV, this is a habitat we need to protect. It is particularly fragile now as we're gradually transitioning from your temperate species to your tropical species. So you may have periods where you don't get anything in an area that it'll finally appear up of another species. Um, and I think your maps did a great job of showing what, where that is, especially on the eastern side, hugging that outer bank shoreline. Um, that's an area that if the ones the Shaws are uh, finally instituted, the Shaws should do a good job of protecting that. Um, the Shaws are well placed. They would do a great job, um, but that's an area that does need protection. Um, and so that's that sort of hugging that eastern shore of the Sound, the very Western, the western edge of the islands over there. Um, shell bottom, um, I, I think that if, if shell bottom is open to um, oyster dredging, it doesn't make any difference, no sense in protecting it. Um, we have sanctuary areas, and I think that a lot of your shell bottom is in shallow areas. I think for shell bottom, it's pretty well demonstrated. The real problem there is water quality and silt in the water column and also reestablishing um, breeding sanctuaries, the work done by Dave Eggleston, putting out those research sanctuaries. And then finally, uh, we get to the marsh areas where you have the shallow edge areas that we need to protect. And I'm very much in favor of having a six foot contour um, up and down those rivers, which I've talked to various folks about. That will be very important in protecting that shallow marsh edge area. Um, which is where a lot of your medium-sized juveniles are migrating through. I understand that's currently protected, though. It's protected through um, rules that prevent controlling, rules that prevent um, conflict between crab potting and trawls, that for much of the year, if you have a six-foot contour that's already um, doesn't allow trawling, if I understand correctly. If I don't, please correct me after, after I talk. So that said, for the habitat, the area along the shore is, is critical along the um, western edge of the sound. And many of the other areas are protected um, and through other mechanisms, at least if I understand that there's some shallow water protection. Um, and that also provides somewhat of a corridor for your smaller, medium-sized juveniles. Um, and so I think we're moving towards that habitat, critical habitat um, protection. I think to be honest, as identified in the ship, our most important things after we move past to get the shawls um, protected is for um, really affecting water quality, enhancing our marshes and some of those protections. So when, with that, I think we're moving forward on that. We have the pieces in place. Y'all have identified some great areas for shawls um, and of course along the edge of the sound. So that, and plus I should also note in terms of the SAV, um, we also have on our Habitat and Water Quality Committee, three of the experts in North Carolina in terms of trying to show where areas might best be protected. Judd Kenworthy, Joe Fodry, Bob Christian. And so, you know, if we want to define areas and they've worked with the Shaws, they've worked with putting that together. So summarize Habitat. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's an area where, um, most of that broad open sand is not really an issue. Um, the areas along the outer sound uh, have already been identified. I think that the protection is coming in place for them. Always to be wary that it doesn't go away. So that then leads us to the much more difficult question of bycatch. And bycatch does happen. And I do understand why um, without having exact data, um, looking at the connectivity was the way to go. But my concern is where science meets people. Um, and that's in that whole Pamlico Bay, Pamlico Bay, Noose River areas, West Bay. 
Um, I understand those are areas of connectivity. But I also understand that's an area where we have some uncertainty about how much benefit we'll get. Um, theory is there, but in terms of knowing exactly how, we'll, how much will increase in bycatch, it's uncertain. Um, understanding, um, you know, given the lower amount of effort that's sometimes there, whether that's going to make a huge difference. Um, today, I was um, surprised to hear um, uh, Lewis Daniels say that it wouldn't make any difference. Um, it would just, they just pass on through. So given this uncertainty, then the next thing I look at, okay, given the uncertainty, what is the human impact? If you implement something that's possible but uncertain versus the potential impact. And this is a case where I think we've heard the potential impact is very strong. And it's something that, to be honest, resonates personally. I grew up in a farming waterman um, household. You know, we grew tobacco, we did waterman things, and I know what it's like that, that that waterman part of it determines whether or not you get Christmas presents, or in my case, whether or not I'm going to wear ill-fitting hand-me-down clothes or actually get some new clothes for Christmas. Um, it's, it's important. It's an important part of the income. It may not seem like a major part of the economy of the state of North Carolina, but for a large number of people, this is critical income. And as we heard last night, this is important for a significant group of people. And given that, I don't see where the certainty of gain from closing those areas can balance against what is clearly going to be a major economic issue um, for a large um, bunch of people. And most importantly, there are people who don't have the money to fight it who don't have a lot of money, a lot of resources to go elsewhere. Um, now, and, and so particularly is that, um, as we're learning, I think, more and more these days, people sometimes, you know, get rolled over when they don't have the resources to fight it um, because it's so much easier to do that. Now, so, so th right now I don't see where the gain, certainly gain, can anywhere balance the the harm. Now, I think there was someone who was going to do a quote earlier today. They got cut off in time, but I happen to know that quote. Um, well, if it's a few sacrifice for the greater good, it is what we need. And that's another thing where I have some problems with as well. If we do find that, okay, we need, we need to cut down, eliminate trawling in this area. So we are going to eliminate the livelihood of this group of people. Well, the way to do it is not simply pass a rule here, a year later they're out of work, and all of a sudden, you know, we've just we left them. The way to do it is, okay, this has been going on for hundreds of years, you've been doing this fishing for hundreds of years. If it's going to have to phase out, you do a phase out of years where you work with, and I'm not really, I'm looking at you because you happen to be there, you're not the ones doing it, nor do I think the Division of Marine Fisheries is the one, but your white shirt, you know, in between two darker <laughs> shirts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're sorry. Um, if you're going to phase in something like um, phase out fishing in an area that's going to really target a group of people, and I assume this whole time I'm assuming that the idea is that this is really a group of people who don't have the large boat, the small boat shrimper. You do it as a phase in. You make sure there's the economic resources. I heard some number earlier today mentioned that we could save several billion dollars, um, gain several billion dollars by converting over. Well, if we can gain several billion dollars, we can use tens of millions of dollars to allow a transition if that's absolutely necessary. Yeah, I don't see anything about that. That is not the job of the Division of Marine Fisheries, I understand. But if one put in the ban without also simultaneously putting in working with the community on a transition that works for them, it's not going to happen. So those things have to be done together. So if one is going to do that change, one needs to work in the equitable way to work with the community on what can be done. I'm not, I'm not saying that is something we have to do, but if in the future it is decided, okay, we need to phase things out, we've got to work to make sure that people have the transition and the money. Um, and the resources. So 
that's a long-winded way of saying that I think our habitat is fairly well met with a variety of factors. And for that one particular section, which is the largest section, I would say the controversial section, I just cannot support it. I cannot support it given the uncertainty versus the certain um, the certainty of the negative and lack of any discussion of how we might phase in or somehow involve the community and how they might see a change and the resources they might need in order to change. Sorry, that was a long window. Hey, Commissioner Romano, followed by Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone that came out last night um, with that public comment. I mean, I really felt like we were witnessing the heartbeat of America right there. It was really, uh, you know, I, I have a, I tend to take a really great position of pride when it comes to everything North Carolina, but specifically, um, you know, our resources, um, our fishing resources, the division, um, you know, how a lot of times people ask me, you know, when I tell them in the seafood business, they say, well, what do you, what do you think about sustainability? And, and you know, I, I, the first thing that comes to mind, I was like, well, the best thing you can do and the easiest thing is, you know, to buy in the United States, buy a product from the United States, because we, we lead the, the world in our fisheries management. And the second thing you can do is buy uh, your product from North Carolina, because North Carolina leads the country in terms of our programs and uh, how we, how we uh, go about approaching our fisheries. Um, that being said, um, you know, I, I feel like we need to start having some pride in, in these shrimpers and looking at them as more of um, an asset to our culture and an asset um, to us as, as scientists that are out there every day. Um, I feel like a lot of times when, when we talk about this, we think of, you know, shrimp boats as this damaging entity that we have to control. And I just don't see it that way. I, I, I look a lot of times and I see shrimpers and shrimping out there and man, it, it gives me a feeling that, wow, people are still working. Um, we can produce the food here in the United States. We have some guys that will, that will do that. And they're doing something very highly technical. That's what I want to tell everyone. It's not something that can be learned overnight. There's an incredible amount of barriers to entry to get involved in these fisheries. And we just got a, a trip ticket presentation here to say that our trips are down um, for the first time, down less than 100,000 trips this year. And uh, that's worrisome to me, being a, a young business owner. You know, I've got about 90 employees right now. We sell 40% uh, of what we sell is shrimp. And so, you know, I'm looking years forward and I'm thinking to myself, you know, if, if us as a, as a culture, as a state, we can't stand behind these shrimpers and say that this is a thing that we want to see going on. We want to produce this, this seafood and we want people to get into it, um, we're, we're in trouble to begin with, um, without all these regulations. So, you know, that's kind of the, the people part of this that I see. Um, you know, as far as, as, far as the, uh, the, uh, the biology, the habitat um, issues, the bycatch issues, you know, we've talked about this ad nauseum. And uh, I, I really, I, once again, you know, I, I've got a friend, friend that passed away, a shrimper, Timmy Eden, he's in Sneeds Ferry, and I remember him showing me a picture of a uh, bycatch reduction device that him and some other shrimpers came up with before any of these regulations came up, and that was to increase the, the efficiency of his shrimping, and because he knew that there were people that were going to be concerned about this in the future. So these were leaders, you know, that set the, the tempo for this, and it's continued, and the division has helped immensely with with uh, this bycatch reduction. So I, I kind of uh, feel like we're throwing out a lot of good work and uh, we're just failing to see that we've done so much already. And once again, I just don't think that the pride is there um, for these guys that work. Um, as far as habitat, you know, it's a complicated, um, that's a complicated issue, but I, one thing I've, I've noticed, and you could see it in public comment last night, is the shrimpers, they, they want to help with habitat. They want, number one, they're, they're ready to study it. They're ready to work with anybody who wants to work with them. There's an extreme willingness, which is kind of hard for me to see because, you know, as much as they've been kind of targeted in past years, I don't think that it would be hard for me if I'd been a part of that story for so long um, to be involved in that. But uh, 
you know, Habitat, I think that most people that I've, I've kind of monitored, they want to stay, they, SAV is important. You know, we want our, we know that that's critical um, for, for small fin fish, it really any juvenile recruitment. Um, my problem is, is when I look at these areas, it seems like just a broad brush strip. And, you know, to me, uh, a little bit more of an acute eye on this, rather than saying, oh, this area is, might have some SAV, this has got some SAV. You know, if you're out on the water enough, you know that SAV is, is patchy, you know, and there are, there are some places that are uh, really heavy in SAV. And I would venture to say that most of those are, are uh, you know, you're, you're not seeing shrimpers wanting to go into those areas. Um, you know, and, you know, this, I'd be, I'd, I would be upset if I didn't mention this because it's something, um, you know, the years that I've been driving around, picking up seafood from all these different small areas, you know, one of the first things that I'd hear from people is, man, and you guys have all heard it, everyone's heard it, is, man, if they just open up some of these areas, then, you know, we could get the bottom back back better than it is now because what one thing has happened, now we may have seen a decline in effort in the last 50 years in terms of, uh, you know, commercial fishing in general and the commercial infrastructure. But what we have seen in increases is coastal development. And what coastal development does is it loosens up all the sediment here on land, which we change immensely, by the way. We don't change anything in the water. We maybe drop a trawl down and hits the bottom a little bit, very slightly, by the way. And, uh, you know, on land, we're completely changing. So, you know, all this change that we've done on land, well, that transfers over into the water in the form of silt. And to me, I think if there's any area that we know that we are changing the environment, it is with the silt that we found that you can find pretty much in any settling basin from small creeks up to large rivers. And, you know, we've closed these areas no longer. There's no bottom disturbance. There's, there's nothing going on and we get piles and piles of silt. And, you know, uh, I, this isn't an idea that I just came up with willy nilly. It's not a bunch of commercial fishermen, just their intuition. This has been studied worldwide. I, I brought up when I first got on the commission, you know, I was interested in the benefits of trawling. And so I, I looked up several and I sent it to the commission. It was kind of never really took it back up, but you know, there's studies all over the world that look at, well, there could be some benefits to actually trawling the bottom in the form of primary production, small bristle worms and small worms that actually will digest these uh, heavy, you know, deposits of, of nitrates. And so to me, I feel like, um, you know, we got to take some time and develop some trust between the scientific community and the fishermen. And I believe there's a potential for this. I'm an optimist. And I, I really truly think that if we can start bridging some of those gaps, we can see exactly what we're doing in a more uh, clear way, rather than just um, responding to a lot of, you know, frankly, special interest groups that want a certain thing. They don't, you know, they, a lot of, you know, loud talk and, and really at the end of the day, um, I, if they had some pride and they had some trust in the shrimpers uh, and commercial fishermen in general throughout our state, then I think that uh, we'd have somewhere to go. But without that, um, it's it's really is problematic. So that's what I just kind of ask um, the division and the general public. Um, you know, these these commercial fishermen, these shrimpers that work in these coastal communities, they are not only are they scientists, food producers, securing secu security for our food network, which everybody knows we're in the time right now where the grocery stores can go shelves can go empty overnight no one would know no better and it gives me great security to feel that these guys are actually going out there and making sure that you know we're not going to starve and you know these these uh our neighbors you know these fishermen they're not not to mention their community uh you know very important to these communities um they, they're generally uh you know Many people know them. They, a lot of them also, you know, sell their own shrimp. Um, so they're just they're just really important to our communities and our culture. So 
you know, I, I obviously stand against this. I really hope that, you know, when I look at some of these areas, if there are areas that we consider closing or we consider to look at closures, get a little bit more acute. Take some time to look at these areas. Look at who are, there's, I don't, I don't know how many specific zones there are, but the first thing I did is, you know, I called up shrimpers in my area and said, hey, do you work this? Tell me about this area. Tell me where you work. How do you work it? How has it been working? And I don't know if that work's been done on a very personal level. We don't have that many commercial fishermen in the state. It's, it's uh, you know, I feel like a phone call would do in, an, in a survey would do a lot to every shrimper that we have based on these areas. And, you know, if there is a way that we can also go to these areas, um, specifically get some scientists involved and look, you know, take dive tanks down, look at where the SAV is, particularly if you know you've got a really uh, pristine habitat area in within these zones, well then mark it off with PVC poles, tell your local shrimpers, hey man, we're trying to, you know, stay away from this area. We're gonna, we want you to allow to trawl this zone, um, you know, a little bit more uh, cohesion between um, these bodies is, is really going to help. Um, so, you know, I, I guess that's pretty much concludes my comments. I really hope that uh, we can all kind of look um, outside of our particular positions and just just try to come together as a community because it is all we're all whether you're a recreational fisherman, um, a commercial fisherman, a scientist, a consumer. Believe it or not, we have a lot of the same similar wants and and needs. And I think that if we could talk to each other on that basis, then then we'd get something better than this. Cause this it really it seems very short sighted and, and it 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 really just does not seem to uh to to think about that. So I appreciate your time and thank you. All right, before I go to Commissioner Roller, uh Madam Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um I certainly hear the concerns of the commission and appreciate those and certainly heard the concerns of the stakeholders last night. I just do want to remind this commission that this body, this body is the one that directed this division to use our tools and come to you with recommendations. And this is what we've done. Uh, and not only that, but again, the goals and objectives were set by this body. And I even had a staff member say to me the other day, I don't remember who it was, but they said to me the other day, you know, I've never had a commission actually write the goals and objectives. We always get the commission's approval for the goals and objectives, but we never have had it quite done that way. And the, the things that we were told to focus on was the reduction of bycatch and the protection of habitat. Uh, and again, we've talked about the difficulty of striking the balance and is it indeed a difficult balance to strike. We totally appreciate that. We also, staff indicated when they started with their presentation that these are our recommendations, but there are a suite of options in this plan that you can get, um, you can drill down further and you can be uh, more conservative or you can be less conservative within the bounds of the plan. There are uh, plenty of opportunities to go whichever way that this body would like to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chairman. I'm going to keep my comments very brief. Um, I want to thank staff for all the hard work that they've done here in putting a very comprehensive document together. Um, I view this as a habitat protection document, um, specifically in that that's where the where I have found the division's defense of their position to be so strong. And I think they did so in such a way that, well, let me say is we hear a lot about how North Carolina leads from some of our other commissioners. Well, one place where North Carolina leads is we allow more access to internal waters to buy our shrimp fleet, right? We allow more shrimping than any other state in the nation. And if this were to pass, we would still allow more shrimping than any other state in internal waters. And I think the division's staff did a really good job in recommending a suite of options that protects our critical habitat areas. And not just that, 
but um, also minimizes the economic impacts to the industry. It's far from perfect, but I thought it was a good compromise, and that's why I made this motion. And thank you. Great. Any other comments, uh, Madam Director? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I do have one more comment. I meant to make it a while ago, and I even made myself a little note, but I forgot to look at it. Um, since 2011, uh, this division has been working on shrimp, whether it be an amendment or a petition or a couple of petitions and another amendment. So for the last 10 years, we have put a lot of effort into working on shrimp, shrimp trawl, trawl bycatch, habitat protection as it relates to shrimp trawling. Uh, there's been a lot of effort that has gone into this. And I will, and I remember uh, last night, it might have been this might have been this morning, Mr. Fulcher made a comment about um, feeling angry about the time and effort that that group has put in. And I, I'm sorry for that because that's probably the one of the better things that has come from the work that we've done is working with the industry uh, to to work with that bycatch work group and achieve the reductions that they did. And those efforts absolutely should be applauded for the stakeholders. And I see some of the uh, shrimpers that were on that group in here to, today and saw some of them last night. And we do appreciate that absolutely. And we, we look forward, if we don't do another daggone thing, we look forward to continuing to work uh, on bycatch reduction because it is a it is an issue and, and we do appreciate the work that they they work with us and any continued work that they'll do we appreciate thank absolutely. you absolutely absolutely is there any other discussion on this motion if not laura let's do a roll call please okay commissioner cross nay thank you commissioner blanton no Thank you. Commissioner Hendrickson? No. Thank you. Commissioner Cornegie? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Posey? No. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Romano? No. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Motion fails five to four. We still have to make a recommendation uh, uh, our preferred management options, and I think Commissioner Cross has a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Patricia, you got my motion. Oh, please. Okay. I, I make a motion that only the following changes be implemented, rules changes be implemented into the shrimp fishery management plan. Number one, permanently prohibit all trawling in crab sanctuary areas. Number two, eliminate the four courts heads on or two and one half courts heads off recreational krill limit for cast nets only in areas closed to the taking of shrimp. Number three, Change the flexible opening date and all SSNAs to a static 9 1 each year, September 1st. Number four, allow non trawl net gears to harvest shrimp in areas closed to shrimp trawling. Number five, continue collaboration with commercial stakeholder groups through the industry work group to identify and test gear modifications to further reduce bycatch in the shrimp fishery. Number six, prohibit shrimp trawling in Bogue Sound and its tributaries except for the Intercoastal Waterway. Number seven, prohibit shrimp trawling in the Carolina Yacht Basin except for the Intercoastal Waterway. Number eight, that the Division of Marine Fisheries collaborate with the CHIP support staff and the Habitat and Water Quality Advisory Committee on issues related to SAV habitat. As the division deems appropriate and feasible, actions to address that impact will be identified by the appropriate committees and brought to the MFC in the future for action as part of adaptive fisheries management with collaboration of stakeholder groups and the advisory committees. Okay, is that motion as you made it? Please, sir. Looking for a second. Second by Commissioner um, Blant. My mind's going blank this afternoon. Okay, motion duly made second. Is there any discussion on this? 
Yes. Do we have an edit? Council would like coming out again. Brett. So make a motion that the following go back out to the first two sentences. He's One our, moment. He's our mouthpiece. Let him, let him make it. Trying to be legal. But I, he's a big boy. Um, I'm going to edit this. The very beginning of it, Patricia, you ready? I make a motion that we select the following preferred management options and then start with number one. The following preferred management options and then blank out the rest of it. Blank, blank, blank. Blank out that permanently. Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. You're right. You're on the money. My mistake. Is this the motion as you have edited it? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Blanton, uh, will you still second this edited motion? Absolutely. Okay. Discussion. Okay, so Commissioner Romano and Commissioner Posey. Um, a couple things here. Um, you know, I, nothing is, I'm okay with this motion. Um, there's a couple things I just want to bring up, um, maybe get some more clarity. One, the Carolina Beach Yacht Basin is in my, in my neck of the woods. And I can tell you a little thing about the Carolina Beach Yacht, Beach Yacht Basin. I called a couple shrimpers on the way up here to kind of get their idea. I crab in there a lot. Um, it's very deep. Um, and there is at the bottom, it is probably the case study for silting and it is, it is, uh, very bad, very thick mud. And the bottom is just pretty much dead. Shrimpers don't go in there a couple times a year. They will go in there to, uh, you know, if, if we get some shrimp running down the beach, they'll come into the yacht basin. Um, the worry I have about this is what I spoke about before was that is the benefits of trawling. And I, I really would like to use, I think this area would be a prime time area to study um, based on the poor condition that it's in. So if I could, I'd like uh, to, to entertain just a, a little bit of an amendment. And that would be, um, if you could scroll up to the, one of the Carolina Beach Yacht Basin, I can't see it. Um, unless, um, unless uh, a proclamation is made for research, would that be fair to put up there? Unless by proclamation. And, and this is literally, it's scientific study. It's not, this is not like people are going to go in there and uh you know there's some sort of advantage literally i'm admitting to you not many people go in there very often um so i just it's it to me i i really think we got to get a better hold on what these trawls are what they do to the bottom really instead of in, in our uh you know in our heads what we think it might happen um, um so um uh, commissioner romano i think if I'm following you correctly, and I can't barely do one thing at a time, I'm trying to do like three. Um, 
so it's, it reads prohibit shrimp trialing in Carolina Yacht Basin except for the IWW. If we want to do a study mm -hmm. and we want to collaborate with a with a trawler to do a study, we can we can certainly do that without having to to include it here or as an as an option for the otherwise option for this. So so you're saying without putting it in to this motion, yes. you still have the proclamation authority that if we found that that would be something we'd want to do, it could be done. Correct. Okay. Well, then I'm. That's okay with me. The, the other thing I would, I'm really looking to ask staff about, um, particularly Marine Patrol, and that is these, these inlet areas. Um, you know, I really just want to know when, when people, when we see the, when do we see anyone going in these areas trawling? What times of the year? Um, what, you know, what areas particularly? Because I know there are some that probably don't see any, and there are some that probably see some from time to time. Um, so. Maybe you all could speak to that, I feel like. Hold on. So for the inlet areas, some of these inlets, you know, these shrimp trawlers can't even get out. Um, some some of the areas that the right time of the year, the right weather, they can work, they can work the inlet. Um, with the crab spawning sanctuary sanctuary. During the during that spawning time period, they can't shrimp in there anyways. It's already right. closed. So that's through the 31st in the south, right? Am I right? October 31st? Yes. October 31st, and then in the north, August 31st. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> is this to me, I this seems like a complete uh non-issue. Um, I guess we'll feel better uh at night doing this closure, but it's just, I, I don't know what, I don't see what benefit that we would get if we're talking about connectivity. I mean, the, that's the whole thing with the crabs. I mean, we we are allowing them, I, I would imagine they're kind of on the same schedule. Actually, maybe Jason can tell you as far as exiting the inlets, they're both crustaceans. Um, wouldn't they exit the inlets similarly as the shrimp would? No? I mean, the, the crabs, they spawn kind of throughout the summer period and into the fall, so they have a protracted spawning season. And it's just the, the females that really congregate in those inlet areas, and they move out to the inlets to release their eggs, and they come back in a little bit. So they're con constantly moving back and forth throughout the spawning season. Um, so, so I guess what I'm asking is, if we're not allowed to trawl in there during that time period, um, afterwards we think that or i guess fish would be the question is what are we gonna are we gonna get a lot of bang for our buck by closing these areas or is this just gonna make everybody feel better i mean i just i i'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around you know i talked to one guy i give you an example this is just a real world situation guy a shrimper that that works for me i said well what about carolina beach inlet you guys ever go uh shrimp he's like well not really but you know one day we were, uh, we, you know, shrimp were moving. They moved across the inlet. We did one tow and, and got 2,000 pounds. It was the first time we'd done that in a while. So it's not like these areas are like, hey, let's go work in front of Carolina Beach Inlet. They're chasing moving shrimp. So it doesn't seem like this is going to be, you know, something that's a continual thing. So, I, you know, I, I will vote for this. I really, I would love to be able to keep the, uh, um, March, I would, I would love to just keep it the way it is and not have, you know, because it's already closed and it's the only time it's going to be open is literally when the shrimp are running down the beach. And I seem, seems like, yeah. Um, but I, I, I could be, I would still vote for this, but I, I'd love to hear some commentary, maybe from Martin, because he's more of a, an expert on that sort of thing, um, of, of what we really are going to get out of this. You know, if it's going to be five, six boats in these inlet, ha inlet areas, you know, sure, it doesn't make any difference, but you're cutting off their opportunity at a time when they could probably use to catch the shrimp. So, um, you hear from Mark. Okay, Mark. Okay. Mr. Pozo. I'll address that. I think it's really their critical mass. have to come in. Think about it. Make the river work. Good congregation of fish just outside of the extended oh, extended estuary. Um, 
and, and they're such small focal points. And I think that they're really, they're, their importance is much oversized compared to their area. I think they're really important areas. So, so habitat more than habitat, habitat yeah, more no, than it's critical by, habitat. But, but so more than bycatch would be an issue habitat. So what, like sand, like well, on the bike? It, I mean, I think of the crabs. You know, they're, they're really cued in on that salinity cue, and it's coming and going from the inlet, and they're moving kind of out, spawning, moving back in. Um, you have several of the fish that will congregate around that inlet and then move out. And so it almost, it becomes a habitat. And it's also then a, a choke point mm -hmm. habitat. And I, I guess I'm not against particularly, uh, like I said, I'm for it. I'll get, I, I don't think that affects anyone really um, in that time period. But after that time period, there are some people that will do okay. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if they, you think that Commissioner Romano, I yield the floor to okay. Commissioner Posey. Um, I'll go ahead and move on uh, and we can talk about that a little more. Um, I have a um, proposed an amendment that we include the effort and gear modifications that are outlined on page nine. One of those is already included, um, but I think it's important that we continue collaboration with commercial stakeholders for gear modifications. I think it's important that we investigate the feasibility of long-term shrimp trawl observer program. I think that will get at some of the questions we're talking about. Um, I don't see any reason we shouldn't allow non-trawl net gears to harvest shrimp in areas close to shrimp trawling um, and giving the, the commission some flexibility in head ropes. I'm just reading through the various points. So I would, one of these is already in there. That's the eliminate four quarts. I would like to add the other four. My motion is to add the other four of those effort and gear modifications. Um, into the motion. Um, let me see. Will, will you accept that as see see what we got up? There? I tell you what. What, what, what might be the simplest thing to do? What, what might be the simplest thing to do is first off consider this motion and then do another. Okay. Well, we got a motion to amend which needs a second. Okay, just a second. Are these amendments to your motion acceptable? Let's see if it's acceptable to the seconder. Okay, it already is. Okay. Kat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a couple of clarifications. One is relative to the change the flexible opening date in all SSNAs to a static 9 1 each year. And I'm assuming that you are just speaking to the date that we that the director may or may not open a special secondary nursery, correct? And do you have an end date or? Do we have, do we? I think it's May 15th, right? SSNAs can be open from 16th to May 15th. Okay, we'll, we'll just we'll work within the end date that's in rule. Is that is that okay with y'all? Yeah, if we're still maintaining that flexibility the, yep. that's already exists, it's yep. just moving that that's, start date. Okay, thank you. And then I think uh, Colonel Whitten, and that might be what they're talking about now, but he had something that he was trying to explain to me relative to the uh, heads off recreational crew limit. Just need clarification to what you're what you're going to set the limit to in a in a closed area. Okay, I was going strictly off the division's recommendation. So you want a you want a total limit? Yeah, I would I would ask the the, the division since we are just taking it straight from your recommendation. So I think the division would best record answer that. Forty-eight courts heads on, thirty-two heads off. But the way it's written in an open area, and you're talking about a closed area. The same. And this is straight from the division's recommendations, so we'll rely on them to clarify. So 
sorry, I spoke out of turn. Okay. We have a motion with a duly made second with an amendment that was accepted, duly made second to that. Any further discussion on this? If not, Laura. Chairman, I believe we're ready. <laughs> okay, thank you. Roll call vote, please. On yes. all this motion has been amended. <laughs> well, hold on. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Can we please just take a short break? Yes, we may. Yes. Thank you. Would a 15 minute break do you? Yes, How about that'd be gracious. All right. All right. Then you get 10. So we got Thank a 10 you. minute break.
I'm getting to it. We're fine with the nine one. Just, just discard. Okay, everybody, everybody, get back in your seats, please. I think we're finally got something. Discard the comments about that. Uh, but we would like to pull out the uh, allow non-trawl net gears to harvest shrimp in areas closed to shrimp trawling. That was uh, in the event that there were actually areas closed to shrimp trawling, new areas closed to shrimp trawling. Correct, staff? I know, but you didn't do what I was thinking you were going to do. So now this, we want to pull this out. Is that? Thank you. Can we hear some justification just real quick? You didn't get to finish why you want to pull it out. It was, it was in there because in anticipation of additional areas closed to shrimp trawling and without that happening, we, we want to pull that out. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. If they can probably explain it a whole lot better than I can. Jason, you want to try to clarify that? Yeah, so the couple of reasons why that was included as part of our recommendation. Uh, the first was if the SSNA closures were to go through, there are some channel net areas and SSNAs that only open up when the SSNAs do. So if they didn't open up, then those areas would be closed to channel nets that can legally fish now. Um, and then second would be if larger additional areas were closed to shrimp trawling, then the way our Proclamation is structured gears that could be used in areas that are now open would not be able to be used in those newly closed areas. Um, so if those larger closures aren't going through and the SSNA closures aren't going through, then uh, it, it's something that's not needed. Well, uh, so Mr. Romano's hand up for a real quick yep, comment. Yeah, of course. Um, just the inlet areas themselves, I mean, can people put channel nets in there? They're going to be close. Are there... There's only uh, three areas, uh, and they're all in the SSNAs, or opening the channel nets uh, occurs the same time it opens to trawling. So areas that are outside of those, they can already fish in. And there's only limited areas by proclamation that um, channel nets are allowed to operate. So newly closed areas. So we're, we're going to be closing, or possibly, um, some of these crab spawning sanctuaries, you're telling me right now you can't put a channel net in there? Uh, no, I can check with Carter, but I don't believe any of the inlets themselves are open to channel nets. Yeah, the, yeah, because they would block navigable waters. Hold on for Carter. No, you cannot. Works real good. Okay, anything else? Are we where we want to be right here at this moment. I, I was it taken out. That's three bullet points from the bottom. Yeah, that one. Back that all out. That's it. Back it out. Uh, 
Okay, all right. We have a motion duly seconded, duly amended with a second and accepted the amendment. And no more discussion. Uh, okay. Sorry if I'm by adding comments to the Okay. So that was a okay. It's a good pickup. All right. Now. Okay, roll call vote, please, Laura. Commissioner Cross. Aye. Commissioner Blanton. Aye. Commissioner Hendrickson. Aye. Commissioner Cornegie. Abstain. Commissioner McNeil. Aye. Commissioner Posey. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Roller. No. Commissioner Romano. Aye. And Chairman Bissell. No. Motion passes five to three to one. All right. That brings us to the end of today. And we will see everybody. Why not? All right, hold on a second. He said, "Yo, yo, yo, yo at with yeah. right, well, Trisha, you have those up there as two separate items, but they're all combined to one." I was amended to the motion. Oh, we got one, one more thing we do need to do. We got to vote to send this draft plan to the Department of Environmental Quality. So, is there a motion so to move? Do, move but, uh, Commissioner Hendrickson. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, hold. On. Okay, what I'm going to say on the record is that Doug Cross and uh, Mike Bland accepted this as a friendly amendment to the motion and it was passed and y'all can clean that up later on so you don't have to get it done right now. So with this motion, we need to um, vote to send it to the um, this draft plan to DEQ. So is there a motion to do that? That's right. Excuse me, Tom Henderson. Mr. Henderson has um, made this motion and it was seconded by Mr. Cross. Perfect. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, Point of clarification. Yeah. It, it, I'm not sure that is, that's the proper language, is it? To send the draft to I think it is. I think it's, that what what this is is the draft amendment. Yeah. That's the way it's sure, amendment. certainly. Okay. All right. We'll call vote. Commissioner right. Cross. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Hendrickson. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Cornegie. Abstain. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Posey. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. No. Thank you. Commissioner Romano. Aye. And Chairman Bizzle. No. Motion passes 531. 
All right, now I believe we are done for today. We'll see everybody back here at nine o'clock in the morning. Thank you for coming. No?